Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the third day of the Belarus meeting, and uh, we start a very intense program. Uh, today, this morning, we will have uh, two talks by our Chinese colleague, uh, Professor Shuan Zhan will start, and uh, then afterwards, there will be uh, Professor Rossini and Orge Roeda. Therefore, the coffee break will be uh, after the first four talks at 11 o'clock. Okay, so I welcome Professor Nanjang, please.
for taking the back one, the first the galactic uh, uh, settlement is like, oh, uh, you can see here, they have a different uh, variability in this energy band. Then I will photo a few examples of what we have done um, in breeding uh, neuron stars uh, with a strong magnetic field in particular. And this is, as we all know, that uh, uh, Maggie has neutron star interact with this uh, companion star through this diffusive disk, and the magnetic field pulls uh, the breeding material onto the poles of the neutron star, and this uh, complex interaction can allow us to understand the neutron star uh, quite well. Uh, in particular, one thing we, uh, we have seen photo. with about the four sigma significance. Then we observe this, we found the lung energy varies, the highest energy is 90 kV, and uh, uh, this allows us to give the magnetic field into the 30 dot directly measured. And uh, uh, the significance very high. Okay, we got uh, more than 20 sigma significance for this lung energy, for this absorption feature, and this allowed us to measure accurately the uh, variations of the line energy absorption depths and other things uh, with the spinning phase of the neutron star. Uh, of course, we still have to explain why it has such evolution over the uh, spinning phase of the neutron star. Uh, the highest energy we have so far detected uh, is from uh, this uh, first uh, galactic autoluminous energy pulsar, a uh, swift uh, 0243. As you can see here, this cyclotron feature is detected very significantly. And at 146 kV, uh, the reason we can do this is because we have a good collecting area all the way above 200 kV. Uh, interestingly, this lung energy, this absorption feature can only be detected in, in, in during the very small uh, uh, phase, uh, very small phase, about uh, 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 or something. In most of the spinning phase, this absorption feature is absent. Only during a small part of the spinning phase, this has been detected. Of course, we do not understand why it only existed during the small spinning phase. It took a long time to find this uh, uh, cyclotron feature because initially, of course, as, as usual, uh, we tried to detect this in phase average the spectrum. 
we didn't see that, then we do that uh, phase uh, resolve the spectra, and finally we can see the here. So it has a very strong modulation with the same phase. And for the same source, because a one through a very large range of luminosity changes, I can just go back a little bit. And with this energy, uh, we determine that uh, it's a, a surface magnetic field to produce this feature is 1.6 times 10 to the 13 dots. And this is so far the highest, uh, the, uh, the strongest magnetic field directly detected. And uh, interestingly, if we measure the spin down behavior or spin up behavior of the neutron star, that is from the, this tells us the dipole magnetic field, it turns out it's only 10 to 12 dots. It, it's rather normal compared to other equity energy pulsars. So this gives us evidence that uh, uh, most likely this neutron star has a multiple magnetic field. That is, we are seeing here very strong near the surface of the neutron star. This is uh, uh, the quarter pole magnetic field not far away from the neutron star. That's where the, the, the dipole field dominant is much lower by one order of magnetic at least. For the same neutron star, we have observed it's, uh, as you can see, very frequently from the outwards all the way to the decay. And interestingly, we have seen uh, the, the very strange behavior of the QPO variation at the function of luminosity and other features uh, of, for example, the pulse profile varies across two luminosity. This is understood to be the, the critical luminosity. That's where in the equation column, the, the luminosity already exceeds the identical luminosity. Then uh, another, another luminosity, this is uh, uh, this much higher luminosity over the identical luminosity. We see another change of the power profile. So uh, in summary, we have seen in particular uh, there's a very high luminosity in the infrared disk suddenly becoming much thicker. Uh, of course, this uh, agrees with the theoretical prediction made by uh, Sanayev and those people in 1970s. But this time we see this very directly. And some of the neutron stars have much lower surface magnetic field and they will produce at the burst. And uh, uh, for over the past uh, many years, but even in the era, when you add many experts together, you found out in the high energy band, then during the burst, the flux actually is much lower, but previously you could only do that by adding many birds together. For this particular burst with HXMT, for a single burst, we see the high energy flux, 40 to 70 kV, kV during the burst suddenly decreases. So this means that the burst actually cools down the corona around the equation disk suddenly within a time scale less than a second. Then it recovers very quickly. So this uh, allows us to understand how the corona is, is formed, is cooled down, and, and finally recover. And also for kilohertz QPO, uh, that is one of the greatest discoveries of RFPE mission. Uh, it has been observed from many uh, low uh, weekly magnetic neutron stars. Uh, however, previously, the, the energy uh, is uh, below 20 kV. And which HXMT we observed from star XY. And you can see, you know, a high energy instrument, the double uh, peak kilohertz field yields are uh, very well detected uh, up to uh, energy above 20 kV. So this tells us this QPO is produced in some kind of non thermal process. Uh, this rules out and has the many models for this kilohertz field yield. And fast video burst, and yesterday Professor Billy uh, has shown us the, the great uh, results from, uh, from a fast telescope. And uh, this, of course, a very strange phenomenon for a long time was not very well understood. Uh, interestingly, for one particular neutron star 
of the magnet of ICR 1935. On this particular day, a double pulse of uh, IFRB was detected both by Jimmy, the Canadian radio telescope, and Stair to the US radio telescope. And at the time, HXMP was observing these neutron stars for other reasons. We are trying to detect the, the burst from these neutron stars. But interestingly, we detected simultaneously a giant active burst from this neutron star. But simultaneously means after uh, we uh, subtract the, the, the dispersion delay of radio. So, in fact, we detected this eight on six second earlier uh, than, the, than, the, than the radio works. Uh, this is a great of course, uh, with the dispersion. And in particular, during the peak of, uh, of this giant active burst, we also discover two pulses in exact coincidence with these two radio bursts. So, this tells us not only this uh, active burst uh, produced this uh, 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 this this active burst uh, come from the same event of the double uh, MRB, but also the active policies uh, agrees with two things. So this allows us to to determine that it is really the same event. And of course, we can also localize the active burst. Because HXMT, although it's not a focused uh, imaging telescope, it has three collimators with a different orientation. So, with the flux ratio between the three collimators, we could localize this active burst. So, you can see this is a two localization, the chimney localization, these are our localization, precisely on top of the magnet. So, therefore, with our data, we decided this active burst and together uh, with this, the double pulses actually come from this particular neutron star. Uh, I should mention that the Jinji world also images this active burst, also determined they come from this magnet. So, therefore, we identified this active burst with, uh, with this, uh, uh, this, this particular magnet. We also measure the energy spectrum uh, of the active burst with a very broad energy band, as you can see here, from uh, about 2 keV all the way about 200 keV. And the best model uh, actually is a part of a power law model. So this means this is a non thermal emission. This is very different from the majority of the actual burst from this magnet. Uh, this magnet is very active. They produce many active bursts, but this particular active burst that produces this uh, uh, MRB is very different from the rest of the, the active burst. And recently, uh, last year, we actually detected another active burst associated with the radio burst. This, this radio burst is active burst. But this time, interestingly, uh, they, the time actually do not agree. Uh, this already uh, after the correcting of the dispersion. So this means that uh, there's a diversity of the radio bursts, uh, which, uh, in, which are in constant with experts, not just one way, but different ways of making radio bursts from a magnet. Um, black holes, we all know that uh, we have an uh, active binary system, we have ADS, and both together, uh, we will allow us to probe the, the, uh, the gravity uh, over many other magnitude. And uh, this also complements the study of uh, strong gravity with the gravity in a way. Uh, we have uh, observed many uh, black holes over the past many years. I just give you one example. This is one extreme example. It demonstrates the capability of this broadband satellite. And uh, that's a huge deal. Uh, for many years, we know that the black hole active binaries have a low frequency field fields, but their nature is, is still not very, very well understood. It's a different kind of model to explain the low frequency uh, oscillations, and some from the increasing disk, some from uh, the precession corona. Uh, with all the observation, 
Again, for this outburst, we actually track this outburst very in great detail over the large frequency range. And uh, uh, I only want to point out that this particular oscillation is detected from 1 kV all the way above 200 kV. And this is the highest energy field you ever observed. Previously, again, in RIT era, it's typically below 30 kV. Now we increase the energy band by nearly an order of the magnitude. Then suddenly, all the previous models do not work. We find out this result cannot be explained by any of the previous models, mostly due to the high energy field below about 100 kV. Uh, in all the previous models, it's, uh, it's very difficult to explain. And we also found out that uh, for all the QBOs in given energy band, they actually arrive to us at different times. And we found out, interestingly, the higher energy QBO uh, uh, arrive with relative to the low energy QBOs, they come later, actually. So a uh, negative lag means. Uh, means uh, high energy are behind. So that's what we find out because from the low energy uh, the, uh, to high energy, the lag is very large actually in terms of time, you can see it's about one second. One second for the inbreeding black hole binary is huge if it's like travel time. So this is made in the previous model, for example, inverse Compton scattering and other models almost in, impossible to work in this case. So what we decided, uh, we, we speculated that this actually was due to uh, precessive QPOs near uh, the, the, uh, the black hole here, show your model here. And uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 GM is produced from black hole, the spin of the black hole makes the, the, uh, the jet dancing around. Then in the north, in the near the bottom of the jet, we have tiny radiation, then gradually uh, low energy radiation. So therefore, we have the different delay of the. And from the same source uh, with the spectroscopy, we also have seen a strong reflection feature. And this reflection feature allows us to determine the, uh, the velocity of the corona all the jet moving away from the black hole. Here again, uh, that, that uh, uh, we uh, find that it's consistent with the jet the nature of the high energy emission. And another example is that uh, again for black hole binaries, for a long time the Q diagram was observed but not explained very well. Then with our data, we observed this one output of this source in great detail. So what we find out is that after uh, we correct of them the delay from a different band, then the Q diagram becomes almost a linear correlation between the flux and, and the, uh, the total flux and the hard axis flux. And this allowed us to speculate what happened during the outburst is that uh, it started with a uh, corona emission from the inner region of the black hole. This is corona produced, then it illuminates the outer part of the inclusion disk and uh, make the out so there's a higher energy emission from corona. It, so we see this uh, uh, outburst, then it illuminates the outer part of the inclusion disk that makes it it's harder produce the optical emission then so almost simultaneously and then the this we have harder equation flow inside this eventually produce soft like emission so you can interpret the, the observation very well then uncommon burst and uh, since we have a very large anti-constant uh, function there so we decided to implement a different mode of the observation to allow the energy band to increase from 200, uh, previously up to 600 kV, not to 3 MeV. Now with this capability, you can see the effective area for us in this energy band is very large compared to all the other missions. 
uh, with this capability, not only we detect the coming first, we also see uh, very bright solid flares. I quickly go through this part. We have seen the brightest the solar flares over the past many years. This allowed us uh, to detect many interesting phenomena, for example, uh, also the QQ phenomena during the solar flare. And also in coincidence with the radio detection, we can determine it's uh, called the uh, high energy electron that heated up and, and things like that. Okay. And uh, so with this data, uh, we determine the evolution of the magnetic field during the uh, solar flare. Uh, finally, on the coming first result, uh, this shows the joint feeding between over detector and the Fermi TBM. That over detector, you can see here in this energy range, we have a, a much better statistic for gamma burst. And this is right in the area where the EP happens. And with this capability, we detect the brightest gamma burst and uh, uh, Professor Minza will immediately talk uh, about on this coming verse. Here, I just mentioned that uh, with HXMT and another small satellite called the GCAM, all together we detect the precursor, main burst flare, and an early afterglow very accurately. Our main result is that this is indeed the brightest coming burst, more than 50 times brighter than any previous coming burst. And the, the, the isotropic energy is of the largest 1.5 to the 55 Earth. And we see the early afterglow uh, break. As you can see here, this allows us to determine the chip is very narrow, 0.7 degree. And if we correct for this energy, we find out that the total energy after the chip correction is actually normal, 10 to the 15 Earth. So it's the brightest, but the total energy release is actually normal. Also, the very high energy gamma rate uh, was detected simultaneously by, by Lhasa in, in China. I show you just a couple of results here. Uh, this are uh, the light curve, as you can see here, uh, this is broad with over broad energy band. This uh, of this light curve in different energy band. Then this is early break. This, this, this is the first part of the afterglow, the second part of the afterglow. In between, we have a, a data gap here. And, but nevertheless, with this full part, we determine the break time is about uh, 1,000 seconds. And uh, also from the peak here, we determine and we integrate all this together, the total energy is very high. And uh, all of the gamma ray first data are public. Uh, we put it uh, on site on, on our website. So if you are interested, you can always go there to download all the data. So finally, give you a summary. I just start with uh, uh, this uh, collection of the number of papers we published each year. And last year, we published more than 50 papers. This year, and hope will be more. So this is uh, our first entry satellite. And uh, it's a small open observatory. It's really open. They open uh, internationally. So uh, uh, actually, the the cycle six observation, the AO call, uh, will close the tomorrow. Uh, so this uh, this will and we'll start a cycle six in September. We have more gas observing time. This is worldwide open, more than a core program. And we a few days ago we had an orbit maintenance. Because they had the orbit have a, a lower due to the drag, now it's up to a nominal uh, orbit. So therefore, we should be able to observe for a few more years. Uh, we do a lot of more real time observation. We welcome more observation of this type. Okay, so I will stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, excellent presentation. We have a uh, time limit, uh, only time for one short question. So please speak. Uh, uh, otherwise, yeah, okay. Please. Thank you very much. Oh, <clears throat> just a quick uh, comment from you. Um, very, uh, very nice to see these measurements of the high magnetic fields of. Uh, about the 
um, some of my questions is based on uh, a different computational redshift that makes it even bigger than the measurement. And I'm very excited to see this sort of where to look for QED effects. Uh, we, uh, we perhaps have, in all the data, we don't have direct evidence for, for QED effects, but we are not sensitive to that. Most likely in policy, in polarization, you see that more directly, only feeding the light curve and the spectral is harder to get QED effect. It should be there, it should be there, but we, we can't do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for going back again. Yeah. Now we have time for, for the second speaker today. Okay, Professor Minja, please. Many focus on the top universities. For 
Sultan Ho, that he met here the spectrum and the young lady uh, to the palace to be in the people in the people. And they had this moment. We had the book from the book was married in a holy and I think it's now a sperm on the show and also uh, really killed I can see and to do the uh, in other to do the other bands. And here is some picture of how it happens. And the first one is to show the reaction of the head to the and we show it as the EP, basically in the walking square. And the last one is the pattern, and the end is the one with 36 in the square. So to measure the green component, which is the very key, has been heard in the city, to the written presentation that I got my shawl from the back of the house. And here is a picture for what the reason is. Um, uh, I can try to remember the energy of the rock healing. So we measured by the heat detector and the rock one by the light heat detectors. And then here is a picture for the double CDA. And this is what has been recorded by the detectors of Japan and Sarah. Uh, it's a green moon. And the effect is exactly the lower than in the bottom four meter. And in the center, in the bottom, there's a two gem heat through the outside to attract the tripping line generated in the water. And the sixth slide and the, it's about the wide field and field chimp of extra day. And in the character of this telescope is a total design and so that is easy. Uh, in Italy, it's going to the different configuration. And uh, here, in this, in here it's camera, and we can have the solid people faces. And it works, and this 18 pencil is arranged like this way to cover the full grid and cover the full elements angle. And here's that still one picture of our uh, real experiment today, Tony. And uh, uh, here is to show the carbon uh, uh, sorry, carbon free effect water detection power. We all know so for the carbon reactivity, it is the key, uh, it is the key parameters. So the top one is to show the behavior from the WCPA, and the bottom one for the chemistry. For the WCPA, we choose uh, what we use the mass synthetic parameter, and we found that the gamma effect. Uh, we have like this black curve, and this red curve is for the bottom meters. And so, you set in certain part, then you can find, and when the energy reaches to the uh, around the 6 TV, and the uh, cosmic ray that one can be uh, reduced to the 10 to minus 3 in this level. And uh, this activity is even better for the gameplay by using the lambda premium as a key important parameters. And uh, so we found the, the energy range around the one to three TV, and the back one can be reduced to the 10 to minus four, even we go to the even highest by the 600 TV, and this number can reduce to the 10 to minus five. So this is very good. And here we can show the uh, some thought about our detector's operation. And uh, this the top panel is to show the duty cycle distribution in the last year. So last year, and you can see, and uh, our working time has been to the 99.6%. And the middle one is for the WCDA. And, uh, and also the number is 98.6%. So basically, that means our detector is working for 20 hours a day. And I call for the, the bottom one for the cycle. Is different one, but uh, anyway, and you still can find the uh, observation time can be uh, after accumulate one year or uh, several years in the reach to 1400 hours, it's also very stable. So, and uh, I think uh, many of you have uh, already saw this picture, and the right one, uh, sorry, the left one is our sensitivity curve from the temporary and class of the red one should be, and the black one is the field of view 
typical peer review and uh, for the HR grade. So plus the food sensitivity curve and plus in the very wide peer review and plus we can work the 24 hours one day. So it makes the lasso is a very good facility to start the week and also to want to trade it. And the uh, balance a very high MD region or ultra high MD region. And then we come to the uh, some highlight result. So during the uh, construction, during the construction uh, time, uh, during the data collected by uh, one force array data, and then we release two interesting results. This is the first one. It's about the uh, of the central energy distribution of the standard candle uh, that's a part network. And uh, there is a few interesting from the point of the observation, uh, observation angle. And for the first time, and we measure the energies, energy from the standard 3.5 decades. And so that means it's from 300 GeV to 1.1 GeV. And also the second point, and we found our measurement is consistent with the other measurement of energy low than the 100 GeV. So that means we are not just doing things beautiful, and we we also do it correctly. And the third one is within uh, our experiment, and we found the consistent result between the different factors between Dr. C D and PM3. And if we see the result uh, consistent around the 10 few times uh, this energy range, and when we go to the high energy. The one one TV, and also we found them today and WMCK. Uh, they using the different energy determination, but it was still done the consistent result. So it's a point one, and another point is that uh, it's about the three interpret interpretation about this uh set curve. So there's a few interesting points. One is a we found one two electron model is good enough for the low energy range, but if we consider the uh, maximum total energy is reached in 1.12 TV, so that's why primary energy about the electron can be reached to 2.3 TV. So, uh, in this condition, so that means a feminine rate is a, a close to the 2016. It seems a very uh, high number, and uh, so it's got a new understanding about the electron accelerator. So this is number one, number two is that we use one quarter of this data, and we open the upper high energy primary astronomy window, and with the high statistics, and the both uh, with the hundred photos, and uh, with the high standard deviation level, Larger than the seven sigma and well temperature has been found. And uh, this result happens in nature. And uh, also you can find nuclear copper and the sets up to the one TV. And so and uh, but with the uh, more accumulation level, uh, certainly we have uh, more companies. Uh, more current is the other way, and for us, this is the catalog result. So, here this slide shows some details about catalogs data. And uh, for WCPA, we are using the 5,000 uh, sorry, 508 states and the upper quality part, and also including some uh, uh, proton and gamma separation part, and totally without some like events around 29. And similar thing we did for the tenth way. Then we got the uh, number of common light events in the uh, twenty seven years. So with this common light events, so we do the different energy band and based on the beam maximum lightning method and adopting the integration uh, strategy step by step. So we separately construct the source diagram for the city and the tenth way. And this is the result. And so we found 65 source in the WCK and the year. That means one to 12 TV. And uh, for the temporary entry, and uh, higher than the 25, we got 74, 75 source. 
and the amount seventy five souls. Uh, uh, 43, 43 of them belong to the ultra high energy source. That means the energy spectrum can easily uh, and obviously spread to the 100, 100 PEB. And then with these two uh, detectors, we now we have to merge them and we consider the error about the position. And the same error, and so what are the difference in the space angle? So finally, we constructed the first class of catalog uh, with the light source, and this result conducts some meeting in the APS and over online. And this is the number. And here, if we choose the right now, uh, to the root. And so, so we have the basic results, and we will see that the connected uh, less than 12 degrees. And we have the three panel in the different energy region uh, 1 to 12 PEV, and this is the larger than 12. And here, the bottom one is the higher than 100 PEV. And this one is in the inner region from the 0 to 110 uh, in the galactic long. In the outer region, the address eight source is located in the outside the galaxy next to the uh, rather than the twelve degree, and basically in the western band of so, uh, an extra galactic source like the famous Kotua, Kaiowa, and some other regions. So here. There's some uh, small summary to this first catalog of Lasso. So, this amount is 90 sources and with associated uh, with the low key resource, we found 58 of them uh, can find the counterpart with the TV catalog and all, all from the three uh, part results. And the, the rest of 32. Can be treated as the new source, that means uh, within the distance 25 degree, we found a no DNA contact. And about them, there is the second person, is even interesting. We call it the dark source because there's no uh, GEV, not just no GEV contact, but also no GEV contact. And also another interesting point, we found the peritone area, and this is three numbers. And the fifty-one percent uh low even uh, low energy vision source are belong to ultra high energy source. And uh, also when the energy higher than the fifty-five EV, also the fifty-seven percent of them can be regarded as the ultra high energy source. But among the whole ultra high energy source, twenty uh, uh, close to ninety percent of them. Are not detected at the lowest one, at the one to five, 25 degrees. So that's maybe uh, something new to hear, but the average moment we are first year not know. So the conclusion is that immediately they have to pull up ultra high. Uh, so then <clears throat> the second one that I go to this uh, famous Jackie 2010. Uh, oh my one, and I think I don't the, the, uh, I don't need to, uh, to introduce it in detail. I think to introduce the, the observation from the last one, taking from the last one. And this plot, uh, is to choose the field of view of uh, detectors, and uh, when the GDM give the signal, give, give the trigger signal. So we are very lucky, and this JRP just look the trigger in the center. And in our field, field of view, that's marked as the star here. So I think we can be to very good uh, amendment. So it really brings several new reports for us. For example, first is the first journey of the extensive air shell detector. And also, I think a second point up to now is the highest statistics of photos. And if, if you're talking about the energy, the energy range larger than the uh, 200 TV and more than 60, some of the photons can be collected. And in fact, if you lose the card about the first uh, 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 down separation, and this number can be increased, can be increased to the one solid, 100 solid. So this is 
We use this pressure to put the light and we can do microwave. And the, the bottom one is the <coughs> concrete platform left by the WCD. And if you watch it and the several informations, you can collect it. It's a very smooth camera uh, profile. So that means it's from the external shop or region. And also, and it's also the first time we detection of the TV upgrows on set. Uh, and also, it's the first time. Uh, I think we precisely measure the entire light curve, the afterglow. And here is to show the some of the visual pictures about this GRV. And this blue curve is this GRV is transmitted inside our human field. And the transmitted one is in the uh, also in the local part, uh, local dense and the animals coordinate. And the red, red number is just the time duration. So you can see after here, the thousand, thousand seconds, basically after thousand seconds. And this is the main signals coming from. So we can see oh, our many, our length angle band is quite a small. So we can, this is also another important reason we do the very good set a male. And here, I shoot some uh, uh, small movies we did by ourselves and to, to share with you. So, this is the hidden mask we catch by the uh, WCD detector, and so each point is reached each by the PMD. And you see that based on this side, we can see the hidden children from the shell. So, the direction is the closely by the green side. So, we also can see from the top. The theta and the phi is also very close uh, from the same direction. And then the last thing is the number of phi can be basically into the sink in the primary energy of this photo. Number of photons of light So, once we got the boundary construction, we get the direction from the dry, ugly, and easy direction. So, you can see. And from this direction, it's from the bright and white. So, the document is a little bit of a system. I can see that from India. So, that is the Javi to do hand for mapping. And uh, again, then, so that brings uh, this Javi from the book, bright. Bright is of the old time. And here is, I showed you some uh, significant map at the different energy range, and also show the result from the WCD in 270 seconds. And the significance can be reached around the close to the one. And also from 10 to 8, and the significant map is around the uh, 20. So then well, we analyze data and then we publish the result in the files and on the 8th of June and this month, and it's just the online. And also, we, we send it on, on the IP. Uh, everybody is welcome to see our result. And here is the same result. And the panel A is in the intrinsic spectrum, and B is observed spectrum. And it is a five meter time duration. Yeah. <clears throat> and here is the light curve. And the important thing is we see a very sharp, uh, sharp lighting. And also, and during the decay phase, we, we directly see that uh, the break, the jet break, which brings this, uh, um, um, this journey has a very narrow walk of the temple along the way. And this is we do some modeling and uh, we will find the uh, get the uh, full description. 
and it seems nothing special compared with the other diabetes. <clears throat> in the future, there are two things. One is go to the high energy, one is go to the low energy. And the next day, I believe, and our black research has sent another paper with a high performance from the Cambridge uh, data and to the side next day. So I'm, so I'm afraid I cannot see uh, more, more stuff out there. But uh, for the low energy part, and we are working on the to get the energy snap also goes to the 100 and even down to the 50 GV. And so here I briefly uh, introduce the class uh, uh, for the AGM because it's a very interesting candidate of the region. So uh, WCB also has a very good facility to do some research, and we can see through the microwave lens, and we got the very interesting result. And for example, this one has had a different spike, uh, complicated structure with the very spice. Spikes structure, and if you see the uh, blocks and the index, it seems to belong to the different group. So, behind it, there are many works to be doing. And the uh, water, so at our paper now, we have run a real time library monitor. So, everyone, uh, so in the future, then everyone can get this information. And so, we also did some uh, deep observation for the sinus region. And get some detailed result, and now the result is uh, still waiting for the data uh, 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 review. And also, we uh, get some result about the diffuse summary emission and uh, from the pen to the uh, sodium TV. And, uh, and this result has something to the PIL. And uh, here also is a very preliminary result from the whole last one that is from the one EV to the one EV class class. That is the result is that the good connection and between the Fermi and the last one. And also here is some result about the anisotropy. And we also can see a very wide range from the one EV to one EV. Some detail of what is from the WCDA. This is from the temporary. And also, uh, some result uh, to affect the uh, to do the energy scale calibration. And uh, because for the HRA and to do the energy calibration is very hard, so here it is very good idea. We use the Mushendo to, to construct this energy scale that we in passing to transfer this scale uh, from the WCD to the WXCD uh, by the constant events of the direction. And so finally, we construct our energy scale around 31%. And with the more data connected, we believe we can reduce it to 10%. And this is some result I got in detail this part of the concentrate uh, mass. Made. And so I come to the conclusion. So the conclusion is just two points. So last one is the full application. And uh, so uh, and we will continue to monitor the low side in the coming 20 years and we hope and in the future and also will do something more interesting with that. And so that's all thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, then. Okay, again, uh, with the time constraint, just one short question, please. Uh, okay. uh, this is about the uh, gamma headers. Uh, usually, when you do spectrum modeling, you come out as not with a single power rule, but uh, with something like overacting parabolic shape. See, you try something like this when you pick the data. Um, I have to see. And to be honest, I'm not a GRV expert, and my colleague may be uh, the right person to answer this, but I know something, and they tried something else, and they found this explanation is not the only one, and they agree, and the other models other also, also can do the CT. Okay, thank you very much, again. Thank you. Professor Martini.
I need, I need a moment. Show me. Sorry. Okay. It is uh, indeed. Where is it? My computer is here. Okay. Sorry. No, I don't need. Uh, we have a very special event, and uh, especially three exceptional presentation. One by Dili yesterday, the one of Nanzang this morning which is uh, very impressive. And uh, the one by uh, Minza uh, just now. And um, it's just fantastic to see what we have seen. My duty is different. And I will try to do my best to introduce, in front of this exceptional data, some of the things that we are doing 
which can lead to their understanding. Of course, there are jewels like uh, this, uh, but uh, what we have seen. Nanzang has shown us the action around black holes, neutron star, magnetic field, all that, marvelous. But uh, it's in this last le lecture, which uh, I have been really very uh, uh, surprised. First of all, to see this fantastic data of the crab extending, we knew the tail, but extending all the way to the pev so perfectly. And then, of course, this incredible set of data in tev of GRB 22109A, just pointing in the tab toward us. What can I do to tell where I think there can be something in which we can help? Okay, historically, everything starts from the crab. I mean, there were four all uh, relativistic astrophysics was initiated by the crab. And I remember vividly when I was a student to have uh, the, gr the great shock created in us the discovery of a pulsar in the crab nebula. I was so excited in my thesis that um, I got the great fortune to meet in Paris John Archibald Wheeler, and in 1968, I was received by Wheeler in Princeton, where he dedicated to me this beautiful picture of himself, Yukawa, and uh, Einstein. And uh, it was exactly looking at the pulsar, of the crab pulsar, that uh, in Princeton, uh, David Wilkinson, who later on became the head of the WMAP mission for cosmology, was working in studying the first derivative and the second derivative of the pulsar. And uh, I told, but this, uh, I'm not worried about the first period, the, the, the second, but what is clear is that if the pulsar is pulsating today at 33 milliseconds, it must happen that when it was formed in 1054, if today is at 33 milliseconds, it should be rotating at a millisecond. And if it's rotating at a millisecond at the beginning, it could not have been a just rotating, but it very likely had to be a triaxial ellipsoid. I proposed this uh, in, uh, in an article at the time, and, uh, and this was reproposing to study fast rotation object that they could go triaxial ellipsoid and even having a fission. We submitted, uh, Wheeler was very non sure about this idea, but I would like just to stress that this can lead to the explanation, I will try to do this effort, this idea could lead to understanding of the data from uh, GRB 22109A. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, the idea, one key idea, that rotating object could be uh, origin of millisecond pulse, uh, millisecond object, and I will show you how we have got the evidence just in the last day. But there was another, okay, this is one idea, triaxial ellipsoid. The other idea, of course, that everybody knows is uh, our work in Princeton that that was finally submitted to APJ. It went to the editor uh, uh, at the time was Chandrasekhar. He reviewed the paper himself, and he said, oh, yes, uh, 
is accepted immediately, but you have to mention, my work is said, Chandra, that if you have a triaxial ellipsoid, this ellipsoid losing energy, it will not increase the, its period, but it will shrink the period. We have just discovered this effect. But let's go back to the great wor work in Princeton uh, following this one of triaxial ellipsoid. This was the work introduced with uh, Christodoulou. The, uh, 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 the work with Christodoulou, with uh, Kerr and uh, Hawking, of course, the mass energy formula of the black hole. Needless to say, I cannot have time. I don't want to make history of that. Just to remind that uh, all this mass formula happen in a difference of few days, one from the other, and uh, so the contribution uh, with uh, Hawking independently from uh, Christodoulou and myself. And, uh, and this formula is the basic for uh, another phenomena, namely the energy extraction from black hole, and uh, which was started practically by the observation of the Beposac satellite and, uh, and the great uh, field of uh, relativistic astrophysics which made the black hole really very, very important in order to explain some of the energy emission from uh, GRB. And uh, there was an explanation, uh, but these are the two seeds, the black hole formula and the triaxial ellipsoid. We will present, there will be a, a set of le lectures. I think uh, the following one will be Rueda focusing on something which I have only the time to speak very uh, shortly. Then uh, there will be another contribution technical um, by Carlo Bianco, and then uh, a beautiful contribution uh, by Moradi, and then finally one view about uh, the beginning of the GRB. I have not uh, the time to you will enjoy to see all this. Uh, to be, uh, to be uh, uh, very short, uh, starting, uh, 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 one view will show how in some of this GRB there is the possibility of seeing also the TEV. One of the most dramatic presentation will be the, the one uh, the, the one by Moradi uh, proposing that, pro uh, that uh, the crab could be, uh, been a, a, a gamma ray burst. And then, of course, there will be the presentation which, which uh, uh, will go in all the details of uh, what uh, uh, of the BDHN classification by Rueda. Well, <clears throat> the key point about uh, our mo model for a GRB is just a binary system. A binary system which, has, um, which is formed by a tensolar mass core in, uh, with uh, a neutron star uh, companion, and uh, the, 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 the core of the CO core of tensolar mass collapse accretes on the companion neutron star, which transform into a black hole. And all this has been reconstructed in great details, and Orge will go through that. Uh, and show the moment of formation of the black hole by accretion from the supernova and uh, the latest evolution. All this, uh, I, I'm sure that, uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, Orge will do a beautiful wo work in presenting these results, and some other results which uh, we had the fortune that were very well introduced yesterday by uh, 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 um, uh, well, about the supernova associated to this event, um, uh, and uh, and uh, and the fact that all supernova associated with this BDHN chain uh, have practically the sa the same uh, energy, and they are all practically twins of each other. This will uh, again be shown by 
by Org later on. But the key point about the gamma ray burst is uh, that they are uh, many events, uh, many different physics intervening. There are many different satellites participating. And um, uh, of course, uh, from, the, uh, from the data uh, in, uh, of the uh, Fermi satellite, in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the GBM and uh, uh, in uh, LAT, La uh, uh, from uh, uh, MEV to, uh, to the, all the way to the JEV. And, uh, and these are uh, already uh, uh, characterizing uh, some uh, of the events which uh, are found uh, in the GRB. And one of the great results which we have obtained in the last uh, 20 years, practically, has been to f understand that the GRB is a system very, very complex, and there are seven different events uh, which characterize seven different processes, completely different, which characterize the most general GRB. This is one of the examples of such a GRB, uh, 18 or 720B, where you have the first event which is still being explored in this day, the moment in which the supernova of this 10 solar mass core gravitational collapse and uh, is the first event, the appearance of the supernova, then the accretion, uh, then uh, the, uh, the problem of fission which we, have stu we are studying, and, um, and then uh, the first emission uh, observed by uh, 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 associated to the black hole formation uh, in the, uh, uh, by, by uh, 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 Fermi, and then uh, the very, very, very important data, uh, not by Fermi, but uh, by Swift, which gives the, uh, all the long-standing uh, 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 X-ray X-ray afterglow. Okay, here is the, the collapse of the CO core. Here, the formation of the black hole in, uh, in, uh, in this particular event, which uh, is observed in the job. And then we start this fantastic, uh, long-lasting X-ray emission, uh, which is uh, related, observed by, um, by Swift. Well, I will spend practically the key part of the lecture on this. I will not, I will not spend the, the time uh, to look uh, at this moment uh, to the, to the, to the death radiation, uh, which will be a consequence of this uh, other uh, moment. But uh, uh, there are uh, also in this source, 18 or 720b, there is uh, TEV radiation here. But uh, in the other source, and, but we understand everything about this system. We have made, thanks to Yang Li and, and Wang Yu and all our team, uh, a, a spectral analysis of uh, all the seven events which characterize uh, which characterize this, uh, where, where is the point here? The seven different events, uh, uh, phenomena, episode which characterize a GRB. Okay, all this is the tales, and here is another GRB very, very important, which is 1901-14C, where is it, here? And uh, again, you see, uh, the, the prompt part uh, by Fermi Lat, and then this fantastic part here, which uh, is due to the uh, observation of Swift, and, uh, uh, and then here the, the optical supernova, and I think Rueda will go through to explain that these are effect just uh, of synchrotron emission. But uh, this is the beauty I would like to, it uh, was not, uh, was 20 years of work. 
to understand uh, the different event, the different physics going in every one of these uh, 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 regions, the UPE, uh, the physics of the UPE, which was uh, developed by Moradi, the physics uh, of the new neutron star eyes, which I will enter into detail now, the UPE, the cavity, the new neutron star eyes. Okay, these are, the, uh, and there is plenty of uh, new physics, uh, fundamental physics, representing the interaction, the interaction between uh, uh, electrodynamical process in very strong gravitational field, cell similarity, and the structure of this kind which characterize the UP. All this uh, is done, is done. And, uh, and the seven episodes have been shown uh, in different BDHN type, BDHN1, BDHN2, and et cetera. But I would like to spend the rest of the time on these two new, new GRB, 2201.01 and 2210.09a. 2201.01 has been by far the most uh, powerful afterglow ever emi uh, observed. And uh, we have been fascinated by this afterglow. Dove questo segnale rosso? Where is the point here? No, the point. Yes, yes, it is. It is? Okay. We have been fascinated by this data try to understand the route, where they start. The prompt, of course, that is a different problem. Uh, Olga will speak, but I'm interested in this one. Can we see the route, the moment of birth of this fast rotating neutron star? And uh, how is this related to this our prediction that uh, our prediction before the observation that we would expect the TEV radiation of 22 year expected TEV luminosity within the GCN, fortunately, and the data observed, they are very, very similar uh, in this region. And uh, this is the reason why before the data of uh, before the observed data, we understood quite a lot about this system. We are ready to publish. Here we have the formation of the collapse. Here we have uh, fission. Here we have, uh, 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 but I would like to go back, if you don't mind, to the analysis of this uh, and change of paradigm on these three recent, uh, three archive of the last seven days. Uh, which um, I think we can, uh, we did a progress which is remarkable. Okay. You take all the GRB, and in particular, we took 300 GRB. There is a problem with uh, the observation the, uh, there is a problem with the observation by, uh, by Swift because the trigger of the GRB is given by Fermi. By the time, by the time you look at Swift, uh, there is a period of 40, 40 seconds before Swift start to look. And in this 40 second, we need the data because you, we need to identify precisely the moment in which this uh, new neutron star fast rotating spinning originates. And we notice something very beautiful with uh, our colleague also 
Pomeran, Mirtorabian Hall. That if you plot the, the, this time, the rest frame XRT uh, as a function of time, and you take into account the redshift, instead, uh, or not for the nearby sources, but if you go far away at z equal 4 here, 220101, you can detect the GRB, the data in X-ray early. Not after 40 seconds, but after 10 seconds. And if you go farther away still, at z equal 8, you can find the data within a few seconds from the, for, from the gravitational collapse. And if you go farther again at z equal 10, but fortunately we have such GRB. And therefore we can have data extending all the way to the beginning, to the root, to the root, to the root of this uh, uh, moment of formation. Here is the black hole part, here is this uh, new, new, very fast spinning neutron star. We have, I have very few minutes, this will be uh, discussed by, by Carlo Bianco, this will be discussed by Carlo Bianco, this I speak. Let's take 220101. You can detect the first 10 seconds here, in which the luminosity of the X-ray increases, uh, increases. And if you do the model like we did, you can see that this is a, is a, a triaxial ellipsoid which uh, spins, like Chandra said, spin up while it's losing angular momentum. And then instead, in this case, you have just the normal, the normal um, uh, um, evolution of, um, of um, the normal evolution of um, a Maclaurin ellipsoid. Therefore, this goes back to the very, very first paper that I published in Princeton. And we give here for the first time the evidence in this other source, which is 090423 at z equal, uh, 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 equal 8.2. Again, you see the, for the first raising part of the triaxial ellipsoid and uh, the, here the Maclaurin ellipsoid. And uh, here you see at z, at the other source, at uh, z equal nine, again uh, the, the triaxial ellipsoid to start with, and then uh, the Maclaurin ellipsoid. Uh, here, uh, uh, and we are developing, you will hear in the presentation of Shrui, that uh, we have uh, the theory which has been developed on the basis uh, of the, I understand I have only one minute, so, so uh, on the theory of the, uh, of the uh, this is just being published, uh, uh, submitted, in which you have a CO core of 10 solar mass. The, the, the CO core of 10 solar mass uh, is put in rotation by a binary neutron star is very, very fast spinning. This tensor mass core uh, fission into 8.5 solar mass core and in a companion of 1.5 solar mass co uh, companion, the 1.5 solar mass companion spinning at the order of a millisecond is precisely the pulsar like the one generated in the crab and uh, this is the underlying physics, theoretical physics, which is uh, summarized on the, on the ground, uh, on the physics uh, of this uh, component. And there are di many different conclusions. Uh, the, 
the most important uh, uh, are uh, uh, obtained for this 354. Indeed, a, a fantastic opportunity opens up for new missions because uh, if we, uh, we can, I mean, the important point of this actual ellipsoid is that we can observe them. This is the point. We can, we can compute the period of rotation and, uh, and, uh, and in this region, in this region, there is emission of gravitational waves. Therefore, in principle, we have a way, and here, of course, will not be gravitational waves because they are uh, actually symmetric. But in principle, we have a new possibility. If we have a detector, not like SWIFT, but a detector which can track what we find at the big Z, uh, immediately after the, the formation in this region, and it's possible certainly to do that with a new mission like Theseus, we could detect the, pulsa the pulsational period, this, which we see at Z equal uh, 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 four, at Z, thanks to this uh, cosmological amplification as, as equal uh, uh, eight and nine, but we could observe this in nearby GRB and then correlate with the gravitational wave detection. This is by far one of the most exciting possibility. The three year of cosmic energy sources. Well, the first, uh, the first era of uh, the cosmi uh, cosmic energy source was clearly dictated by Fermi and uh, when he did uh, the computation of cosmological nuclear synthesis and uh, the, the, co the observation of the cosmic background radiation. This has dominated the physics, uh, the, the, the cosmology in the beginning. There has been a second era, the, the stellar nucleosynthesis, where Bete, Barbage, oil, and finally completed in the Borexino experiment in which the role of neutrino was understood in the nuclear evolution. Well, this has been the second era. Now it's a new era. A new era which started, uh, and you will hear more, about the quantum electrodynamics energy extraction process from rotating black holes. Let's, uh, but uh, this is the era we are living now, and uh, I think we, have heard, uh, we are hearing every minute more especially with the interaction which we are having with Felix and everybody else. This is the new era, the quantum electrodynamic, the energy extraction from the molecular and neutron star, the data from LASO, and uh, uh, this is the new era. And now we are even clear after the last uh, discussion of yesterday from Space Telescope that uh, indeed, uh, everything has to be modified. Very likely, uh, it's not the old idea about uh, the cosmological nucleosynthesis, uh, the stellar evolution is completely surpassed by the physics of black holes. Black holes are much more central. There could be black holes of the order of 10 to the 10 solar masses just after 100,000 years from the Big Bang. And this can create the, the, the matter which generates the GRB and so forth and so on. Therefore, I, I have not the time, anything else than uh, to tell uh, this message. The three era and the era we are living in is the era of the black hole quantum and heterodynamics extraction process. And we are learning completely new physics all the dream of uh, Heisenberg of vacuum polarization and all this uh, to find it, uh, well, is uh, there. We find uh, in the UP the old uh, uh, qu extreme quantum electrodynamical condition. We have published this thanks to uh, Raim and the uh, companion. But uh, can, what can we say today new? Let us, however, reflect that manca mankind is at the very beginning of his existence. On the astronomical time scale, it has lived only for a few brief moments. 
it has only just begun to notice the cosmos, the cosmos outside itself. It is perhaps hardly likely to interpret the surrounding right in the first few minutes his eyes are open. This fantastic sentence was given by Sarah James Jeans in 1929. Yes, we have the three different era. We are noticing the new era, but it's not clear where we are going to go from here on. The only thing we have to keep discussing, looking at the data, making the theory, and be guided, uh, be guided by a uh, 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 journalist uh, told me, asked me uh, uh, a few days ago, <laughs> but uh, for everything is changing, but how can you be sure that uh, you are guided by something? Yes, the answer is easy. Yes, it's changing everything, but we are guided because there is a fundamental theory which is more and more clear, correct, and is guiding us, is Einstein theory of general relativity. And we will dedicate this also to the next Grossman meeting in Beijing. I need time. But uh, they were just flashes. But you will hear a much more clear presentation, I think, on some of this aspect by the other member of uh, ICRANET, uh, starting from uh, uh, Oger Weda. But uh, let me say it's a fantastic opportunity we have in this meeting, because all the data which we are acquiring are not coming just uh, uh, as data. No, no, no. The fact that uh, you obtain such fantastic data of the crab, this means that there, there is a black hole inside. Th this is the message I am carrying. We have an understanding of the overall theory uh, under which we have to collaborate and re uh, fertilize your fantastic data with our understanding of the theory. But we have plenty of work to be done. And the physics is completely new. I mean, we, we are not discussing any longer if vacuum polarization exists and support the, the, the thing of Heisenberg. No, we see the UPE. We see field over critical. We see per creation. We see everything. It's just a question of fitting, uh, of the great opportunity of fitting the data and the theory. And progress, both of us progress. Progress the theory, progress the uh, uh, rotate the, but, but let me go back. Uh, 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 last, last, last. Newton, McLaurin, Jacobi, all the great mathematicians, Jeans, Chandrasekhar worked on the ellipsoid, all of them. They never found a way to apply them. What is fantastic is that uh, in this new, in these neutron stars, pulsate, rotating at a millisecond, we can see them, finally, the triaxial ellipsoid. And there is physics associated to this triaxial ellipsoid, and I'm sure there is the a way to explain with the physics of triaxial ellipsoid and, and their electrodynamics, the Tev radiation. This is the key point I want to just make. Okay. Okay, now give a nice presentation, very quiet. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. That's okay. So, good morning. So, let me. Uh, continue to give a, a few more details um, about not about all processes mentioned before, not about all uh, processes mentioned before, but I have to focus because I have 
on limited time, so I have to focus on the, just few of them. Um, but uh, let me start uh, to recall what is our model for uh, GRBs. So uh, what is natural for us is to consider um, a binary model for GRBs. Why? Since we know that GRBs are related um, to massive stars, to death of massive stars, and most uh, massive stars are observing binary. So uh, it's, it looks like natural to follow that path. And this is a, a stellar evolution path of a binary yeah, <clears throat> through a different phases. And what we are focused on is in this uh, last stage. So this like of a sec second supernova stage of a massive binary, it has been considered previously for the explanation of whatever uh, they are called the ultra stripe binaries to, oh sorry, uh, has been explored for the formation of neutral star binaries. What we are doing here is to explore also that these uh, kind of binaries for some a special set of parameters, there can also uh, exist a different family in which there, this um, can generate a cataclysmic phenomena, more energetic, is associated with the GRB. So there will be a family of GRB depending on the, uh, this, uh, the properties of these binaries. What is this binary? This is a carbon oxygen star exploding in a supernova with a neutron star companion nearby. So uh, and here, so we have to study what is happening in this explosion. So what is happening here, you see the layers of the star, you see here the forming and the, 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 this uh, newborn neutron star at the center of this supernova explosion. Currently, we are exploring this different possibility mentioned by, by Remoru Fini before of that this neutron star is formed by different process of fission, but in this, this is, let's see, this is, this is a traditional channel in which you form it at the center of the supernova. This ejecta is going to expand, and if this is a um, neutron star companion, it's, it's near enough, it will, uh, it will <coughs> undergo a, a very massive accretion process into it um, with some hydrodynamic process and a huge um, neutrino emission too of MEV neutrinos uh, that, that uh, allow this process, uh, this accretion process to follow, and eventually, this uh, neutron star can become a black hole. Um, so uh, this is just a set of, uh, of, of uh, references um, studying this uh, process and simulating this process. I will mention a little bit more about that. Uh, in this kind of system, we have a multi-mission emission. We call this system binary-driven hypernova. So we have uh, neutrinos, we have gravitational waves, electromagnetic radiation, and eventually cosmic phase. Um, neutrinos we have in the process of accretion onto the, these neutron stars, these are typically EV neutrinos. Uh, we, we have studied also the possibility that there are EV and TV neutrinos uh, from a different, um, not in that process, but in a different one, when there is expansion of electron positron plasma, we'll speak up a little bit more about that, carrying the baryons, and these baryons with, uh, low, with high gamma factor uh, will uh, hit the, all the all other baryons, and by proton-proton collisions create uh, GV and TV neutrinos. Well, there are also gravitational waves that was just mentioned because of this possible, uh, uh, this necessarily transition from the initial preaxial uh, form of the neutron star to the axially symmetric case. So these are, uh, this is the, 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 <coughs> the only appreciable emission of gravitational waves that we expect from this system. And we expect, by looking at the numbers of this transition, that this could be eventually observed or detected by, 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 by interferometers mm -hmm. like, like go up to more or less 100 megaparsecs. We have the old electromagnetic radiation. These are the, the TRB episodes mentioned before that uh, uh, we'll mention right now. And the possibility eventually also to uh, emit um, cosmic rays or uh, to launch uh, high energy particles, charged particles from the black hole. This is a table that we made in a recent paper uh, was, uh, that submitted. It's a summary of this. Uh, this is electromagnetic emission of the, of, of, of mo the most general one. So this is, you see these, I, I added here, this is type one, um, because there is this classification that we made. Just a type one are those in which you form the black hole from this accretion process. 
you can imagine if the accretion process is not large enough, that is, you will always not form in a black hole, but you can also just keep the system as form a double neutron star. Or even if the, the, the system is, uh, the, the explosion disrupt the system, that will form just a two runaway star. So in the other case, when the, the, you don't form the black hole, we call them the type two. Um, the, the, the main parameter is uh, deciding this is the orbital period. This is the main one. Not the only one, but it's the main one. And so we have here a series of ep a, a physical episodes, and this is, these are observational. Uh, and these are the physical episodes that are uh, ongoing. So we have the core collapse of the CU star, the accretion onto the two neutron stars, actually not only on the companion, but also on the newborn one and the center of, of the supernova. You have uh, two uh, main. Um, uh, processes uh, related to the physics of the black hole. It is, uh, I will focus on especially on this one. Um, then is the uh, synchrotron emission uh, powering uh, the afterglow. Uh, I will not focus on that part, uh, but um, we have some uh, <clears throat> uh, theoretical model for that and show that it works to explain the, the X-ray uh, optical and radio emission of the afterglow of the long GRBs. And then they have the traditional optical emission of the supernova powered by nickel decay uh, in the supernova. And you have all these processes you've seen, you can see them in the different parts of the light cure, the most general light cure of a GRB that we call episode zero, one, two, three, all the way up to seven episodes in the most general light cure. This is uh, <clears throat> starting from the massive, uh, from the from the binary evolution all the way, you have all the different processes here ongoing in the inner binary. This is a set of relevant theoretical works uh, starting from 2012 all the way to the rest, all the way to, to, to 2023. Um, uh, this is a, these are only the theoretical works, the only way we have uh, making all computations, simulations, uh, estimates of all these processes, starting from these uh, first papers on these. Uh, uh, simulations of the accretion processes, then uh, looking at the um, also general relativistic effects uh, uh, on the due to the to the space-time properties of the neutron star. Then simulations on the expansion of uh, formation of electron-positron plasma around the black hole. We have uh, studies of uh, neutrino emission, even the neutrino flavor oscillations around the, this uh, uh, this uh, of the MEB neutrinos. Uh, so in the system, we have the three-dimensional simulations of the, <coughs> of the first moments of this explosion. Then we have some uh, papers about this uh, synchrotron emission by uh, explaining the afterglow. Uh, we have also then this, um, some um, uh, papers about the, the, the QED effect, uh, so the formation of electron-positron plasma around the black hole and this uh, as a mechanism to explain the prom emission in the G of the GRB at, in the MEB regimes. And uh, finally, uh, we have the uh, works about the GEV emission. Uh, I will uh, speak a little bit more about that. Um, <clears throat> and, the, and the ones of the gravitational waves. So this is a quick overview of the works. Um, we have, so let me start to show this was uh, how this binary looks when you simulate it. So here you have this is a three-dimensional view of the supernova explosion. Here you have, you see the binaries. These are the two, this is uh, the neutron star forming at the center of the supernova explosion. This is the neutron star companion uh, that is gaining mass and angular momentum and is going to become a black hole. Uh, so this is a, a picture of reconstruction from uh, simulations from uh, SCH, uh, smooth particle hydrodynamic simulations that have been made mainly by, uh, this is uh, Laura Becerra um, <clears throat> and, and Chris Fryer. Uh, so with, uh, with their help, we are doing these kind of simulations. These are more uh, few snapshots of that. Uh, this is taken from, uh, from paper of 2019 and from a recent paper of 2022, uh, where we have uh, make a new set of simulations exploring different parameters. So we have uh, changing initial mass of the components, changing uh, the orbital period, uh, changing the velocity, considering also asymmetric supernova explosions. Uh, so we have all this uh, classification and a, a sort of catalog in our papers with the different phase of the binary. To um, what we want to do uh, doing that is also to end some 
um, not only classification, but information that can be uh, used also in, for example, in population synthesis analysis, so in such a way that we can uh, uh, help to, to reconstruct how many systems will be BDH1, well, how many systems will be BDH2. So this is our final aim by making this uh, white uh, parameter space exploration of the, of the system. So you can see at the end what we have so far, this, this is the new nuclear star form and the center of supernova, this is the companion. Uh, 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 some uh, nice, um, one of the features that we are uh, currently um, exploring is that you see these, these two stars actually, they start this, uh, you two, if you for two neutron stars or neutron star a black hole, anyway, they are counter-rotating in sheer order. Okay? This is one of the things uh, that you should be considered also when making um, one of our, uh, the important uh, connections of this model is that if you form these compact objects, this binary of compact objects, then in due time, they will merge and they eventually will form a short GRB. So uh, the, in this, this model makes a clear prediction that it's a connection between the long GRB population and the short GRB population. So uh, this is a, a topic, I think uh, Carlo Bianco will speak a little bit more about that, uh, but it's a, a clear um, prediction of this, of this model. Uh, this is just to show you simulation that the, the actually the neutron star becomes a black hole, so it reach the, the, the neutron star by accretion can reach the, 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 the instability limits, and then eventually by exploring, sorry, um, different binary periods, then you can eventually separate the system in which you form and you don't form a black hole. We are updating actually this study. We are now exploring different, you know, nuclear equation of a state of neutron star is essentially unknown at very high density, so you have different possibilities. Uh, and so we, we, uh, we dream actually to use GRBs to give, uh, uh, to put constraints to nuclear equation of state uh, of neutron stars by deciding, I mean, they're looking at the system, which are, if this equation of a state is very soft, then you will form easily black holes. Uh, maybe you cannot form many, many black holes by, because otherwise you will have too many GRBs of high energy. So uh, uh, this is something uh, that we are doing right now. It's not finished, but we are uh, getting there. So um, now I'll focus on the processes um, related to the, to the newborn black hole only. There are two main processes here, uh, but let me just introduce what we call the inner engine of this machine. Uh, this is just the, this, uh, the, 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 the neutron star uh, I showed you before is gaining not only uh, mass but also angular momentum, so we will collapse and form a curved black hole. Or some spins, the spin of this, uh, of this uh, newer black hole will be, some, it will be about 0 0.5, 0 0.7. Um, <clears throat> so we have this rotating black hole at the center. Uh, the eventually, uh, the uh, neutron star is magnetized, so you will, it will be some magnetic field permeating here the black hole, and there will be some, uh, some uh, particles around it will be a low density plasma, uh, which we all have estimated density will be between 10 to minus 14 and 10 to minus 6 uh, grams per cubic centimeter, um, depending on the direction, because this is, uh, there is uh, asymmetry, uh, I showed you this in the, in the pictures before, uh, asymmetry in the density, in the density around the black hole. So essentially there is a very low density near the black hole and in other regions there is higher density. So this, <clears throat> when you have the electric field, the magnetic field and the rotating electric field, uh, the rotating black hole, you will induce an electric field that you see here with these, uh, these are gray lines, this is electric field lines that uh, they have, you see they are pointing, there is this polar region, they are pointing uh, inward while there is a equatorial region where they are pointing outward um, <clears throat> so you have this essentially, it's like you have uh, a surface, uh, you use a surface charge from the black hole in which some part is negative and some part is positive. Uh, so you have a, actually a quadrupolar, uh, um, a quadrupolar um, uh, geometry, let's say, of this uh, surface charge of the black hole. You can see it by that. Uh, this is um, a way to, to look, uh, to examine uh, the properties of this, uh, we, we use a simplified model. We, uh, we bit by bit, we uh, add more ingredients, but let's start with this. This is the, uh, the wall solution, 1974, of electromagnetic field. 
are on a curved black hole. You have a curved black hole in this uh, uniform magnetic field, and these are the components of the electric and magnetic field. Uh, and with this, we can uh, study uh, these, uh, these processes. The first thing uh, is the prom emission, MEV emission of the GRB by the, this ultra relativistic prom emission of the GRB. What happens is that if the magnetic field, the initial one, is large enough, it's a, it's a supercritical field, supercritical magnetic field, you will have a supercritical electric field too. And so you will uh, create electron positron pairs. Uh, these are the regions where you form electron positron pairs around the black hole. You would form so many that they will, uh, uh, will form essentially a plasma of electron positron pairs that will ex expand and reach uh, in the low density region around the black hole, it can expand and reach high low factor of even a thousand. So, uh, and eventually this plasma is, is going to, to, to get the transparent and then emit uh, MEV, uh, MEV energies. <clears throat> so this has been, uh, we have made a set of simulations of that plasma going into the different regions around this, uh, I, in the, in the density profiles of our simulations and showing that essentially, in fact, you have initially, it can reach a gamma factor of more than 100 and, uh, and explain the MEV emission of the GRB. So this is the, the, the first point. Then the second is when you have higher energies, uh, for example, the GV emission, we look at this is a overview of the energetics of the GRB. This is that the, 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 the electric energy is stored in the system. And uh, what, what my point now goes to the black hole energetics, to the, to the energy that is available to explain this because we are radiating. Uh, there is some, something that has to pay the price of that radiation and that must be the black hole. So uh, in the next slide I will uh, speak about that. So uh, when this initial magnetic field is supercritical and then the electric field is supercritical too and meet pairs. <clears throat> and produce pairs and emit the MEV radiation. Then this magnetic field, these pairs will screen the magnetic field. We have some simulations which are showing that uh, this eventually dump the magnetic field to the hey, more, norm, more less critical values. The electric field becomes under critical, but still high magnetic electric field. So when the magnetic field is about 10 to the is of the order of 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 Gauss, then still electric field is anyway high uh, enough to uh, produce, to accelerate particles to high energies and eventually lead to uh, photons in this uh, GEV regime. So we have these uh, simulations of this. I will jump a little bit more at uh, this. So this is a, a, a trajectory of a particle in this ele electromagnetic field. Uh, extraction around the black hole. <clears throat> this is uh, at the beginning a sort of synchrotron radiation, but only at the, beginning, only at the very beginning. And then it will eventually just uh, follow uh, the magnetic field line uh, and just reproduce only acceleration, uh, radiation by acceleration. Uh, we have made some simulations about this and showing that the gamma factor is about 10, between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5. Uh, this is for electrons and <clears throat> eventually produce uh, a, uh, photons in the in the GV point one GV or one GV um, <clears throat> uh, energy range. So have the power. This is the power. This is power per particle, of course. Uh, and this is uh, the same. This is a spectrum. Uh, a spectrum of this, and then you can eventually show uh, this the luminosity for uh, the, for uh, for some number of particles around the black hole. You will uh, eventually got to get the, the, the right luminosity, those are luminosity. So when you request that the black hole pays the price of this, then you can, then you can infer what the mass, uh, the properties of the black hole, so the spin mass, the reducible mass, and the magnetic field uh, around, around it. So we want to <coughs> focus on this in the, in the last, uh, I don't know how, how much time I have. But it's okay. Um, destruction process uh, of energy of the black hole. So this, uh, the black hole has to reduce its mass and its angular momentum while this happens. But how? This is, uh, this is the question I would like to, would like to answer. So <clears throat> this is, uh, uh, for in doing this, 
This is the same solution as before, including the effects of uh, the charge. Because when the particles start to enter the black hole, positive and negative, the black hole start to gain some charge. So we have to include the effects of this charge into the, of the, in, in, the, in, the, in our electromagnetic field. And it, it looks like this. This is zero, was the, uh, actually is without charge. So the first equations I show, and these are these, are these Q uh, extra factors are the one, uh, the, the, the effects of this new charge that the black hole is gaining. And we want to explore exactly what happens to the particles when uh, you have this. So this is the same diagram as before, electric and magnetic field line for um, <clears throat> different charge of the black hole. This is the charge parameter. Here is zero, is neutral, so it, it, or initial condition. And this is what to negative, if the black hole gains negative charge, then uh, the structure change like this, or if it change, uh, if it gains positive charge, the structure will be like this. The important uh, things to see here is that, for example, if you see what is this, uh, this region, you have this, uh, this uh, oblique uh, here, this uh, uh, line separating the region where the electric field here is inward and here is outward. You can see here, this is uh, this, uh, this line. Um, this region, these uh, la green lines is, uh, are the, uh, is, uh, is a boundary this is uh, where the region where the particles, the, 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 the region where the particles uh, have uh, the right conditions to get uh, captured by the black hole. Okay? So what you see here is that uh, by changing the charge, this region changes. Okay? This region changes. What it gains positive charge, this region sh is shrinking here. So what happens is that at, in, the, uh, in the end, it, at the same condition, it, um, <clears throat> it favors to capture positive particles, more positive charged particles than negatively charged particles. And at the different conditions is the opposite. So let's uh, see uh, what happens. <clears throat> this uh, here maybe is more clear. This is uh, this region of the charged par uh, particles uh, captured by the black hole and showing this energy. I am focusing on electrons and protons. So when you have, for example, uh, inward electric field, then you have in that region, you have electrons going out and protons going in. In the equatorial region, you will have electrons going in and protons going out. So uh, <clears throat> this uh, region, the angle uh, separating that is, this, the gray, is the gray line. So if we start from this uh, zero charge, is this separating here? This is more or less at 57 degrees or so from the pole, from the from the pole of the black hole, and then you, we have this red. This red line is the region is separating where protons can capture. So uh, uh, the black hole can capture black hole, for example, from zero all the way to 40 degrees, and can capture electrons only in this tiny region. So under these conditions, it, the, the black hole will uh, tend to capture more positively charged particles. But when it starts to gain charge, when we have to go to this picture, when it gains some positive charge, what happens? So the region starts to shrink, and then it cannot gain, uh, uh, and the, at some critical point, the situation reverses. It can, it's a, the capture of electrons is favored. So we have to, when computing, at the end, we have to compute the, how mass is changing, how angular momentum is changing, and how the reducible mass of the black hole is changing in this process, continuously. So we have a situation like this. So at the end, I put only the positively, the positive charge case, because it, it seems that if you start neutral, you will move to the positively charged uh, conditions. So um, this is uh, the mass of the black hole. Uh, this is the change of the mass of the black hole. Let me see here is the green, uh, the green curves here. This uh, orange of the angular momentum of the black hole, and the gray is the, is the, redu is the reducible change of the reducible mass. Here you have the uh, energy of the particles. Uh, here I'm already uh, <coughs> uh, summing up uh, all the energies of all particles that can be captured by the black hole, both positive and, and, and negative, uh, separated here. You see, this is the electrons. The electrons' energy are the, the, the blue ones. The protons' energy are the red ones. Uh, and uh, in the end, you have the, the black one is the sum of two. 
And the same for the angular momentum, colors are, uh, are the same, but angular momentum is given by the dashed uh, cubes. So what happens here, you see uh, energy, uh, the, 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 this, the, this is uh, not process giving, leading to energy extraction from the black hole at zero charge. But at some point, you see, for example, when the charge is 0 0.2, this is charge factor, this is in units of the wall charge, so it's in units of twice J, uh, J, J, B. Uh, at some point, you see there are regions where uh, start, for example, angular momentum start to be negative, the, uh, the, the angular momentum start to gain negative angular momentum, and at some point, it also gains energy, negative energy, total negative energy. The sum of protons and electrons at the end give you some uh, negative. And here is this situation, start, you start to extract energy from the black hole, and then the situation starts to reverse because it is cannot continue to gain positive charge. But it starts to go back, it goes back again, and then at some point the situation reverses again, it goes back, back. So um, uh, this is my, actually my final uh, uh, slide because uh, just to, the situation is something like this, that uh, there's a region, we have to move farther. This is also a, simple, a, simpler, a simple model, but um, we have to now to simulate that what to do now is a, a real simulation of this process by look, putting some particles around the black hole and uh, uh, by this simple, si simple um, um, situation, it seems that the black hole will start to accrete positive particle from the pole, negative particle from the equator, and move into a situation that leads it to uh, energy extraction process at some point. They start to, you start to extract the energy from the black hole, and then the situation uh, starts to reverse again. Uh, it will gain more negative particles from the equator than positive particles from the, from the pole, and then you start to reduce the charge. Then you get some critical point again, then reverse the situation. It's a sonar cycle, a cycle. This uh, repeating, there are this, uh, I, I, I don't have the, this time scale of this cycle yet because I need to simulate this. So, but uh, this is where, um, where we are moving right now to make a, a more, now more uh, realistic, let's say, situation for this. But I'm uh, um, pre pretty sure that this already shows the more general uh, uh, properties of this uh, uh, extraction of uh, energy process. Thank you. The, the, you mean the, the, the initial one? Yeah, your simulation is PI code based on Einstein vector rotation. You mean this one? This one. This is a hybrid simulation because you don't need GR for the. We assume you assume <coughs> the code assumes already a successful supernova explosion. Yes. So um, you are um, uh, you are far enough from the central uh, object. And so this, uh, this part of the simulation is, no, is not GR, okay? The, follow, the one following this trajectory is of the particle. Then there is a GR simulation when they, they uh, reach the gravitational capture region of the, of the companion object, and then we follow that this is a GR, uh, uh, the, the call, there is a call to a, to a general relativistic code that follows the evolution of the neutron star. So the evolution of the neutron star by gaining Th that mass and angular momentum is fully general relativistic. Yes. You tell me where to stop. This one?
The rate. Oh, the rate, uh, it depends on the number of particles that you have, of course, because here it's just radiation by acceleration of particles, but it can be to. Oh, yeah, you are computing numerically, but yes, we are uh, getting from. Uh, yeah, just getting, I don't have it here. This P is the, here is the, the power release uh, that comes from here. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, typical uh, from uh, acceleration. So then, of course, if it goes, uh, you have to multiply this by the density of particles. <clears throat> but for GRBs, you need uh, 10 to the 51 air per second. Or so. from, the, from, the, from the collapse neutron star. Remnant, yes. Tempo and other men are used to Is Rahim coming? Who? Rahim. Rahim is not coming. He, he will speak, but he's not coming. Not coming? Not coming. He will give an online talk. Oh, no. Uh -huh. I, I thought he's coming. No, because uh, he joined the oh, group. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Yeah.
Radlo, Čau, Mišenky, Radlo, Čau, Gregory, Allora, senti, possiamo verificare per caso se riesci a condividere? Sì, sì, chiaramente. Se riesci a condividere lo schermo? Riesci a... Sì, sì, chiaramente. Riesci a condividere lo schermo così facciamo il test? Ti sentiamo bene? Ti sente tutto? Sì, aspetta, aspetta che non... Aspetta un attimo. Ovviamente non abbiamo collegato questa cosa, un attimo. Ok, vediamo tutto. Pu puoi metterlo eh, schermo, schermo intero questo? Ok, perfetto. Riusciamo a vedere tutto, va benissimo. Ti sentiamo bene, quindi tutto a posto. Eh, aspetta. Eh, quasi micro. No, va bene, que questo non è un problema, poi è eh, importante, importante che sentiamo te. Va bene, grazie, quindi tra 15 minuti penso iniziamo, va bene? Ti avverto. Sì, 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 va bene, grazie. Ok, let's see. Uh, the team is not yet there, but if you have contact with him. Ask him, ask him something else. Do you know? Maybe we try the first one. Some, some of these. We will see about this. Send my send my email.
can find it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Or he can send you. Just a moment. You got it. Let's try with you, just a moment. Uh, because we have coffee break now. Uh, let me see if you can, just a moment. Stop sharing. Can you try to share your screen, I think? Oh, I see, I see. Carlo, can you hear me? It should, it should be. <laughs> see, Carlo, uh, so, uh, se puoi um, um, uh, togliere la condivisione dello schermo un attimo, facciamo la prova con Rahim, va bene? Ok, grazie. Rahim, can you please show your screen? Okay, okay. <laughs> I follow this. Okay, I'm here. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, dear, I think. Yeah, I can hear you, yes. Okay, let me share my presentation. Yeah. Sharing. Now I think you can see. Yeah, I can see. I can see your, I can see your screen clearly. So Okay. okay. Fine, 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 fine. So you will be. We are having the coffee break now. See, I think we'll finish like in 10 minutes. Then we'll be Carlo. Then we'll be you. Then me. Okay, also I'm going okay. to take some coffee.
Ok, Carlo, possiamo condividere lo schermo? Tra qualche minuto iniziamo, va bene? Fai vedere quando è il campo, oppure preferisci no? Ok, va bene. Perfetto. Allora, un minuto solo. So we proceed with the morning session. The uh, group of Professor Rubini, uh, uh, which just started, will be uh, continuing presenting the new results from the gamma ray burst model. And the next speaker is Carlo Luciano Bianco, who is connected from Rome. Uh, Carlo, you have 25 Hi. minutes. Some minutes for questions, so please comment. Okay, can you can you hear me right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. So I'm going to present uh, and uh, some extra details about uh, this point of the cosmological effects that Professor Rufi already briefly mentioned in his talk uh, this morning. Uh, all these uh, all these 
this 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 result, this discussion is in this paper. Who just, it just appeared last page on uh, an archive uh, last Monday, just before the starting of the meeting. So you can find there all the details. So just to put <clears throat> things in a bit of a context, we have that in the old days of the Beppo Sachs era, we were more or less with uh, with this kind of situation for GRB observation. This, uh, this plot is from the original paper of the discovery of the X-ray afterglow by Costa and collaborators on nature, thanks to Beppo Sachs observations. And we had at the time, the prompt emission in gamma rays, which is over here, the afterglow in X-rays down there, and something in between, which was not possible to observe due to instrumental limitations that you have an, a terra incognita in, in soft X-rays, that it, it, it took to almost eight hours after the, the GRB trigger to repoint the, the source with the, the uh, narrow field instruments and observe in, in X-rays. So in principle, everything could happen in, this, uh, in these eight hours. And we're just open to speculations. Then things improved very much. The second breakthrough was thanks to the SWIFT satellite. In this case, the main difference is that Beppo Sachs had to repoint manually the source. After all, there was no idea that the, there was even an afterglow after the gamma burst. Therefore, Beppo Sachs was not designed in order to quickly repoint the GRBs to observe something which no one knows it existed. Instead, the SWIFT was uh, developed exactly to repoint quickly the GRB afterglow and then you know, automatically without any human intervention. Then this is one of the first sources observed by, by Swift in 2005. And in this case, we have still the prompt emission gamma rays. We have a much more rich features after glow in X-rays. You see there are flares, steep decays, plateau phase, shallow and steeper decay. I mean, if you look, at the previous plot, uh, we had observations after eight hours, so something 10 to the four seconds. So more or less we are here. So thanks to the ability to swift to repoint automatically the, the source, we gain knowledge of all this, uh, this phase in the afterglow. However, still there are about 70 to 100 seconds after the GRB trigger, which is a terra incognita because Swift satellite needs some time to repoint the to repoint the source. It takes at least 10, 20 seconds to after the trigger to compute an approximate position of the source and uh, uh, compute if a slewing to the repointing is possible if there is not. Uh, uh, sun in the way, if there is not the, 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 the shadow of the earth and so on. So it takes between 10, 20 seconds to compute the repointing and if it is actually possible to repoint. And then it takes another 20, 50 seconds to actually perform the, the, the moving to repoint the source. So this it's almost possible to go below 50 seconds or so after the trigger. This part is still, uh, is still a uh, terra incognita in X-rays because we don't know, we have the observations in gamma rays, of course, but we don't know what happens in X-rays in this first, uh, in this first phase. And instead, we heard also this morning in the previous talk by Professor Fini and by Professor Weda that there are many, things happening here in this uh, in these very few seconds that have to be investigated to to gain insight about the theoretical model of modelization of this uh, of these sources and so uh, what uh, what is a possible way out to to observe this uh, 
to gain some hint, some clues about this, uh, this first, uh, this first few seconds. We built a, a sample of 354 gamma ray bursts, which is an absolutely unbiased sample in the sense that the only requirement for a GLB to be in the sample is to be in the SWIFT database, so to have been observed basically, to have a measured redshift and to have a measured delay between the trigger and the moment of the SWIFT XRT observation. XRT is the narrow field X-ray instrument which observe all the afterglow in X-rays. Because in some cases, there are also sources which has no XRT observations were not possible to repoint and so on. So uh, any source which has been observed by SWIFT XRT with the measured redshift is in this sample since 2005 up to the end of the last year. And uh, regardless of the kind of source, uh, long, short, uh, high energy, low energy, soft, hard, or I, not, this is not a, a, there are no constraints on all these quantities, just these three criteria makes the, um, the source within this set. So we have this, this sample of basically all GRBs for which this analysis can be performed. And uh, first of all, we can look at their redshift, this, how they distribute in redshift. And uh, it's a bit peculiar, this distribution, because this entire sample has a first peak of how it's distributed. There's a first peak around the redshift, around the z, z equal 1, more or less, between 1.5 and 1.5. But uh, a second distinct sub peak at uh, z around z uh, redshift 2, 2.5, which is not due to the beginning, is really present there. You can, we check it. So we, we can ask how there is this kind of strange double peak distribution. Oh, and here there are the highest redshift GRBs at, the, at redshift equal 8 and equal 9, which is the absolute record, but there are just one at equal 8 and one at the redshift equal 9. Okay, but why this double peak uh, in the sample? We know that, uh, as I said, in this sample, there are all kinds of possible GRB, all, all possible kinds of GRBs, long, short, and so on. However, we know from our media chain model that uh, there are many different families of GRBs. We have this morning about media chain of type one, type two, type three, just speaking about long, then there are the short and so on. So we may try to reclassify this sample just for this analysis into the different families of GRBs uh, and we suggest by the um, EDHN model to see which is the distribution in redshift of each of the family. And the peculiar thing is that, well, almost 50 GRBs could not be uh, analyzed right now, needs uh, a more in-depth analysis to be classified into the different uh, into different subfamilies, then we excluded for the moment. This was just, uh, in this paper, it was just a byproduct of the analysis. This was not the main point, so we didn't not to lose much time on it. We are preparing a new paper with much more detailed analysis of all the sources. For the moment, so we had to exclude 50 sources for the sample, just for this redshift distribution. So, okay, still even cutting away these 50, these 50 sources, there is this double peak structure. And we can see that the BDHN of type one are the one almost responsible for the second peak at redshift equal to. And they have a distribution which resembles more or less closely the star formation rate. Otherwise, the B, on the other hand, BDHN of type two and three, which cannot be further subdivided for the moment, we, we will make this distinction in different paper. And uh, the short, which is the, the green and the, the blue lines, have a much more similar distribution peaking around uh, redshift equal one or less than one. So this 
strong difference between the distribution of the BHN1 and the other kind of BHN. And on the other hand, the similarity, strong similarity between the distribution of the BHN2 and 3 and the distribution in the redshift of the short gamma reversed is a hint pointing to the fact that uh, it is possible, like, like we proposed, that the outcome of BDHN 2 and 3 is a binary system of two neutron star, for example, which later will merge and uh, give it origin to short GRBs. So the outstate, the outcome of BDHN 2 or 3 is uh, the progenitor of short GRBs, at least of a part of short GRBs. This is not a final proof, but still is a strong suggestion that this might be the case. And uh, again, we will, after seeing this, we prepare, we are preparing a new paper on focusing on this distribution, on this analysis of distribution in a much more detailed way. But still, from this quick analysis of the sample, we have this, uh, this clear hint. Okay, this for the redshift distribution of this sample. Let's go back to the entire sample of 354 gamma reversed. We can measure, we can, we can see which is the observed delay before the starting of XRT observations as a function of redshift. As we said before, the delay is about at least 50 seconds or something like that. This for all this is for all the GRBs, the 354 GRBs of the of the sample. The absolute minimum observed delay is this one, is 43 seconds, which is absolute almost a, a world record because if it takes 20 seconds to compute the coordinate of the repointing, it means that it was almost already pointing at the source or something like that. It was a very quick repoint. So still. And this, there are then many other delays, the clustering between around 100 seconds and so on. And all this region here, time after the trigger, is completely uncharted. For uh, we cannot see in X rays, as we said before, 40, 43 seconds. And these red stars are the three examples that we, we, we analyzed in a bit more details of uh, high redshift GRBs and uh, of very high energetic uh, 2201 a However, we have to take into account the fact that this, uh, this time over here, this delay is an observed time. Instead, uh, it means this time is subject to the cosmological time dilation when we, we observe we observe on the Earth, and uh, it is not the actual time delay at the source in the cosmological rest frame, because it, an interval, a time interval observed on the Earth, is very well known that if the redshift is Z. It is one plus Z, the same time interval in the, in the rest frame cosmological of the source. And on the other hand, an interval measured on the Earth is an interval, sorry, in, at the, in the source rest frame is equal to the interval observed on the Earth divided by one plus Z, with Z being the redshift. What does it mean? It means that if we see something, a time interval, uh, lasting uh, 50 seconds, and uh, this source is at redshift 4, it means that uh, what we are seeing, uh, the photons, the emission we are seeing 50 seconds after the trigger, is actually emitted 50 seconds divided by 1 plus z. So if z is 4, it means 10 seconds after the trigger. So this is, in a certain sense, misleading in the sense that this is the observed time delay is not an intrinsic time delay. So if we could take this into account, we can actually see the emission of uh, in X-rays of GRBs much closer to the trigger time if we look to sources which are far away in distance. 
and this is paradoxical in some sense because usually you look to to see uh, you expect to be able to see better a source which is close by than a source which is very far on the other hand in this case you see in sources which are very far you can see and energetic enough to be detected to be observed of course in the source which are far enough you can see something which is not possible to be observed in uh, nearby sources is paradoxical in a certain sense so if we make a histogram of the number of of the GRBs with a certain delay observed which is more or less the same as in this plot but made in the form of an histogram we have all the, the large majority between uh, 50 and uh, 100 or 120 seconds of delay. If we go in the rest frame, the picture is completely different. We can see even below 10 seconds and almost are spread between uh, 20, 30 seconds. So if we make the same plot as before, this was in the, in the observant time delay. This is we know the time delay between XRT in the cosmological rest frame. This is still the value of 43. But if we, this absolute minimum observable time, observable delay, if rescaling with Z, is this, uh, is this one, is this line. And uh, we can see that many sources which uh, in the observed frame uh, had a delay greater than 50, 60 seconds, and so would not have been deemed interesting from the point of view of observing uh, the emission uh, just after the trigger. If we look uh, what is the actual delay in the rest frame, they go much below this, this value, and we can have sources even below 10 seconds for these very high redshift ones and, and so on. So if we go to look uh, something, we, of course, the sources, uh, it's very close redshift. Uh, they cannot go because this uh, effect does not play any role. But if we go at very high redshift, actually, we are seeing something which would not have been possible to observe in uh, nearby sources. We are seeing the emission just a few seconds after the, after the trigger. And so, what does this imply? You, Professor Fini already showed this plot uh, in his talk tomorrow, in, uh, this morning. What I want to emphasize here is that uh, this is the afterglow, the extra emission of GRB 22.11a, plotted the luminosity in uh, rest frame time. So, this is in the chronological rest frame time. And this is okay, the decaying phase of the afterglow. All these, the red line is the time of the first observation by XRT, which is at 14 seconds, not at the, uh, not at the, you see, it was here, so it is around uh, 70 seconds, more or less. Instead, it is at 14 seconds, and all this region, which is the most interesting part to observe, uh, like Professor Fini presented, the, the evolution of between the Jacobi ellipsoid and the McLaurin spheroid, the, uh, the, there is the, the, the period going down uh, while spinning up from 1.09 milliseconds to 1 millisecond in, the, in this racing part. Uh, there is the, the, the transition between the Jacobi and then the McLaurin spheroid before the decaying and so on. All this feature, pulled, which is in the orange uh, band, would not have been possible to be observed if the source were at, at a lower redshift. All this region, all this data, which is, are the very interesting ones from the point of view of this transition between, between the Jacobi and uh, McLaurin uh, regime and uh, the initial associated initial gravitational waves can be observed only thanks to the fact that the source is at the redshift big enough to uh, leave the satellite uh, enough time to repoint the source at the right time. 
Same thing happens also in the, in the, in the case of GRB09 or 423. Again, all this, there is the rising part before the decay, and all this uh, region, all this data, could be observed only thanks, we have the first image at eight seconds in this case, and only this, uh, this, all this region could be observed only thanks to the fact that due to the cosmological effect, the, the satellite is like uh, if it is seeing the, the emission in slow motion in a certain sense. And it's, um, it has the time to detect, to observe even less than 10 seconds after the trigger, while this would have been absolutely impossible if the sources would have been nearby. And so we can observe all this regime, we can observe the, uh, the, the, the rotational period going from 15 milliseconds to 13 milliseconds and so on. Uh, only thanks to the fact that we are go that the source was uh, far enough and uh, to, to be able to repoint in time. And again, this is uh, 09.05.29b, which is the largest redshift, unfortunately, just uh, uh, just uh, photometric redshift. Again, all the raising, the raising part can be observed thanks to the distance and also to the fact that the source is energetic enough to be observed at the distance, of course, otherwise it, we would have missed the source entirely. But uh, this is the point that, uh, so, so it is crucial to observe the sources in high redshift to see how this phenomenon is going. And then we can uh, observe, not in ex we can expect the same kind of phenomenon to happen in sources, even if you don't observe, because the, so the, the light is not repointing. Uh, is, is, uh, cannot repoint in time, we can observe in uh, nearby sources. We can, I mean, know that it happens also in nearby sources and uh, uh, analyze them accordingly. So, to conclude on this, the, the conclusion are mainly, this is the conclusion of the paper, which are mainly, which are mainly threefold. Uh, first, uh, that uh, th there is this fact that uh, Thanks to this uh, high time dilation in energy of the RBs, we can observe uh, this uh, all this phase that otherwise could not be observed in uh, in nearby sources, and we can unveil all this uh, this regime of the uh, of the first uh, uh, new neutron star rise of the first emission of the newly born neutron star, and thanks to this methodology, we can actually see and uh, investigate this, uh, this, uh, this uh, regime in high source redshift, in a high redshift source, sorry. Then uh, uh, there is the fact that uh, this thing can, uh, we can observe uh, also, of course, in uh, nearby sources and uh, the, the, the third point, the important point, is that analyzing the redshift distribution, we end up to the fact that with the HN2 and 3, actually, it is possible that they are, um, that they are the progenitors, that their outcome system are progenitors of short GRBs, and that the gravitation, and we have that gravitational waves associated to the transition between the Jacobi and the McClellan regimes that we can study in uh, far away sources when the gravitational waves could not be observed, but we can observe the electromagnetic emission and study the phenomenon. We can then try to observe the gravitational waves emitted in corresponding sources nearby where we cannot observe electromagnetic emission because they are too quick, there is no time to repoint, but we can observe the gravitational wave emission. And in a certain sense, we can analyze the gravitational wave emission in, in the nearby sources, the electromagnetic emission in the far away sources, and since we know the phenomenon is the same, match the two, the two things in the general description. Of course, this opens a fantastic opportunity for emission such, uh, for example, Theseus, 
with the, not the narrow field X-ray instrument, but the wide field soft X-ray instrument that would be able to observe simultaneously the X-ray and gamma ray emission since the moment uh, of the trigger and without any time delay. Because if the X-ray instrument has a wide field, it does not need to repoint, it can observe just directly. And so this would be an incredible opportunity to observe also in nearby sources this kind of uh, regime of the early X-ray emission and the regime of transition between the Jacobian and Chlorine uh, configurations. And uh, in principle, to, to observe simultaneously also, if they are close enough, the gravitational waves. OK. I think I stop it here. Thanks. Thank you, for, especially for good timing. Thank you. OK, are there any questions? I don't see questions from the audience, kind of, but I'd like to ask a question myself. Yeah. What about the, the gravitational wave signal? What kind of signal do you expect? Do you have any estimations? Oh, so, so, sorry, Gregory, can you speak closer to the microphone? Do you, uh, what, what about the gravitational wave signal? What kind of signal do you expect? Do you have any estimations, uh, waveforms? Oh, yeah, we are, uh, we, we are making some some preliminary estimate, but we are, this is something we are, uh, thanks to this data, we are analyzing. We have some, uh, I mean, some preliminary estimation, but we are, we are studying this problem right now, thanks to this, uh, to this data that we, uh, that we are observing in these sources. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Carlo. Okay, so we proceed to the next speaker. Uh, this is uh, Olga Roeda. Uh, uh, no, sorry, excuse me, Rahim Moradi. And uh, Rahim, can you please get on my Carlo, please stop sharing the screen. This way we get, okay, thank you. Rahim, cannot see you. Yes, yes, a yes. moment. Please activate your webcam. And, okay. Hello, can you see me? Yes, we can see you. Okay. That's it. Oh, I can make this. Okay. I assume now it's fine, everything, yes? Yes. Uh, can you put full screen? Is it fine? Yes. Can I start? Yes, yes, can I start? Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am happy to see many familiar faces, and I'm happy that I have this opportunity to present one of our works that we have done with uh, Professor Rufi, within Professor Rufini's group while working at Ikshanet last year. As you can see, um, my collaboration are um, uh, Jorge Rueda, Rufini, Carlo Bianco, uh, Christian Cherubini, Filippi, uh, Liang Li, Draste Garnia, Sahakian, and Wang Yu. Uh, the title, as you can see, it's a bit um, maybe new because as we know, Crab Nebula and Crab Pursla are very well known. Almost many of the uh, radiative processes and the, uh, in the astrophysics, high energy astrophysics that have been um, established, have been ex uh, extracted from this uh, very good observation of the system. Now we are looking at it in another uh, sense that um, true binary driven hypernova model that had been developed for many years in Professor Finis group, how we can look at this system and uh, is it possible to explain or at least get some feature of this uh, complex system or not? Uh, as a prototype, I start with the observation of GRB 1901-14C. This GRB 
it's very well known in the GRB community. It's mm, mm, kind of one of the, the most important GRBs in this recent year because of many high quality mm, observation, including the HES observation, very good quality TEV observation it has, uh, sub -tab of the observation it had. And uh, due to high resolution of its data, it was a good uh, natural lab for investing the uh, theory of GRB about this uh, uh, specific GRB. I introduced this mod, this GRB um, in the BDHN model. Actually, here I have written BDHN, but it's a BDHN one model. I will explain what it is. I um, will talk about the picture of BDHN, what it is, what is the BDHN in general. Then I will talk about the role of newborn neutron star in this system. Then we model this newborn neutron star through a equilibrium sequ uh, sequence of Maclaurian spheroids, and we uh, and I will go through the characteristic of this uh, evolution uh, and show how it can explain the energetic of this system and how it can be extended the same GRB to the uh, um, Carab Nebula. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, I, I will introduce some problems and some possible solution that um, this picture has uh, but I should emphasize that it's preliminary, preliminary result and for sure there are some parts that still have not been established well. This is the um, GRB, um, let me, so I can, uh, this is GRB 1901-14 C light curve, as you can see it shows a um, a variety of uh, observation in different energy bands, extending from radio bands as at the late time, as you can see, uh, to the um, JEV radiation, to the green magic TEV, radi TEV radiation, to light blue um, from GBM. And as you can see, it shows a very high quality uh, X-ray afterglow, which we mainly focus on this part of data. Why we call this uh, a BDHN? Because we did some time resolve analysis during the prompt radiation, during the um, afterglow, we uh, realized some part of the, the energy, it's highly energetic. It, it shows some thermal component in the prompt radiation. It shows the universal behavior of the X-ray afterglow. Uh, as you can see, uh, it shows also the GEV radiation. So we categorize it as a BDHN type 1, which I will explain a bit later what it is and how it's related to a neutron star and a black hole uh, binary system. Uh, so after all this, we sent uh, GCN and we uh, categorized this GRB as a BDHN of type 1 and we predicted the uh, uh, supernova, which was later successfully, pred uh, this prediction was uh, observed by the, if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't, not yet, it was Nordic Optical Telescope. Uh, 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 I don't remember exactly which one uh, reported the supernova. But uh, uh, and it was based on our prediction that it can be a BDHN type 1, which is related to the supernova, which indeed was observed in that location. And as you can see, uh, for the supernova the, of this GRB follows the that like of standard, like of the, like, um, the average uh, luminosity of supernova cor correlated to the uh, the GRB and it lies within the BDHN1. So overall, we categorize this as a BDHN1 model. And what is BDHN? I think during the meeting, I've been in contact with this uh, word uh, many times. I go through it a bit 
not comprehensively, just uh, to catch the picture. The story is that we have um, a carbon oxygen core and uh, the presence of a binary neutron star. Then uh, that core undergoes a supernova explosion. This supernova explosion has two accretion procedure, one on the companion neutron star, one on the newborn neutron star at the center of the explosion. When the system is, uh, the period is uh, low enough, the hypercritical accretion on the companion goes to the black hole and we will end up with the system of uh, the supernova, the newborn neutron star, and the companion uh, neutron star, which has undergone the black hole radiation, black hole formation. Th these are the simulation of this model that you can find in series of paper by Becerra et al, Guedal, Ruffini, and other collaborator. Uh, to go through a bit uh, black hole, the black hole, uh, what we call inner energy. So this, uh, the radiation mechanism in this system happens in two parallel uh, picture, one from the black hole activity and one from the new neutron star activities. And the black hole activity, we don't uh, want to go through it here, but a, a very briefly, I will introduce it that we have a newborn black hole and some magnetic field uh, from the, um, the accreting matter and from the neutron star. So it goes to um, I like a black hole within a um, magnetic field. And we explain by wall solution and some uh, material around, some plasma around. And uh, in some certain case, it can explain it can explain the MEV and GEV radiation of GRBs uh, of this kind of GRBs MEV through the um, uh, producing many uh, shells expanding shell that at transparency point they produce an MEV radiation and some accelerating. I think Jorge talked about this. Uh, some accelerating particle and uh, that explain the gel radiation. But the main part to start from here, the spinning new neutron star. As I said, as you can see, the center of the um, simulation, there is a new neutron star, which there is a fallback accretion from the uh, supernova eject on it. And this simulation has been done by uh, Becher, Laura Beshera and uh, in Los Alamos. They, they have done the um, simulation that shows that uh, while we have this fallback accretion to neutron star, I call it new, newborn neutron star or new neutron star for simplicity. Sometimes we show it in new, but uh, during this uh, presentation, I call it new neutron star. Uh, it has, uh, when it has uh, accretion on it, the, so it spins up. And as you can see, it spins sometimes go to one millisecond, depends on the binary orbit, binary uh, orbital period. Uh, and this, this can give this hint first sight that um, uh, when we have one millisecond, uh, rotating neutron star, it can has it can have the, uh, oblateness and uh, we should uh, um, implement some effect of eccentricity in explaining the energetic of this uh, system. Uh, here I don't enter uh, what uh, this how this neutron star uh, how this new neutron star will uh, explain the X-ray afterglow. But uh, I will present uh, the uh, set of formula that shows the rotational and binding energy changing in the rotational and binding energy of this system is enough to explain the X-ray afterglow uh, and naturally X-ray optical and um, radio afterglow. 
And the, the, the whole idea is that um, in this model, which is different from the traditional model, is that the magnetic field of newborn neutron star can still exist in the expanding uh, material of the supernova. Uh, and this value is around like 10 to 4, 10 to 5 goes and 10 to, at 10 to 12, 10 to 13 centimeter. And the, by a, a synchrotron radiation there, it can produce uh, this afterglow. And also with some multipolar radiation, which I don't go through, uh, uh, but you can find in set of, in series of paper of Vinetal 2018 to Rueda 2022. Uh, this uh, has been shown that uh, super, new neutron star is powering the after glow emission. Uh, the point is that when we extrapolate um, this power law to like 1000 year, we can get uh, the same luminosity that Crab Nebula is representing. And uh, when we extrapolate back to uh, early time, it can catch the prompt radiation that can be a hint that this simulation of increasing the uh, rotation of the uh, rotation of the new neutron star by fallback accretion it can be due to the this uh, can be explained by this energy of the rotation and uh, uh, well, binding energy but as you can see the first site uh, the first um, uh, in the right top big uh, plot, you can see that extrapolation going to like 1,000 years coincide with the one of observed crab nebula, but um, uh, it suggests that also maybe the in the crab nebula, the part of X-ray can be explained by the neutron star activity, and maybe also there are some black hole activity in that uh, region which still need to be uh, clarified this. Also, there are some other points uh, that need to be clarified, like the uh, kinetic energy of ejecta, um, usually for the crab nebula is lower, it's around 10 to 49, in this case, it's around 10 to 51. So, it, it, the, which I, at the end, I will explain some possible solution for, for this. So, uh, talking about the energy, energy of the rotational energy and bind, changing the rotation and binding energy of the system. Uh, uh, we, we don't, uh, here we don't explain what is the mechanism behind this radiation. We only want to show that the energy of new neutron star rotation and binding energy is enough to explain the observed uh, inter time in integrated luminosity of afterglow extending from radio to X ray. Radio to X ray. But um, the point is that the, the, this working hypothesis needs to be checked and to see how this uh, system coincides with the uh, GRB 1901-14C. So we, we assume that energy of the... I cannot see my screen. <laughs> I don't know what happened. You can see it perfectly. No, I, I cannot see it. I don't know what happened. Ah, okay. okay, so first, a uh, very simple calculation. We request that uh, by extrapolating this uh, X ray to 1000 years, the period should be around 33 milliseconds, the one of observed uh, of the crab. Uh, of the crab. Uh, but uh, when we write down some equation and demanding that. Uh, the luminosity follow this uh, power law, the energy integrating of the luminosity, and the energy should be the one of rotational energy. 
Finally, we end up with some weird uh, number that mass should be one solar mass, which is not the case. Um, and the initial spin of new neutron star should be around 0 0.3 uh, milliseconds, which is uh, under the stability limit inferred from the neutron star, which is around 0 0.7. So uh, for sure, this picture doesn't solve and from the, the first impression, we need to take into account the eccentricity of the system. And this is the place that also Carlo mentioned that the effect of um, the effect of um, um, this uh, gravitational wave also due the, the, in the early phase. Uh, I will explain a bit later. In the early phase, due, uh, since we uh, we have rotation and changing the shape of the system, this change of the shape of system will change the gravitational binding energy, and this uh, gravitational binding energy change at some point can uh, introduce some gravitational wave, which is not from the binary system. It's from the change of the shape of highly rotating a neutron star, which is, uh, I, I don't remember the number, I think it's like one order of magnitude less than the current um, sensitivity of current uh, detectors. So it needs the uh, future detectors to detect this. I, I will show some numbers later. So the idea is that we have oblatness, we have this eccentricity. Uh, we write down the total energy is the one of rotational energy and uh, binding energy. Uh, the, um, the change of uh, angular momentum and the change of energy are related with this uh, last equation. And this, is, uh, this looks very si simple equation, but there are uh, many debates about this very simple one. But also, in some of our work, this shows that when we have synchrotron radiation from a system, the way of changing energy at angular momentum should be like this. And also, the, uh, still, uh, for me, it's not clear why, it's, uh, why it should be like. Also, some argument of Wheeler and other uh, um, people that when we consider this kind of formula, it's like that we consider uh, we bypass the um, radiation mechanism, but it's like that we consider it is from like synchrotron radiation. Uh, but this still needs to be more clarified this why it is like this, this formula. And finally, we write down e, e dot must be the one of observed from the afterglow, which is, um, which is uh, the power law. And uh, Finally, combine all this uh, sequence of Maclaurian spheroids, we have this uh, analytic solution from the system to avoid some numerical, uh, you know, theoretical people also always are uh, interested in analytic solutions. So this is analytic solution for the change of eccentricity, for the change of angular momentum, for the change of breaking in this, as, as you can see. Uh, it reaches uh, like 33 milliseconds at around uh, 937 years at eccentricity starts around 0 0.81 because we don't want to enter the at one second uh, eccentricity 0 0.81 with the uh, initial uh, 0 0.7 millisecond and as you can see in this, after this um, bifurcation point, bifurcation, I mean, in the, from the transition from Jacobi elixir to Maclaurian spheroid, uh, after 0 0.8, you can see the majority of the energy um, that is participating in the uh, producing the, providing the energy reservoir for the system is the rotational energy. But before this, the, that is the part that, that that is the part that goes to gravitational wave, with, which I, I show. But the, as you can see, it can explain by some extrapolation the whole system. 
But uh, there are some points uh, that uh, we know that the kinetic energy of crab is around 310 to 49, but usually in the supernova related to GRV is 10 to 49. Uh, maybe some possible solution of this is that from the observation of GRB, the early phase before going to the free expansion and set of phase, uh, the, there are some, from the observation of thermal component, the early phase, the beta V over C is 0 0.94. Uh, it needs still to be checked. This, uh, but the, the, this thermal evolution has been already checked and uh, it is a mm, observational fact that uh, V over C in that region is around 0 0.94 and gamma around 3. Uh, when we compare it with the 0 0.1 C of expanding um, velocity, it shows that considering this fact that in the early phase we can have like 0 0.9 uh, of uh, C, the velocity, it can increase the kinetic energy 100 times. Maybe this can explain the missing kinetic energy of the crab uh, to consider it like a supernova that is similar to the case of GRVs. And another problem is that the breaking index when we consider for crab pulsar from the observation and in this case from the analytic solution that we have. Uh, the, the breaking index for observational um, pulse size, um, uh, crap pulse size 2.5, but for this neon neutron size around 6.4, as you can see in this panel uh, right down. So it goes down from like 8 to 6.4. But what causes this uh, speed, what causes this different in the Breaking this is not still very clear. It's like it can be some glitches effect that can reduce this number or temporary change the uh, power law behavior because this is uh, very sensitive to the power law index. Exactly, this six point five four comes from the power law index that the big change in that power law index if it's from the glitches. It can it can modify the number, but still all, uh, still uh, we are working on this also, and the uh, early part of the uh, this uh, simulation this uh, analytic uh, solution for the unitron star in this system can be when when we have a sudden release of energy from. Uh, this eccentricity 0.0.8, uh, I mean, from the uh, transition from Jacobi to, to Maclorian into Maclorian spheroid, it can produce um, uh, the, the, the gravitational wave signal, which is strain is, uh, I think, one order of magnitude, or one or two is less than the current sensitivity of the system. Uh, but, but uh, still, uh, there are some proposals, I think, from the new generation of the gravitational wave, which this uh, sensitivity can lie inside the sensitivity of the, this number can lie inside the sensitivity of the future gravitational wave detection. So in this model gravitational wave is not from the binary system, it's from the eccentricity point that happens in the early phase. And why the thing that Carlo said is important in this case is that this happens around one second, two seconds in the early phase of GRB. And in order to see in the X-ray, uh, we need to have observation which have been which had been developed some of the observation, but for the current one, for the, the XRT, still we can rely on the one uh, that has um, high redshift. That the ones that have high redshift and can uh, we can uh, detect the early behavior and check that to see if uh, this extrapolation really works or no. Which for the uh, 
for now for this GRB that we have found in the high red shift, this extrapolation exactly fits our prediction. So it showed that um, observation of early part of GRBs in the X-ray is of great importance that can um, implement some limits on the GRB models. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rasim, for uh, a good timing also. Uh, we have some space for questions. Uh, from Can you please come here from this way? Uh, thanks for the nice side time. Uh, if I understood correctly, uh, your uh, uh, analysis and model predicts the uh, GRB in the craft the 1,000 years ago. Did I understand correctly? Yes, something like this, yes. It, it's, it's like an ambitious thing because, you know, crab is, as I told from the beginning, it's very well-known system, many observations. So we are looking, looking at it in a different way uh, and maybe we can modify some part of the picture of the crab in the community. Yeah, that's uh, true. But my question is, uh, there are some research that uh, you can find easily the references in the Wikipedia of GRBs that telling that if a GRB happens in our galaxy, it can affect the living life on the Earth. And Crab Nebula is very close to us. Actually, it's not only in our galaxy, but it is in our uh, vicinity. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So, do we think that? that we are living now, we are here, can it falsify your model or analysis or not? Uh, that, I, it's very hard to explain this uh, exactly, you know, because when we have this GRB, it's like collimated radiation is not isotropic. So I don't know if it is uh, toward Earth or in other direction that that has lots of discussion to do. I, this is a good question. I have not thought about it deeply, but I can see there are some ways to explain this. But the, the, there should be some effect of this GRB. If it is true, there should be some effect of this GRB around the uh, crap system to, to check it. We are searching this. But in this case, mm, I, I don't have any clear answer maybe the collimation on it i don't know maybe it's not GRB was not toward us it's a highly collimated jet in another direction you can see that after you can move out this way can you say that the gamma ray there's a bit of wow uh, sorry i cannot hear well yes uh, uh yeah. now we, we have the continuation of the question so if uh, we talk about the afterglow apparently the afterglow should be uh, as a dropping. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, please you. Here you go. See how it's hard on the thing. If you follow the afterglow of the giant, the afterglow is very good at all. The problem is when some of the years we can do the limit of the scale to the I cannot hear well. You can see what you have a little bit. And, uh, for example, if we take one example of Japanese 13 or 427 8, we have the afterglow emission, the X ray. And afterglow is usually a power up. So we can extend this power up in one solid year of current day. Then you can compare the luminosity of the crop nebula with the extrapolated value of one solid year. They are very similar. This is the uh, one point. The second point is if we assume it is the first of the pulsar, it spins at the one millisecond, that it releases the energy by losing its rotational energy. Also, at the one thousand year, we have the spin period that is exactly the same as the, the crop nebula pulsar. So, to one or two milliseconds is very not So, these two points coincide with the observation. 
And, and this power law behavior is something universal for this kind of BDHN type one. We have collected all the available afterglow and it follows this kind of universal with, with this GRB 9114C as a prototype is like a, a mini, like average value of the, in the peak of Gaussian distribution of this system. So it's like a universal polar for all the system. It follows. It's not like the short GRBs to drop immediately. They, they show a long lasting power law. Okay, Rahim, thank you very much for your answers. I think we should proceed with the program. Therefore, uh, we thank you again. Okay. So our next speaker will be uh, on you, it's here. Okay, you can take this and I'll put your uh, presentation. Uh, let's see if we try, but we have too many cables here. I am afraid. Let's see. So I was planning to talk about the neutron stars, the new noble neutron stars. But then I found uh, for the previous talks, uh, we, there was no one focusing on the machine learning, which is a trend in astrophysics. So I changed my topic to machine learning. So our institute is pushing on this direction. So this work, let me turn the light. So I have done uh, this work with the collaboration with Fatman and Rahim Muradi. So I will give two examples. The first example is to uh, use a deep uh, neural network to test uh, the unification model of AGN. And the second, uh, to adopt a very simple but specified uh, network to measure in the redshift uh, in comparison with chat GPT, fine tuning the chat GPT. Uh, so from industrial field, uh, there are two major applications of machine learning. One is the image, the second is the voice recognition. So this picture I did yesterday, which was painted by the middle junior, it's uh, an AI. So we can see that the Dovich is having a meeting in front of the Mount Ararat. And the second is a voice spectra. So the machine will understand and output a, a sentence written by Armenian language. I cannot read, sorry. So for the astronomical data, we have very similar forms. But for the image, it's the data of, of which the coordinate is a space. And for the voice, it's the coordinate of the time. So it's a time series. When we look at the sky, we have images of the stars, galaxies. We have the structure of the largest structure of the universe. They are the data of the space. And for the exploration of the stars, we have the light curve. Also for the simulation, we have each step of how our universe is evolving. These are similar to the voice recognition. So we can simply adopt the network developed by those industrial fields to our region, because they spend uh, billions of dollars every year on developing the neural network. We can simply take them, do some simple modification for our purpose, and use our data to train the network and to give us very good output. So in my opinion, the application of the machine learning on the astrophysics has three levels. The first level is machine can do the work that humans can do, but maybe better. The second level is machine can do the work that human cannot do. And the third level is machine can do the work 
then tell human how it does the work. So this kind of work, in my uh, feeling, is uh, close to the third level. It's between the second and the third level. So if I can manage it well, it may be reach the boundary, the edge of the third level. Because the current machine learning work, usually we are using the, the neural network to do the classification, to infer the parameters from the observation, uh, to uh, enlarge the resolution of the simulation. They are always on the third level because they are doing the work that humans can do, but it does better. So I more like to apply it for physicists, but for physics it's too difficult for a machine at the current stage. Also because it, it's a black box, it has millions of parameters, we can hardly understand it. But using humans' uh, experience, we can use it as a tool to help us to judge some models. And this is one example. And this example can be extended to other areas using the same method. We know the AGN unification model. It says all classes of AGN are a single type of the physical object observed from different uh, orientation angles. So in the center of the AGN, it has a torus, and also it has a borderline region. Which, and on outside, some far away from the torus, we have a region emitting the narrow lines. So if we observe from here, close to the polar direction, we will have the type one galaxies, because we can observe both the uh, narrow line region and the borderline region. But if we observe from the equatorial plane here, the torus blocks the emissions from the broad, borderline region, so we will only have the emission from the, the narrow line region here that you can see here. And as this is the spectra of the AGN. So it's very clear here you, we have a composition, two compositions, the narrow, the narrow part and the broader part. And here we can only have the narrow part, the narrow lines. This spectra has five components. First is the AGN continuum, it's the emission directed from the center of the AGN. And uh, for sure it is angle dependent because it, it's a cosine theta. If we, we by an angle, we uh, receive the flux multiplied by a cosine theta effect. And also we have the emission from the host galaxy. And the host galaxy is not angle dependent from the unification model, because it says no matter what type of the AGNs they are from, a same physical uh, object. Then the borderline region, surely it is angle dependent. Uh, we talked about if you observe from a small angle, the torus blocks for the type two agents. And for narrow line region, narrow line emission, it is not angle dependent, but both the type one and the type two, they can observe it. And for the island lines, it is unsure because we don't know the location of it. So possibly it is angle dependent. So the idea is the viewing angle induce different observational class. Physically, they are the same. So if we filtering all the angle dependent component from the spectra, can the machine still distinguish the type one and the type two agents? So if it can, which means angle is not the only factor and we need to revisit the unification model. If no, the unification model of agents stands steadily. So for doing this work, we constructed a, uh, a network of two parts. First is a CN-like network to have a higher accuracy. And the second one is a tension-like network where we want to understand the physical insight to find the correlations between different emission lines uh, different frequencies. We use the SS, SDS data of the sifted galaxies. Our sample has 1,394 type 1 and type 2 galaxies, respectively. The reason is uh, the data is good, that we have a big amount, simply. 
And uh, we purposely select uh, uh, those samples. They form a very similar distributions in the sense of the flux so to avoid some bias. So this is the net example of the network of the attention. This is a very famous paper, Attention is All You Need, published uh, in 2017. And until now, it has reached more than 70,000 citations. And this, the network it proposed in this paper called Transformer. On the left side, it's an encoder. It encodes the spectra to a vector. And the right side is a dis uh, decoder, so it decodes the vector to the answer. For the large language model like ChatGPT, it uses the right side. So this is the basis of a lot of the current large language model. So they, they, the ChatGPT uses the right side. Our paper will use the left side and even a simplified version of the left side because it has too many parameters. We don't want to have the overfitting problem. And the simple ones can tell us physics more clear. So first we input uh, all the spectra to the machine. So for sure machine can do this, can distinguish, and it does well. So for the type one and type two, it reaches uh, accuracy of 96.8%, so it's similar to a human being. This plot shows the x-axis is epoch. Epoch means how many times you show the data to the machine, your re machine repeatedly look at data and to learn from the data. So it's about after 20 times the machine reaches and uh, saturated on its accuracy. So this is not surprising at all. Then we start to filter the lines. So we filter the border lines from the borderline region. We select the widths. Uh, the same with this for all the spectra. So it overkills the borderline region to make our net, to make our conclusion safe. So here we have the, an example of the widths. So these are the emission lines, the broader emission lines. We filled all of them. So then the machine only can observe the rest yellow part. And this is surprising. After some trainings, the machine can still distinguish type one and type two galaxies so with the accuracy 92% for type one and 84% for type two average 88% for all the type one, type two galaxies. Then we push the experiment further. We, want, we know the continual emission from AGM may affect our, the, net, uh, the AI's decision this continued power law uh, appears on all the spectra, so for sure we cannot field all the spectra. So we did it in a different way. We inject uh, some random spectra, random power laws to the data. Here I show we inject five uh, power laws. Actually, I tested the 10, 20, there's no big difference. So in this way, we distort the original power law from the AGN continuum. And uh, we have as a result 89.5% of accuracy. There's almost a no change, which means the continual emission of the AGN doesn't affect uh, the distinguishment of the types of different AGN at all. So then we push even further, we feel to all the broader lines and the narrow lines also, though it is not necessary, but let's do it. So we feel to this one, if we see the accuracy, so till 87.5%, almost no change again. So the machine, it doesn't need the, those big emission lines, permit lines, forbidden lines to distinguish the types of AGN. Then is the test for the iron lines. The iron lines has a lot of emissions at different uh, frequencies, but mainly uh, are below 5,600A. So simply, we cut all the spectra less than 5,600A. This time, the accuracy decreases to 
But I, in my opinion, I don't think this is due to ion line, but it's made due to how much the data we show to the computer. But by this method, we cut almost half of the data. So when we provide less information to the machine, for sure it gives us a, a lower accuracy, but still 8% is a good value. So now we can make uh, the conclusion. So does the angle is the only factor for the unification model of AGN? It seems not, because after filtering all the angle dependent factors, uh, emission lines, continuum, and the angle line, still the machine can give us 80% of accuracy. And what's left after filtering, filtering all of this is the emission from the galaxy. So we suspect uh, different types of, of AGN have the correlations with the host galaxy. But for the physical interpretations we are working on, it, but the machine at least gives us the indication. So this is our first example. So second one, it's a very, example, very simple example, measuring the redshift of quasars by a dedicated network versus the chat GPT. We have the, again, the data sample from the SDSS. It has a lot of observations, even not from simulation, but real observation. So here are the sample, a lot of samples. Then we input the data, again, is a spectra, and the output is a redshift. And then we take those redshift uh, which were visually inspected by a human being. It's a, we consider it's a, the ground truth. So the machine, this is a simple network, it's a residual network. And the network is a little different from those ones using in the industrial field because we know from physics how to infer the redshift. First, we need to look for the global shifter of the whole spectra, the, so the global pattern. For global pattern, we design a bigger, the, our, uh, the pixels, it's like uh, the spectra is like a one dimensional image. For our example, it's about uh, 4,000 pixels. So first we design, design a kernel to convolute, it's the same as mathematical convolution. A kernel of 200 pixels to convolute the spectras segment by segment to look for the global pattern of the shift. Now also we know on emission lines we can infer the red shift. It's, this is a human way. So then we design a small kernel to do the convolution on 15 pixels. But also we expect uh, there are some given features at a different red shift. So we don't want to missing, miss the information, so we design a 200 pixels kernel to do the convolution. Because in the industrial field, usually they prefer very small kernels. But for physics, we should change a little. So by doing this, we have the result. This is the histogram of the accuracy. And our accuracy is defined by this function. It's the velocity of light multiplied by the redshift from our prediction of the net minus the visual expected redshift, then divided by one plus z also. So this is something similar to the relative error multiplied by the velocity of z. So we can see almost, uh, here is on the right corner, up corner, it's the zoom in of the center part of the big figure. So we can see most of them, most of the samples are located uh, within like 600 uh, meter per, uh, per second. So it's about 2% of the relative error. And we compare our result with uh, this quasar net is like a standard uh, net adopted from the SDSS data. So let's say it's an official network. So our net performs very similar but we did better, especially for some, okay, we checked later why they have a lot of deviation from the real redshift. Those 
spectra have very small signal to noise ratio and the sound spectra they cannot see the emission line. And as the official one looks for the emission line then to infer redshift instead uh, we designed a three different uh, convolutional kernel to find the, also the, the global pattern. So even for the spectrum with a low signal to noise ratio, we can infer the redshift. And this is another way to show how the accuracy, how they compare the accuracy, which means we have accuracy almost, almost reached the 90, more than 98% for most of the, the spectrum. And this is other examples so we have the signal noise ratio here, 2.5. And this inferred, this is a real redshift, and this is what we inferred a very small difference. And also for this one, you can hardly define the emission line, but the machine does well. It predicts almost almost the same redshift. So then, can ChatGPT do this work? Because this is by a very very simple net. So first, I want to say how ChatGPT was trained. So it's a large language model. Usually it has three or two steps. The first is the pre-training. You know, ChatGPT, PT means pre-training. Then we do the fine tuning. Pre-training is a procedure that the model learns to predict the next word in a sentence based on the words that came before it. It is achieved by training the model on the collected large data set. The data typically consists of diverse range of sources, including books, also the archive papers, all archive papers, and all the codes on the GitHub. So the goal is to create a representative sample of human language that can be used to teach the model grammar, facts, and reasoning abilities. So it's like to in my opinion, to teach the, to give knowledge to the model and to teach the model logic. Then we need to do the fine tuning. Fine tuning is to teach the model how to respond by a given form of question. So after the pre-training, the model needs to fine tune to perform specific tasks like answering questions or generating text. To do this, a small, more specific database data set is created, usually by gathering examples of the desired behavior. So, the, we do this also following this way, and this is the, the step. So first, uh, we need to crack the sentence to different, to a lot of tokens. So usually we have a sentence, a sentence is made of many words, and a word it has, it sounds like you have W, you have TH, so each of these corresponds to a value. So a sentence corresponds to a vector. So we input this, so the vector is input to the network, then the network does the mathematical computation and gives output. So first is to, and for the spectra it's similar, we need to, at a given wavelength we have a value, so it's like a token in a language, so a spectrum is like a sentence. Then second, uh, we need to uh, upload using the API provided by OpenAI, this is a country, uh, this is a company which created the uh, ChatGPT to fine tune the GPT 3.5 model by the astronomical data. This is different than, than normally we use the GPT, we ask a question, the GPT answers the question. Fine tuning, can modify the parameters of the ChatGPT model by our data. Hmm. Then, unfortunately, it cannot do the work. <laughs> unfortunately, I even don't want to show the example because all the output of the redshift are random, totally random. Then why? We know ChatGPT is not good at mathematics, but some simple one it can be, but not for the scientific uh, computation. It has a lot of reasons. For my understanding, I think it's the problem of the natural language versus the mathematical language, but I list here, if you are interested, you can read a little. 
because I don't have enough time. Yeah. And also, and uh, these are the defects of asking the ChatGPT to, to do the mathematics. So I listed many reasons. The main reason, in my opinion, is the natural language is not a complete set for describing the mathematics. But there are many alternative ways people are developing. First is to make a better token. So we know number is infinite, but language is limited. We only have a given number of words. So how to solve the problem of infinite and limited? And the second way is machine language model is a language model. But we can ask it to use tools like human being. Language model has logic like our brain. But for human being, we are not so powerful. But we can invent the tools to change our nature. And the machine can do this as well. The machine can do the programming. And it again use the tools. For example, now OpenAI has a function for many companies to create the plugin. So this ChatGPT uses the plugin so as one more hand to touch some programs created by other websites. For example, it can use Mathematica, the software that we are using every day from the uh, WordPress company. This is the plugin. And uh, two weeks ago, I saw a paper, but, but those plugins are made by humans. So humans provide the tool to ChatGPT. But two weeks ago, I saw a paper that the ChatGPT can create the tool by itself, though it's a simple tool. So in this sense, it designs the tool by itself, by its intention. So what it wants to do, if it, is not, if it cannot do it well by its capacity, it creates a tool, then it does it well. I think this is the future. For example, this, uh, for inferring the redshift, uh, we designed a simple network. ChatGPT can do this as well. It writes a lot of archival paper. It knows what's the importance for designing this network, and it can do the programming better than the human being. So it creates this that network, it runs it, and it gives us the output much more correct than directly using its language ability. So in my opinion, this will be the future. Okay, then my last slide is, I checked the number of the papers on archive. I searched the machine learning, the keyword, in the catalog of archive, physics catalog. Then we see the numbers of every year. It grows following a power law, and the power law index is 6.85. So in two or three years, it will reach like 10,000 papers every year. I think this will be one major area of astronomy. Okay, thanks. Different what? Different? Different form. So form. usually you have seven uh, data. Uh, you divide it into training training parts uh, and then test. Uh, test it. Uh, but uh, there are many different ways of doing it. Uh, so uh, to avoid uh, the biasing uh, or uh, overfitting and so on, uh, you can uh, use uh, uh, different photos. Uh, yeah, yeah, different photos, yes. Yeah. Uh, we didn't uh, use different photos because we have enough data. No, I didn't mean you have enough data. Yeah, you mean you have higher accuracy, yes. Yeah, so you, yeah. you just need to generalize it using uh, uh, examples uh. or I mean, different types of photos. Uh. Because in, in this business of uh, machine learning, the hard part is the training part. It can be biased, uh. it can be advancing, uh. Uh, so that it's uh, really difficult to know to what extent 
understand. The one way to understand yourself as a disabled is mm -hmm. to use many different types of ways to divide yourself. To understand. Test. Actually, we tested, we divide to four folders. And then we do this to find out which, which folder gives the best accuracy like this. The accuracy is very similar. I think within 0.5% difference. Uh, so in the final result, we didn't do this. So it's, it's simple. <laughs> it's simpler. Okay, okay, I see. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with this. So you think it lacks the education, but we, as a human, we have learned a lot of different knowledges. Yeah, a chat GPT. I, but for data, I think just GPT, because our data is very similar to other data. But here, we only test the mathematical abilities. Yeah. 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 Uh. Yes, I agree with your point, but also I do, but I think till now no one understands it totally. So I did some, did some test to check if it can understand something that people never taught, taught to it. For example, I asked to uh, the maze, is it the English name maze, to make some maze. Or oh, not maze, how to call like to, uh, make a story of something, but without telling the answer, to separate a fake story, not fake story, to describe something by some words, but some words, but without telling what it exactly it is. And it does the work very good. Uh, what I'm saying, uh, if we talk this language, and there's no other language than it. Uh, Am I right? Yeah, you're right. I agree. <laughs> and if you go to a, a conversation of a collection of chemists, we won't be able to understand that. Okay, so, so you... The, every circle has its own uh, type of expert who is uh, mm. uh, dialogue, uh, jargon, whatever you, you name it. But you know it reads all the papers on archive so it can understand the physical the physical language. Not yeah. to the extent that uh, yeah, not to extend to that one maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have one for you. Uh, about the very first problem. Uh, when you were talking about uh, training and uh, then uh, making filtering of the features uh, that uh, connect in our you know, Okay, I, I, okay, I will think about it, then, we'll, then I'll tell you. Yeah.
Uh, about the dinner, about dinner, we will have a buffet of the dinner. So maybe you can keep your some space of your stomach for the lunch. <laughs> So you mean we? Uh, but we need to be more expert also on on this thing. Uh, this is precisely because so models anyway will take into days from data. Huh? Yeah, because you train on the real data. Oh, real it, it anyway will take that information out from yes, data. Exactly. It anyway will affect on model your. It will suspect uh, that change. I think I understand the very well. Yeah, I don't think yeah, I understand. Okay. <laughs> But it is most devoted mostly for past radio bird search. Uh, it is at a rate that uh, 110 kilohertz, uh, me megahertz. But this, far, this fine time resolution is about uh, now special mode uh, 12 milliseconds uh, uh, time dispensation. Well, uh, and last one, the uh, um, gamma ray uh, branch, we use public publicly available data from Integral. It's called neo-available time data, which distributed uh, practically online at the receiving of ground stations. And, uh, and publicly available GRB, uh, GBM data uh, from Fermi uh, Observatory. Uh, and of course, we are preparing for two experiments, uh, for space-borne experiments, both for uh, gamma ray burst, uh, gamma transient uh, observation, uh, and the one of the experiment is for polar polarimetry. Looks like a polar uh, experiment uh, operated uh, last, not last two years ago, in the Chinese uh, uh, orbital station. It look like, but different for high energy uh, polarization measurement. Next one. Um, some interest result obtained with our network within the last uh, several years. So see for this figure, this is the second uh, uh, detection. So it's gamma ray detection uh, with the uh, ACS uh, mm, detector in integral uh, and the second binary neutron star merging detected by Lai de Kagra. It's uh, the name of 19 or 425, mm, and just compare uh, ACS registration. This is the registration of ACS famous 170817 event, and this is registration of 19425. Significance, uh, the overall significance of registration, this event more than this one. 
Unfortunately, GPM was occulted by uh, Earth, so it, it could not detect this uh, uh, um, short gamma ray burst. Next, very fast, we discovered at least four or five uh, supernova with uh, uh, um, this photometric signature, and this one, this one here, and uh, uh, for two of them, uh, detected redshift using a six meter telescope and rush and scorpion to uh, detector uh, multi opposite detector of, this special, of special strategical observatory. Um, some of the, our uh, photometric uh, signatures of supernova was controlled by different uh, telescopes, GPC uh, and the uh, LDA in the United States. Um, well, some results. It's our uh, uh, observation plus the modeling uh, by stellar code uh, developed by Sergei Brinnikov group and uh, this is a, a optimal parameter for the supernova associated with this burst. Next one, the under stellar modeling now. It's difficult to model but we need additional injection of energy to, 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 to describe this long tail. So, but it's our observation of uh, supernova of uh, burst. Uh, this is the reconstruction of a very famous, uh, very bright burst which discussed yesterday and today. Uh, a reconstruction of PACS data uh, and uh, our lower limit. Unfortunately, we could not reconstruct fast variability uh, due to the software that time and different kind of that time. But we reconstruct especially blue curve uh, reasonable um, data and uh, estimated low limit of the either uh, more than in, in the energy range more than 100 keV and up from 100 keV to 10 MeV. Um, next one uh, is the overall uh, data of uh, our optical and radio observation of this burst, the same brightest burst of last year. Um, and uh, what else? Um, uh, you see, you see here. This is a photometric signature and three uh, filters, uh, optical filter, optical and infrared filters. So this is R, this is J, and K. Uh, it's clearly visible uh, uh, enhancement and uh, preparing the paper and the well, second paper about the burst and uh, we model and just to up obtain optimal parameter. We have no spectroscopic observation of this time, so we did not confirm it, but James Webb telescope confirmed the presence of the supernova, late supernova in this uh, data. Um, next one, it might be interesting, different two distribution of supernova because a lot of supernova discussed yesterday. Um, in, in special lecture, uh, 25 years of GRD supernova. So now we have uh, about 50 in our uh, pocket, uh, about 50 uh, supernova associated with gamma ray burst and we have a so-called gold um, list of our supernova. And let's look for the figure, the right figure, initial underlying figure uh, taken then uh, taken from uh, the paper of the PF team uh, uh, which um, team so this is uh, peak uh, this is absolute magnitude uh, in J filter um, and uh, this is a so-called uh, time about half maximum or we can say the full peak uh, full with half maximum and uh, this is a different type of supernova, this color supernova, and very in and for us interesting that uh, what this blue diamond is a supernova type 1C. And our GRD uh, supernova related with gamma ray burst, uh, which we put on this diagram, is dark, dark dots. Uh, it is easily see that there is no special group of, of supernova related to uh, uh, they are just a little more luminous. Thank you, thank you. 
and the second one, uh, our supernova, I mean uh, supernova associated with gamma ray burst is not fast optical or fast blue uh, object uh, obtained by, uh, defined by CPFT. And one more interesting diagram, uh, this is a time of maximum uh, in light burst of supernova associated with gamma ray burst. And this is a detail, uh, uh, absolute magnitude in weak filter, which is close to the filter. Uh, it's wider, but uh, uh, mean value, uh, mean level is the same, uh, perfect is the same. So you see um, uh, some prominent uh, uh, GRB and supernova associated with GRB, a lot of, uh, overall is about 52 uh, uh, points, and uh, this is light. Uh, late supernova from super luminous burst uh, last year. In general, this is not very interesting. So the, it, it is interesting because it's close to us and, and it was highly statistical, uh, uh, highly statistical uh, defined. Uh, and uh, what else? So please look for the, the time delay between uh, trigger gamma ray burst and maximum. Uh, uh, light curve of supernova, I'm, I'm finishing, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a huge time, it's from seven days up to 30 days. So it's uh, necessary to take into account when when somebody will go for a uh, uh, neutrino search, for example, because neutrino search for such supernova should be not two days before maximum or two days before uh, detection supernova, but much, 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 much earlier. Oh, I'm finished. So some conclusions are here, please. <laughs> this is administrative and conclusion, and this is some a few uh, scientific conclusions. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, look for this figure. Uh, the burst occurred at the time zero. The maximum light curve of uh, supernova has a delay from seven days. Five days. So if you would like to search neutrino uh, in uh, some supernova associated with gamma ray burst, you should search not two or three days uh, before, but you should search uh, around gamma ray burst. Uh, but if you have not detected gamma ray burst, you should have a huge interval between maximum and probably 20 or 30 days early. Because a lot of ZTF, uh, I mean, really a lot of ZTF uh, unknown event finally has a counterpart in gamma rays. So it's a gamma ray burst. And ZTF uh, observe just after glow. And sometimes, in two cases, they confirmed. Sorry, <laughs> Up to you. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so thank you for uh, having me. Uh, today I want to talk about structured jets viewed from different angles. And uh, this is work done with the list of collaborators that uh, you see here, among others, uh, at the Open uh, University of Israel. And uh, I will try to structure this talk uh, kind of going uh, in order of line of sight, from lines of sight which are more or less on axis and gradually increasing to further and further away from the jet. And the type of uh, physics that I will mostly focus on here is uh, very standard physics uh, in uh, GRBs, which is the physics of afterglows. So the idea, probably you're all uh, familiar with this, but just so that we're all on the same page, is that you have this uh, relativistic blast wave that is running into circumstellar material. This creates a pair of shocks, one running in, into the material, the circumstellar material, one running back into the ejecta. This enhances magnetic fields and accelerates electrons in the shock and creates synchrotron and synchrotron self compton emission. I will mostly focus on synchrotron emission for this talk. Now, imagine that you're observing this kind of jet on axis. So what you will see is that as this jet is propagating into the circumstellar material, it is slowing down, but the energy is approximately con conserved so that as long as one over gamma is small compared to the opening angle of the jet, you are unaware that the jet has any edge, and therefore as gamma goes down and this beaming cone uh, becomes larger, so there is a greater amount of material from which you can effectively see emission, the energy remains roughly constant or the luminosity goes roughly as one over T. There are some chromatic effects that change this slightly, but I will not go into that. This continues up until a critical time when gamma becomes comparable to one over the opening angle of the jet. At that point, you suddenly realize as an observer that there is emission missing. This is also roughly the point at which the jet begins to spread sideways effectively, and this causes a significant steepening in the light curve that goes roughly as t to the minus two or even steeper after that point. Okay, so far so standard. Now, the standard picture that we have in mind is that we are, if we are looking at uh, such a jet that has a core and some wings, and we're observing it on axis, because the wings are subdominant in terms of their energy, then there's no way that we can tell about the structure of the jet uh, at its uh, sides from uh, looking at it on axis. And this is true for steep structures. However, if, if the structure is sufficiently shallow, then this is no longer the case. So imagine that the energy per unit solid angle goes as theta to some minus a, just as a sort of toy model that we can consider here, and with an a that is less than two. In this case, the isotropic equivalent energy is decreasing with angle, but the true energy is increasing with angle, at least up to some point. And what it means is that as gamma decreases, the, you can see further away from the axis of the jet, and seeing further away from the axis of the jet actually is where the emission dominates uh, the flux that you see. So you can define an angle, theta max, which is the maximum angle away from the axis that you can observe at any given time. This angle increases over time, and because of that, you get qualitatively different types of behaviors and quantitatively different types of behaviors to what you would get in a steep jet. So you can work this out analytically, uh, and you can see here an example of the behavior that you get for these shallow jets compared to steep jets, which is asymptotically different. You get different evolution of the flux, different evolution of the characteristic frequencies as a function of time. You get different uh, evolution and the um, shape of the flux centroid as a function of time. So the top panel here is for a shallow jet, the lower panel is for a steep jet. And uh, you can uh, nicely work out all of this uh, analytically and then verify numerically uh, that this indeed works. This uh, idea that we had, uh, we wrote about it uh, last year, and then just a few months uh, after that, we were lucky to have this uh, extremely famous GRB that has been discussed a lot in this meeting, 221009. And this GRB is remarkable in several ways. It was already discussed that it's extremely fluent, it's both very energetic in terms of its gamma rays and close by. You can see also in terms of its X-ray flux how bright it is compared to other bursts. And one thing that is notable about this GRB is that it does not show a behavior of a post-jet break light curve, what I told you about in the beginning of the talk, of T to the minus two point something. 
at any point up to at least 120 days after the burst. This means, considering the huge X-ray flux and this huge amount of time where you don't see an X-ray, uh, don't see a break, that the implied energy, and this is beaming corrected energy, this is not isotropic equivalent, is absolutely huge if you think that the structure that we see here is a core with a steep uh, angular structure in the wings. Instead, if you imagine that this is a shallow structure type burst where you're observing close to the axis, and as time goes by, you're observing material with smaller E iso, but with larger uh, overall contribution to the total energy, then the energy up until any given time where you haven't seen a jet break increases much more shallowly with time, and you can get by with at least an order of magnitude less energy. And furthermore, you can fit well the evolution of the flux at the different bands as a function of time. This is not what you would expect if you have a standard uh, uh, jet where the uh, E iso is effectively constant up until the jet break. So you need to have this kind of shallow structure to explain the light field that we see. And this was the paper uh, recently published in uh, Science Advanced. Uh, I also want to mention that there are some other very energetic GRBs which show similar behavior. So some of the most energetic GRBs actually never show a jet break. And that's even though we observe them uh, up to, in some cases, very late times, maybe 100 days after the trigger. And this suggests, perhaps, that something about the fact that they're so energetic also means that they tend to develop a more shallow structure. And this uh, maybe is something that needs to uh, be looked into in more detail, uh, looking at the propagation of uh, such uh, energetic jets uh, in uh, uh, long gamma ray bursts. So let me move swiftly to slightly greater viewing angles, and now consider viewing angles that are not on the core, but very slightly off axis to the core. So in this situation, initially, most of the emission from the core is beamed away from the observer. But as the core decelerates, you can see more and more emission from the core. And because the viewing angle is only mildly off axis, this will represent itself as a sort of shallow phase, a bump-like phase or a plateau-like phase that you will see in the light curves in, as a function of time. And the nice feature here is that as a function of delta theta, the difference in viewing angle between the observer and the core, the time at which this shallow phase lasts uh, is very strongly dependent on this delta theta as a power of three or power of four, depending on uh, the exact dynamics that you take here. And this is very reminiscent of something that we see commonly in GRB X-ray afterglows, and that is X-ray plateaus. About 40% of uh, GRB afterglows show X-ray plateaus, and in fact, plateaus is sometimes a misnomer because they are not really flat. You can see here, they show this shallow bump-like structure quite commonly. So we think that this might be an indication of uh, this type of geometry where you're mildly off axis, and this explains the plateaus, and with small changes in the line of sight relative to the core, you can get this large range of time scales that are observed for GRB plateaus from 100 seconds to 10 to the 5 seconds after the trigger. There are various other statistics that are nicely reproduced by this type of model. I will not have time to go into them in this talk, but I will just mention that for the same price, you also get potentially an explanation for another phenomena in GRBs, and that's X-ray flares. These are instances in the X-ray light curve where the flux goes up and down very rapidly, with delta T over T much less than unity. And these are also quite common in GRBs. And what we think is that these could be cases where there was a gamma ray pulse that would be seen as such as an on-axis observer, but because you're observing slightly at the side, you see it at a lower frequency at a later time with an, and with overall lower luminosity, and it represents itself as an X-ray flare. So potentially, these two explanations are tied to each other, which gives us the possibility to understand each one of them a bit better and to maybe say something about the structure on the sides uh, of the jet. Uh, I also want to mention this um, event, uh, the jetted TDE that Tzvi mentioned uh, on Monday. So we already mentioned uh, our work on this uh, event. I will only briefly go over it here. And here, uh, the remarkable thing was that in the radio, we see that the radio light curve is very slowly increasing up until about 200 days after the event. And this was very difficult, if not impossible, to explain with the standard jet scenario. And we do it with the simplest type of jet. Just as a toy model, we take an on-axis jet viewed mildly of axis 
and uh, we can very nicely reproduce uh, the different light curves in the different radio bands. And uh, this allows us to estimate the angle of jets of uh, uh, these types. So this, if this interpretation is correct, might be uh, the first time that we have an actual estimate for the uh, angular scale of these jets. So finally, I want to move to far off axis events. And here I will focus on jets with steep angular structure. And in this case, we have the opposite situation to what I told you in the beginning of the talk, where at any given time, you can define, set a minimum, the smallest latitude or the latitude closest to the axis of the jet from which you can effectively see radiation, because the closer you are to the jet, the more energy there is, and therefore um, this will dominate the emission if it is not beamed away from you. So this angle tends to decrease in time. We can calculate how it decreases in time, and roughly, you see the approximate equation over there. And one can verify um, that uh, this uh, angle defined as simply the angle from which 1 over gamma reaches the observer is also the angle that roughly dominates the flux at any given time. And here you see different flux maps uh, at different times of the evolution. And you can also see it here in terms of the evolution of this theta mean as a function of time. So analytical and numerical is the difference between dot dashed and solid lines here. You see that they're basically on top of each other. So we have a good analytic handle on how this should behave. And what this leads to is the following. So imagine that this is the initial configuration of the Lorentz factor as a function of theta, or the Lorentz factor times the angle. And you can now imagine two types of observers. One that is viewing at an observation angle less than this theta star where gamma theta of the initial profile is one, and one that is above. If you're observing below theta star, then from the very beginning, the material that is in front of you is very highly beamed. What this means is that you will see the material as if you were observing a jet on axis. You will see the flux going up as before deceleration, then you will see the flux going down as after deceleration, and only at some later time, so this is the situation, First, you see this uh, uh, deceleration, and only later, at a uh, later point in time, you realize that there is material at the sides. And then this material, which has more energy, starts gradually dominating the flux. And as you see closer and closer into the core, you see the flux rising until eventually you see the full energy that the jet has, and then the flux will decline again. So in other words, you'll see a double-peaked light curve in this situation. In the opposite case, if your observation angle is sufficiently large, from the very beginning, you can see material that is significantly away from the line of sight, and then you will just see a single uh, peaked light curve. So it looks something like this. These are the two cases, the first one on top, the second one at the bottom. And the dashed lines here are the completely analytic expressions that we have for the shape of the light curve. The um, solid lines come from numerical calculation, and you see that we can uh, we get a good agreement between them, and we can well reproduce the slopes at the different segments and the typical time scales. Now, what I want to emphasize here is that we focus on the shape of the light curve, not on the normalization of the time or the flux. And the advantage of doing that is that we remove the degeneracy that exists in all these typical parameters that people often uh, have to deal with when they do afterglow fitting. We don't need to know anything about the absolute value of the density, the energy, the fraction of energy going to magnetic fields or electrons. If we just focus on the shape of the light curve, for example, the ratio of time scales between the two peaks and so on, this depends only on the structure of the jet and the viewing angle. It's a purely geometrical uh, picture, and therefore, by considering the shape of the light curve, we can do a very good job of constraining uh, those specific parameters. Uh, we also get um, a specific evolution of the synchrotron frequencies as a function of time almost done, uh, in this case, which is unique, um, and that can be tested when we have uh, such observations. The most famous example is 170817, and here is just to show you that we can do a good job uh, from these considerations in reproducing the Lorentz factor along the line of sight uh, initially, which agrees with independent constraints that are available. Finally, I will just briefly mention again this TDE jet that uh, Tvi mentioned as well. Uh, which uh, uh, showed a very fast rise about a thousand days after the optical trigger, and we think that this too matches well with a far-off axis uh, jet, 
uh, that is viewed by us. So this is uh, all I have to say, so I'll leave you with the conclusions and thank you for your time. Thank you. So, thank you very much again. Uh, limitation on the emitting particle spectrum. Resolution and fixed mechanism in the resolution system. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, today I would like to uh, introduce the results from the uh, freshly published paper of ours with uh, uh, Elena Nochina and uh, Ilya Pashenko. Uh, our work is uh, dedicated to the relativistic uh, jet phenomenon called limb brightening. Uh, recent uh, VLBI observation have revealed a number of uh, AGNs with uh, double and uh, triple peaked uh, transverse uh, intensity profiles. In uh, particular, the jet in uh, the radial galaxy M87 is uh, known for its uh, three ridges. Uh, and uh, the jet of the quasar uh, 3C273 is reported to be uh, lime and pine brightened and uh, at uh, different frequencies. Uh, there can be several reasons for such intensity profiles. In, in the very uh, first place, uh, it is uh, Doppler boosting and boosting uh, of the emission from the different parts of the jet. Then uh, a spatial distribution of uh, non thermal electrons can be considered. Uh, the nature of the distribution uh, uh, can be very different. Uh, a past effects uh, can also be taken into account. Of course, uh, many of these effects can contribute simultaneously. In the presented work, we uh, consider MHD semi-analytical modeling to explore the effect of stratified jet structure on uh, total intensity profiles. We analyze the contributions of the mentioned factors uh, to the brightening and we find out that uh, mm, uh, the choice of uh, spatial distribution is uh, uh, decisive. Uh, within the considered approach, the physical quantities are obtained uh, solving the great Schoenfranov equation with the particular choice of uh, the integrals of motion. We use the prescriptions uh, on the integrals of motion described uh, by Lubarsky and by Bieskin. 
denoted M1 and M2. Uh, some uh, possible uh, uh, distributions of uh, the physical quantities are as follows. Uh, I note that in this slide uh, the quantities are dimensionless, as it is uh, provided by the modeling. Uh, the solid lines are for M2, the dashed lines are for one and different colors are for different values of uh, the initial magnetization, which is uh, one of the modeling parameters. Uh, both models possess the central core, uh, which is the central dense part of the jet with the peaks of uh, uh, the magnetic field and the particle number density. The existence of the central core is uh, confirmed by uh, numerical uh, simulations. The models differ in uh, Lorentz factor and particle number density behavior at the jet boundary, uh, therefore considering them in a parallel, less to have a closer look at uh, the impacts made by Doppler factor and by non-uniform uh, particle distributions. Mm. Uh, using the modeled uh, quantities, we numerically solve the radiative transfer equation. It has the given form with uh, the given uh, uh, emission and absorption coefficient, uh, self uh, synchrotron uh, emission with self absorption. To calculate the intensity, we need to fill in the observational frequency, the viewing angle, uh, the magnetic field, uh, and velocities. Uh, integrating the uh, power law and the spectrum, we see how to include the emitting particle number density. Besides, as the model provides the dimensionless physical quantities, uh, we need to dimension them with the use of the total magnetic flux parameter, the light cylinder radius parameter, and the or dimensioned uh, initial magnetization. So there are two uh, modeling question, how to choose the parameters for dimensioning, and uh, how much does uh, uh, the emitting particle number density differ from the cold one. Our parameter setup is as follows. We take the Mahavi frequency and two probe viewing angles to catch the basic properties of uh, quasars and radio galaxies. Uh, as the modeling uh, provides the dimensionless uh, radius of uh, cross-section, choosing it along with some real jet widths uh, gives the light cylinder radius. We choose two probe values to reflect the different transverse contribution of the central core, and we probe a fiducial, uh, close, well-resolved resolved, uh, source. As uh, the initial magnetization can be related uh, to the maximum Lorentz factor, uh, up to which the jet can accelerate, uh, our probe values are related to the kinematics data, rather lower values uh, are estimations uh, from uh, M87, and high values uh, appear in uh, the quasar's uh, statistics. And now if we recall the dimensioning uh, formula, we see that the total magnetic flux is left to be the only three parameter. Its variation uh, can uh, fix uh, the number of quantities uh, which are related to the optical uh, depth of uh, the jet region under consideration. Uh, for our theoretical considerations, we choose uh, optical depth as uh, maximum optical depth as uh, it is Lorentz invariant and uh, mm, the specification in our models is strong, but uh, to match uh, the specific observations, uh, the spectral index of brightness are more appropriate. Uh, for this talk, let's uh, limit ourselves to two uh, landmarks. One of them is uh, spinal membrane transition, and another one is uh, triple peak intensity profiles. 
uh, double peaked uh, intensities nicely appear in any low magnetized uh, models uh, at considerable optical depths, while uh, the jet is uh, fine brightened at uh, optically thin conditions. Uh, triple peaked uh, profiles are a much more tricky question, so we'll focus on it uh, uh, from now. <laughs> Uh, Doppler the boost appears in high magnetized models, but due to rotation, uh, such profiles are highly asymmetrical. In the same time, uh, if you recall the rise uh, of uh, the particle number density in uh, uh, the second model, it uh, cannot manifest itself without the help uh, from the Doppler factor. Uh, the symmetry can be enhanced if we choose uh, uh, the mm, higher dimensional jet widths, uh, that means uh, lower light cylinder radius, and if we assume uh, the blank resonant jet, it uh, can be related to the black hole spin, uh, and it would mean uh, uh, the high black hole spin. <coughs> Therefore, the mm, uh, best uh, option visually approaching to qualitative, uh, qualitative uh, uh, picture of interest is a highly magnetized uh, jet with a uh, uh, high black hole spin and uh, 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 high optical depth. However, uh, these uh, conditions uh, are not likely from for M87. Additionally, this uh, high uh, optical depth or high jet power uh, results in uh, uh, the brightness uh, uh, several magnitude, several orders of magnitude higher than expected. Uh, so we conclude that the pure MHD modeling uh, cannot describe uh, triple peak intensity profiles and as the difference uh, is uh, significant, uh, uh, the um, additions uh, are not uh, the minor ones. Uh, because of this discrepancy, we also considered other uh, distributions of uh, non thermal electrons for the localization of limiting particles as a jet boundary uh, defined by the given multiplier function. Uh, the uh, favorable conditions are uh, low magnetization at uh, low uh, uh, heating rate in uh, the central core. Such behavior can be related to instabilities or short acceleration. On the other hand, atomic heating uh, uh, requires uh, high magnetization, and this uh, mechanism works due to the rapid uh, change of magnetic field uh, in uh, the model described by Beskin and co -authors. Uh, Both uh, refinements moderate the jet brightness, and especially atomic heating does uh, as uh, uh, the electric current tends to uh, delta-like behavior. And uh, regarding uh, M87, instabilities are likely to be important, uh, particularly kellen hingold's instabilities are thoroughly analyzed. Uh, as an additional argument, we compared uh, the particle number density values in our models with the predictions by uniform uh, blanford kongel model, which uh, describes well the core shift effect and it uh, also shows that uh, the non-modified particle number density is significantly uh, overestimated. Also, the widely used equipartition assumption uh, results uh, uh, do not uh, change significantly from uh, the cold platinum option. To summarize, uh, let's recall the possible mechanisms for limb brightening uh, uh, listed in introduction and see how they contributed uh, in our analysis. Though the decrease of uh, the Lorentz factor towards the jet boundary indeed results in limb brightening, in uh, the case uh, 
the intensity profiles are rather uh, symmetrical and excessively bright. In the same time, uh, non-uniform particle number density with uh, the near boundary rise uh, from uh, the image demodeling is also not enough to uh, produce uh, the non-contradictory profiles. Uh, the preferable models are the localization of limiting particles as the jet boundary and the ohmic heating. Uh, nearly all the cases require uh, a considerable optical depth. I also provide some uh, predictions from the literature, and the concluding remark is that uh, fitting the particular uh, observational uh, data should uh, further clarify the heating mechanism in a delta jet. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>numbers anywhere, there was a 10 to, uh, to the power of 33 in the regard of the total magnetic flux, uh, typical, flux typical predicted. Uh, I am a, uh, fine. You mean, you mean that? access to the number of M87 uh, data at uh, two frequencies. So we aim to check uh, the parameters at uh, different uh, uh, cuts in, uh, in the observational data to see if our predictions are consistent, uh, at least which, uh, with itself. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank Narek Sahakyan for inviting me here and uh, for possibility to have a talk at Zeldovich meeting. Being part, being tiny part of Zeldovich meeting, it's always pleasure. I'm going to speak about uh, supernova 1A progenitor properties uh, and how we, how we can constrain these properties uh, by their location inside host galaxies. Uh, this work have been done with my students at Alihanya National Science Laboratory 
This is former Yerevan Physics Institute, where we have Center of Cosmology and Astrophysics. Uh, most of you know that Most of you know that light curve of supernova uh, is the most important property uh, and the light curve properties is defined by synthesized radioactive nickel at the explosion. The amount of this nickel govern not only the maximum of the light curve but also the decline rate properties. And there are also very important relation of it luminosity relation where where we find that more luminous supernova is low declining and less luminous supernova is fast declining events. And this with luminosity relation uh, was very much important because using these people standardized supernova and used in cosmology as a distant indicators. And by their models, um, we distinguish two very simple toy models um, in a binary system we can have the generate white dwarf star, and from the companion, we can have a creation to this white dwarf star, and because of Chandrasekhar limit, uh, the mass can be increased to reach the Chandrasekhar limit, and at this point, we have the thermonuclear explosion as type 1a supernova. Uh, this explosion can be asymmetric, and depending on viewing ag angle, you can see a lot of different representatives of this plot. However, this asymmetric explosion face complications and cannot fully uh, represent this behavior. Therefore, uh, people introduce also uh, another, uh, uh, let's say, classic model of double degenerate uh, model when in the pair of st uh, stars you have two uh, neutron, neutron uh, two white dwarf stars and they rotate and they meet gravitational wave, lose angular momentum and eventually interact together and if the total mass increase the uh, 1.4 solar masses you have explosion of supernova. But all these models cannot, cannot uh, give the well representation of these observational results from vitro luminosity relation. Therefore, mm, uh, people develop another very interesting model, so-called double detonation model, when in pair you have two white dwarfs, and from, mm, from surface of uh, white dwarf you can have helium layer, and this helium layer can occur to the primary white dwarf, and you can have thermonuclear explosion in, uh, on the surface of white dwarf, and this thermonuclear explosion, this first detonation, can give a shock, and that shock can uh, uh, push to detonate the star, which is the less than 1.4 uh, uh, solar masses. So during this mechanism, uh, you can reproduce uh, all this plot, uh, and uh, because of different different mass of white dwarfs can be exploded, so different mass of nickel CP6 can be produced, and uh, this um, and this uh, by this model, uh, all of this uh, representation can be done, and according uh, according to this model, uh, we expect that. Uh, high mass white dwarf should uh, should come from uh, younger uh, younger progenitor stars, while uh, the less massive white dwarf can uh, come from stars which have several giga years. And uh, and um, and we now try to observationally constrain this this model if it is possible. Uh, therefore, we use uh, we use very interesting. Uh, things I will explain you. So the older supernova progenitor should have faster declining light curves, and the younger supernova progenitor should have slower declining light curves. And we're going to 
check this wide observation. Uh, okay, so the main problem is to find appropriate stellar population age indicators. There are many, many papers in the literature you can find that people do this global check of supernova light curve properties in comparison with the host galaxy properties and measure the mass of host galaxies, stellar population age, um, morphology, color, a lot of things which they relate with the age of the population, but all these things are global. So we go further and um, try to find dynamical, dynamical age constraints using the location of supernova inside the host galaxies. Uh, so this first approach is to find supernova inside so-called star formation deserts of spiral galaxies. Now I uh, just want to show you this simulation uh, so you will understand what is going on with evolution of spiral galaxies and how star formation deserts created. Uh, here you see the spiral galaxies and here is the time, time evolution in giga year. You can find that here the bar develops and uh, here the distribution of the stars, here the distribution of the gas and uh, during this bar evolution, strong bar appeared and the strong bar interact with the gaseous component and during the time it creates the so-called hole in the central part of uh, strongly barred galaxies and we expect to see no star formation here so only the only the old population will exist in this star formation desert these two uh, these two regions surrounding surround the bar. And according to this simulation and other models, this star formation desert uh, has, a, has a limitation of, uh, of the stellar population age. This dynamical limitation is two giga year and higher. And we start to look uh, uh, at nearby galaxies to find supernova hosts uh, which has the star formation desert. Here you can see a lot of different host galaxies, spiral host galaxies, and this is that examples when we have uh, barred structure and two regions which call the star formation desert. And in some cases we find supernova located in this region. Uh, this is the RGB image of the same event. And, and here our sample, we have uh, about 200 cases and about these 200 cases only uh, 14, 14 supernova located in star formation desert and we start to compare light curve properties of supernova located in this region in comparison uh, with region outside. And really we found that, uh, that the average value of light curve decline uh, is higher in star formation desert in comparison with supernova uh, beyond the region. So we, uh, for the first time, we demonstrated that from the pers perspective of the dynamical time scale of star formation desert, its all cellular population has mostly fast declining light curve. So we argue, uh, argue the people to look at supernova of different transient in this star formation desert to have a constraint of uh, their age. Another approach, is to, another approach is to look the vertical distribution of supernova. Uh, there is a very well-known phenomenon of the vertical age, age gradients of the stellar population inside the spiral disk when you see the spiral disk from age on uh, perspective. So we start to look uh, host galaxies from age on side and uh, measure the supernova, supernova vertical distances from the plane. And eventually we link this vertical distance to the light curve properties. And again, we see the correlation uh, that at higher higher vertical locations, you find the supernova, supernova 1A, which are slowly declining. So they are 
They are old events and they, are, they have low luminosities. Also, this method gives us possibility to compare the vertical uh, distribution, uh, the scale length distribution of vertical height to the different uh, disk components, to the thin disk, to thick, thick disk, uh, in Milky Way and in other galaxies even, we can compare this distribution with the core collapse vertical distribution. And again, using this method, we can constrain the ages of different types of supernova 1A. For example, here you can see that the uh, low luminosity events comes from old generation, while uh, high luminosity events come from young generation. And using this method, we constrain it the stellar population age. So we can now claim that, you know, for example, 91 T-like events, bright supernova 1A come from generation of stars which are uh, which have several mega years uh, age population and the third third the pro, uh, the details you can find in this article and the third ap approach is to use so-called density wave mechanism and measure the distances from uh, from the spiral arm according to this mechanism um, we have differential rotation material inside the disk. So the gas rotate faster than steady density wave and gas hit the, the wave from inner side. And here we have shock fronts. So we expect that supernova, uh, supernova progenitors will born here, then start to move from the birthplace. And this distance, this uh, um, Circular distance from shock front can be um, taken into account as the, uh, again, stellar population age uh, parameter. And again, we, we start to look the, we start to look supernova which are located on the spiral arm and uh, inside the region between the spiral arm. And we uh, relate this light curve properties to the distances from the shock front, which, which, are, uh, which are stellar population age uh, properties. So th this is the third, third method. Uh, OK, to summarize, I can say that for the first time, we demonstrated that supernova 1A distances from spiral are, and their galactocentric uh, radii are correlated the positive correlation between the light curve properties and the distances of supernova from the shock fronts means that there is important uh, relation between light curve and ages. And using this relation, we can, we can say that the double degenerate, double detonation model is valid and, can, and has uh, observational uh, proof of it. Um, and eventually, we encourage further analysis using integral field observations uh, using this uh, dimensioned properties. Fortunately, the large robotic survey telescopes and forthcoming Rubin Observatory will give us a lot, uh, lot of supernova with, uh, with very high precision measurements of the coordinate. And uh, the details of supernova host galaxies so we can have better results uh, and better statistics on this. Okay, thank you. So you mean this, this? Yes, 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 yes. yes. 
Okay, so I would like to mention uh, uh, in our talk, in our research, we only use normal supernova, 91 T-like events and uh, 91 VG-like events. All these events has progenitor star lower than 1.4 uh, mass of sun, so lower than Chandrasekhar limit. You speak about superluminous events, which are higher than Chandrasekhar limit. So we have very little, very few statistics of this event, so it is not possible to locate this event in the desert, outside that desert. Therefore, this is for future work. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Is actually on the on the back page. No, uh, it is on this uh, Indigo. I upload it. Yeah. can go here. Oh, okay. May I use this one? Okay. So hello, my name is Martin Kolosh. I came here from uh, Opava uh, in Czech Republic, where I belong to a research group. Okay, where I belong to a research group by Professor Zdenk Tuchlik. And I would like to speak a little bit about some uh, most theoretical process which can appear uh, in rotating black hole ergosphere. So this is a motivation slide where I would like to uh, say that uh, magnetic fields are very important for uh, accretion processes. So uh, even they should be considered quite small from the point of magnitude. So 10 Gaussian is not so high as neutron stars, which is, let's say, 100 times bigger than on our planet. But uh, it plays a crucial role uh, since the Lorentz force for elementary particles can be really huge. So uh, now we have observation, we have some model, and uh, we would like to study uh, test charge particles inside this black hole magnetosphere to, uh, to show what it is doing. So uh, we will be solving this uh, Lorentz equation, so this is a relativistic Lorentz equation, so if this will be zero, so this some Lorentz force, so if I put that zero, I will have just geodesic motion. So uh, this Lorentz force, is somehow proportional to this uh, factor, so this parameter uh, B, 
uh, is composed from, let's say, charge of the particle divided by mass and the magnitude of the magnetic field. So it somehow describes how uh, the magnetic, how the Lorentz force big is. Yeah? So if it, this is small, it means that the gravity is much stronger than the Lorentz force. If this is huge, if this parameter B is huge, then it means that the uh, Lorentz force is much higher. And in astrophysically relevant scenarios, uh, you can have like negligible Lorentz force or Lorentz force which will be very strong. So the particle will be just following uh, the magnetic field lines and making these small armor circles around them. Uh, the case where they will be comparable is actually very, uh, very nice to explore. There are lots of features, but probably it is not very common in nature that they will be just in, uh, very close uh, to each other. Yeah, so we, we will explore this dynamic. Yeah. So uh, in this lecture, uh, we actually include another new force, so it will not be just like Lorentz force plus something else, which will be radiation reaction force. So as the particle is moving on curved trajectory, uh, the electric field is following, and since it's curved, uh, you will see some radiation part. So some photons, some electromagnetic field uh, will be radiated away, and uh, we would like to calculate such motion. Actually, this is quite simple. You can just take the partial derivative of the for potential. We will get uh, this uh, tensor. That's fine. But calculating radiation reaction force is very complicated, as you can see on this uh, equation. So this first term has some high derivatives in time, so it's really problematic. You have like first derivative in time of uh, uh, coordinates, so not easy to solve. Uh, then there is something uh, from uh, the curvature, and there is actually you should, in, you should know your trajectory before, uh, so you should know uh, some kind of field which was created uh, in, in past. But uh, actually, lots of these terms can be simplified, so we use some simplification. So this we substitute with some trick from Landau and Lifshitz. Uh, this is canceled because we will be in care, uh, vacuum care, so this will be zero. And this actually can be proven to be negligibly small. So fortunately, you will end up with uh, some factor like this. Still, it is not, uh, not very simple, but it is solvable. So uh, this radiation force will somehow be as a dumping force which will decrease the angular momenta and energy of the particle motion. And uh, I can show it to you uh, for a very simple case. The most simple case, so it will be just split space time, there will be uniform magnetic field, and there will be some particle motion. So uh, you probably know this from classical electrodynamics. Uh, this is change of uh, uh, velocity, and you see this is U X and U Y, and this is U Y, U X, yeah? so if you put there, for example, generalist function like cosine and sinus, you will get circle. Yes, so just like Lorentz force will give you nice silk curve. If you include radiation reaction, actually the silk circles will become like in spiral, and since the motion in the direction is not influenced, it will be just going uh, around uh, and create such structure. So, so this is actually what the radiation reaction will do on the charged particle dynamics. This is a very, very well known result from classical courses. Yeah? So since you, we can solve this uh, equation for any different space time, let's see how it looks like for Schwarzschild. Yeah? So uh, here you will have Schwarzschild, and without radiation reaction, the charged particle is moving on this gray curve. Yeah? So it's moving around the black hole on some, on some trajectory like this. Uh, so actually, we can have magnetic field, which will be oriented up or down. So you have like two cases. So Lorentz force can be repulsive or, or attractive. And uh, here you can see some nice curls, so, uh, which will be created by this Larmor orbit. So uh, this is for without the radiation reaction. With radiation reaction, these curls will be radiated away. And later, the particle will be moving mostly on uh, something like circular orbit. Uh, here you can see decay due to the uh, loss of angular momenta and energy. So this is, let's say, what everybody would expect. Uh, but what is quite strange uh, that uh, black holes are not very simple. Well, they are simple, but they have some nice features. So uh, this is non-rotating Schwarzschild black hole, so there is no ergosphere. But for rotating black holes, uh, you can have some special region uh, between horizon and static limit uh, where uh, there is possible uh, to have null geodesics with negative energies 
for with respect to observer at infinity. Yes, so uh, since the charged particle during its motion is actually radiating photons, it will be interesting to look if it could radiate this uh, photons with negative energies and angular momenta. So, uh, so it will be very interesting to actually look inside the black hole ergosphere because here the radiation effect could be very strange. This is the assumption. Yeah? So we would like to see how the radiating particle will be radiating inside black hole ergosphere. So uh, the, the negative energy photons are actually will appear when you will try to go against the black hole rotation. Of course, you will be co-rotating, but if you, so, so, uh, so you will be just like rotating uh, uh, in this direction, but you are trying to go against it. Yeah? So here, for this kind of orbit, you can find uh, uh, negative energy photons. So let's assume that our particle will be radiating mostly in this direction, which is easy to, uh, to do since if particles are moving very fast, they are mostly radiating in the direction of their motion. Yeah? So if you put a particle, charged particle, in trajectory like this, yeah? it will be moving very fast, and probably it should be radiating uh, negative energy photons. Yeah? So we put uh, this formula into some code, and let's see some trajectory. So this is actually outside of the ergosphere, so you can see uh, the similar effect as before, so charged particle is making this small Larmor circles while going around. You can see that the initial energy is actually decreasing, and finally probably will end up on some circular orbit. Yeah, so uh, that's quite normal. But if you are starting in black hole ergosphere, uh, and if you have uh, L negative, which is not written here anyway, uh, so uh, you can see that actually uh, there is some energy increase, yeah? And then, so when you are in ergosphere, so the, the time is still red, yeah? so the color is actually marking the time. So when you are still in red region, yeah? so inside the ergosphere, you are actually increased the, increasing your energy due to radiation. And when you left the ergosphere, the energy is decreased. Yeah? So such trajectory is actually, uh, mining the energy from the black hole uh, just uh, by its radiation. Okay, so uh, this is quite interesting. Actually, you can even construct something which is called floating orbit. Yeah, so th this particle is actually inside the ergosphere. It is radiating the photons with negative energy. So it's actually gaining energies. Yeah? And when it is leaving the ergosphere, it starts to lose the energy since it is radiating normal photons with positive energy. Then again, goes inside, and you can do this process. So it is flowing, floating around the static limit and uh, probably just mining the energy from the black hole and uh, radiating away some photons. Yeah? The photons which, with negative energies actually are always ending in the black hole. Yeah? That's their feature. So probably this will be all. And, uh, so this is just like proposal of some uh, strange radiative Penrose process. Uh, so if you put the charged particle on a good course, so if you let it to, if you inject the particle with angular momenta, with negative angular momenta, it will, inside the black hole ergosphere, it will actually radiate photons with negative energy, and you can mine the energy of the black hole. So such process is pro probably for electrons only because uh, uh, only the, uh, there is a quadratic uh, cubic dependence on the particle mass, so probably protons, protons need a really huge uh, magnetic field. So uh, the question now is if such process uh, exists, so question actually, so the question is if it has some astrophysical application. Yeah? So that's the question. Uh, maybe, maybe if it is true, we should actually see something on the static limit. Yeah, so as the floating orbit, as the floating orbit is just peaking out uh, and radiating uh, synchrotron radiation uh, outside, so these photons have positive energy, so they go to, can go to infinity, while when it is radiating inside the ergosphere, it radiates photons with negative energy, so they must go to the black hole. So maybe this could cause something like that uh, the static limit will be shining uh, with synchrotron light. Yeah, so that's 
probably all. You can find the code and some, some connections to me, so if you would like to ask, that will be all. Thank you very much. Definitely, it is a very good question. We are now trying to uh, work on the astrophysical consequences. So, uh, actually, just like even like plotting the spectra, right? so it will produce some synchrotron radiation, so it will have some spectra, and we are maybe thinking if it will have some special spectra, so it can be distinguished, let's say, from normal plasma. I don't know. Yeah, so Cassid, how to check it during the coffee break? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, so we actually tested volt solution, but also something which is called split magnetic monopole. Uh, so we assume, we, we didn't test it all configuration, we tested mostly volt, uh, but if volt, you can put there a uh, volt solution with, with, let's say, electric charge, because there is like, like volt charge induced. So with or without volt charge, uh, there exists also uh, something like magnetic monopole, which is split. Yeah, so uh, we tested such configurations, uh, and uh, in all these configurations, we see the same effects. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. That, so actually, the radiation is caused by the curvature. Yeah. So if you have. Uh, Orbit, which has a huge circle, the curvature is small, and it is radiating uh, not so much. But if the circle is very sm so, so if the circle is huge, it is not radiating not so much. But if the circle is small, it is radiating very quickly. Yeah, so the, because the acceleration is large. Yeah, so uh, the tail term is actually uh, given as the, tra tra as the particle was moving around the black hole. Yeah, so uh, it, the trajectory doesn't have such huge curvature. There is. Uh, some acceleration, but compared to the small Larmor circles, uh, that could be negligible. Actually, you can look into the article uh, 2018 when we have some discussion why to neglect this term. Uh, actually, this is really problematic because if this B parameter is small, then the tail term will be important. It will be like the most uh, contribution. Yeah? So we, actually are for, we, are, we are actually examining the case when the Lorentz force is dominating. Because we are thinking this is the most uh, the relevant astrophysical case. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we can definitely discuss it. Yeah, only. Yeah. Of course, this is let's say poor guy description of plasma with just one particle. We are now planning to do something like particle in the cell simulation when you can have like more particles. So this is just an ongoing work. And definitely, this is the direction we would like to go. But till now, we don't know. Maybe it will be completely useless if you put there more particles. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Uh, <laughs>
Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. <coughs> Without yeah. just this one. So the pointer is okay. okay, so <clears throat> good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thanks to organizers for a very nice meeting. Uh, today I'd like to show uh, some another model of uh, our group uh, in which we also try to extract energy uh, from black holes to accelerate particles uh, by supermassive black holes uh, uh, to ultra high energies and we applied this to the galactic center supermassive black hole to obtain the uh, peta electron volt emission uh, in, in cosmic rays. So, so why do we need the pevatrons uh, in the galactic center? So actually there are many uh, motivations for that and probably one of the most convincing one is, the, is this picture, uh, the image obtained by Hess collaboration, which actually hard to explain without, uh, so to explain this observed gamma image, you, you need the continuous injection of uh, petal electron volt proton uh, within just 10 parsecs, the central parsecs of the galactic center. Yeah. And another reason is that uh, we know that the ordinary or commonly believed mechanism of the uh, production of uh, galactic cosmic rays are given by the supernova explosions and uh, while they explain very well up to the peta electron volt, there's still some problems uh, when it comes to several times peta electron volt, which is actually the knee. Yeah? So we know that the knee is not exactly 10 to 15 electron volt, several times. So, so um, therefore, probably some complementary model to the existing one might be needed. So this is what we are proposing. And uh, also, what we don't see uh, in the uh, galactic center, we don't see the visible jet. Yeah, so this mechanism will actually provide particle acceleration without jet, without trucks, and uh, I, will, I will show how, how it works. So a few words about the cosmic rays. So these are the charged particles with very high energy. So we know the spectrum. So this typically, they are protons, but could be also higher, uh, heavier uh, nuclei. And it has uh, two knees, uh, which are believed to be the proton knee and the iron knee, and it has an ankle where there is some flattening of the spectral index. And uh, uh, so they are usually detected by, uh, on the Earth-based experiments when the particle, the high energy particle, enter the atmosphere, interact with mainly oxygen, nitrogen, creates a secondary cascade of particles. And uh, here, here is some uh, visible uh, discrepancy, but it's actually due to the lack of uh, statistics because these particles are extremely rare at very high energy. So those which have energy of the order of 10 to 19 electron volts or greater, you may hope to get, catch one particle per square kilometer per year. Yes, so extremely rare particles. And a few words about the galactic center. So these are probably, this is a probably the best uh, known uh, supermassive black hole candidate, which is known as Sagittarius A star. And uh, we uh, can estimate its mass or measure its mass very precisely by, because we, uh, on the infrared images, we, uh, when we look at the infrared, we see that there are many stars orbiting around the uh, galactic center. And using just Kepler law, we can estimate mass. Mass is of the order of four million solar masses. But we also believe that it is spinning, but the spin is loosely constrained, yeah, because it has no Newtonian analog. And I will show some constraints of the spin from our model also. And uh, from the polarization studies and also for Faraday rotation and so on, we know that there is an ordered magnetic field 
of the event horizon scale, which, are, which is of the order of 10 Gauss, uh, the equipartition magnetic field. Yeah? So uh, this magnetic field actually plays important role as uh, Martin already described in previous uh, talk. Uh, but uh, it does not modify the space-time geometry because uh, uh, for such magnetic field you would need extremely huge values of magnetic field. So this 10 Gauss is just test field approximation, but also even this test field, if we uh, calculate the ratio of the Lorentz forces as well as the relativistic proton to the gravitational force, you, you, you get for the Sagittarius space star something like million. So magnetic... Uh, Electromagnetic interactions is actually dominant even in the case of the galactic center and should be taken into account. So when, we, when you do this, uh, so combine the rotation of the black hole with the external magnetic field, and <laughs> today there was already a talk about this, yes, so it was mentioned by Jorge Rueda and Remo Rokini that actually the black hole can acquire some charge. And for the galactic center, we, we made these estimates uh, so I will not be describing the physical mechanism. We already heard it about it today. So it's maximum 10 to 15 coulomb, while the uh, right nostrum of Herniumann is 12 orders of magnitude greater. So it is very weak charge. So the black hole uh, or the Kerr black hole hypothesis is still safe from this point of view. We also observe the uh, flares in the near infrared, the galactic center, which is very good uh, to, for testing the gravity, and <clears throat> in 2018 there have been these three flares uh, which, which have been observed, uh, which allowed one to constrain the uh, theory, which is also, of course, fitting this uh, Kerr uh, metric hypothesis. But what also was important in this observation is there was also polarization period measures, which were kind of... <clears throat> Uh, which were giving quite important information also about the magnetic field. And, and so what we did, we tried to co co construct, construct uh, so, so what happens when you have a plasma in, a, uh, in, in magnetic field uh, and the dynamics of plasma leads to the charge separation, which, uh, so co combining all this, so we found that actually the, uh, magnetic field and the spin axis uh, should be kind of co-aligned co because of the uh, observed dynamics of the flares. And uh, one of the interesting results is that black holes is most likely uh, inclined uh, with the spin axis towards the line of sight with the uh, angles less than 45 degrees. So this was quite interesting result. And uh, finally, we are coming to, to the main point. Uh, that uh, we have a rotating black hole, and uh, uh, just just briefly, that uh, today also there were many talks about the energy extraction, so I will not be repeating. But I just say that uh, the uh, up to 29 percent of total energy of black hole is extractable, which is rotational energy, and tremendous amount of energy which uh, which can be used, and if even if the black hole is rotating with just one percent of its maximum speed, still this uh, uh, amount of energy is tremendous. So uh, so what we do is that basically now we have all the components, all the ingredients for our recipe. So we have a rotating black hole, uh, we have external magnetic field, we have a plasma charge separation, and all all, all the stuff. Uh, but we need also one more thing. We need to have an ionization close to the black hole. So when we consider kind of ionization, which can be a, just uh, ordinary ionization as we understand, or it can be, for example, neutron beta decay. In that situation, the uh, maximum proton energy reaches in the vicinity of Sagittarius A star, the energy five times 10 to 15 electron volts. Yes. So uh, you can also consider different kinds of uh, oscillation scenarios like alpha decay, beta decay, ionization, pair production for, for each, uh, depending on the composition that you want to accelerate, uh, uh, you, can, you can get uh, different energies. So for, for proton, it is 10, 5 to 10 to 15, and it is surprising it will coincide with the knee of the cosmic ray spectrum, yes. So what will happen if we consider the iron? So for iron, it actually it corresponds to the second knee. So this is um, this was interesting uh, result and coincidence. 
So we went further, uh, of course, to calculate the energy losses. Uh, and there are different types of energy losses which one needs to take into account. In this slide, I just give the synchrotron energy losses. So probably the most important is that uh, difference between the uh, time scale of the radiation of electrons and protons is different by 10 orders of magnitude, yes. So uh, protons are more likely to survive. But there are also other um, energy losses that given by the interaction of uh, of high energy particles with photons, uh, which is especially important for extragalactic cosmic rays because uh, of this uh, Grison Zatep and Kuzmin limit. Yes, we, uh, uh, in, a, in a while I will show this plot. So you can actually, um, in, in this slide, uh, I showed that uh, the few sources which are potentially interesting, which have all uh, necessary, necessary ingredients to accelerate particles within our model. And you can see that some of them in the local universe, they can actually reach the energy of 10 to 20 or higher. And so while Sagittarius A star gives you the maximum uh, 10 to 15.5 electron volt for, uh, uh, so it's a maximum galactic uh, energy for the galactic cosmic rays. Uh, of course, we look to the larger population of uh, supermassive black holes in the local universe. Why in the local universe? Because uh, if you have uh, large cosmological distances and high energy proton, which is propagating there, it should interact with the cosmic microwave background in this gradient that's happening Kuzmin uh, uh, effect. So when these uh, delta resonances due to this interaction will take part of its energy, so you should you are very restricted uh, by by the distance. So we take uh, like 100 megaparsec distance. Uh, uh, at this distance, we select uh, supermassive black holes with the known masses and magnetic fields. And uh, okay. And uh, so what is interesting in this uh, table is that actually these sources are quite different from each other. They are located in different places, different distances, masses, magnetic field, and so on. But all of them give kind of similar order of magnitude, which perfectly fits with this ankle region of the cosmic ray spectrum. So maybe this uh, gives some, I don't know, hint on the uh, on why we have this flattening uh, of the spectral index uh, of such high energies. So maybe these AGNs are responsible and uh, they generate uh, actually protons uh, uh, and uh, ions uh, of this uh, order of magnitude. Yes, so we can reproduce this uh, spectrum uh, in a sense that we can reproduce the spectral index. But uh, here actually is nothing surprising because uh, we, we add uh, additional parameters like temperature of the accretion disk or volume uh, uh, or uh, ionization point, uh, we, we can actually play with it and then we can obtain what we want. So actually the spectral index is, uh, is, not, a, is not a problem. Uh, okay, so, so here is a summary uh, of my talk. So, uh, we propose the particle acceleration scenario in the galactic center, not, not only in the galactic center, but in general for supermassive black holes in which the particles would be accelerated without extended acceleration zone, without shocks like uh, as, as generally uh, studied, right? And the uh, uh, model provides uh, verifiable constraints on ma mass and magnetic fields of supermassive black hole and it operates in viable astrophysical conditions without uh, exotic assumptions. So I think uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Yes, so thanks uh, a lot. So uh, you mean the galactic uh, stellar mass black hole? Okay, okay. So actually, this will be similar to what uh, today uh, Jorge describes. Actually, you can you can apply it, but uh, the difference is that if you have strong magnetic field in the vicinity, because uh, because this stellar. 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, so that's what I mean, that the losses will be much larger than, than it will highly depend on the pitch angle on which these particles are emit, uh, emitted. So basically, this mechanism is very general. You can apply it also to stellar mass black holes. Yes. So we have now the relativity. So this energy is accelerated. Uh, probably you will not get these ultra high energies unless you put very strong magnetic fields of the order 10 to 14 gauss or so, uh, because for ordinary like X-ray binaries, you have magnetic fields of the order 10 to 8 gauss, which is not sufficient to, to generate these ultra high energy cosmic rays. But uh, probably these galactic cosmic rays would be possible, yes. Okay. In strong magnetic field, it will be strong, yes? So I can show this in the slide. So you can here see that uh, 10 to 12 gauss, this is a typical time scale of radiation, 10 to minus 6 seconds. Yes, there is a question. Uh, yes, very good question. Thank you. We are working now on it. Actually, we have, I have a student, uh, Berenika Chermakova, who is now working on the simulations uh, using the Galpra probe. So we are, uh, yes, so this is the next step which we are trying to test. To, to reproduce all spectrum and uh, everything, all the features. Yes. Thank you very much. Can, can, is it possible to do? <laughs> <Don't want. laughs> okay.
Надо пошуметь, постучать ногами. 15 минут содержится. Пойти позвать? Да похлопать немножко надо, пошуметь. Yes. But it, it's anyway, your name is written on, on oh, it's personal, don't worry. Yeah, but you don't have to say that when the one person... No, no, it's okay, it's okay. It's anyway, it's personal. We cannot uh, use it. You cannot say your one person... We, we have, we have, uh, we have some, some here. It's okay, it's okay, yes. It's okay, thank you. Okay, I call them. First I could do. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I I'll try to be brief. I must be. And uh, traditionally, this meeting, we have uh, talks, uh, we try to have talks uh, which are relevant for scientific interests of uh, Yakov Zeldovich. And as you know, he had extremely wide scientific interests. Uh, there is even, you know, when I've been a PhD student, I discovered that most physics problems you ever met are already discussed in Landau Lipschitz textbooks. Uh, but uh, when after PhD studies, I worked further in astrophysics, and this, I discovered that most physics or astrophysics problems were even worked by worked out by <laughs> Zeldovich himself. So this is one of the problem. Uh, I mean, the pair production, uh, electron positron pair production, or in general pair production in strong uh, fields, not only electromagnetic but gravitational fields, were also. Uh, uh, one of the topics on which the Deutsch worked, but on this specific topic, electron positron pair production, he worked and he even dedicated an article on, on this topic to the 60th uh, anniversary of John Archibald Wheeler. Uh, but apart from his work with Popov on uh, super heavy nuclei. So I would like to discuss something which could, like, could look uh, unusual for you, namely what I call here inverse uh, Schwinger process. Uh, and uh, this work was done with collaboration with my colleague from Belarus, Nikolai Prokopenia, who could not unfortunately join the meeting, uh, but uh, he uh, done a substantial part of this work. So uh, just to remind uh, for people, and of course this is theoretical work, is, uh, unlike many of the presentations here, it does not have any observational part. So uh, as you know well, uh, in, uh, there is a possibility in uh, highly uh, intense uh, electric field uh, to produce electron positron pairs. This possibility was uh, known for quite a long time already since the introduction of positron by uh, Paul Dirac. Uh, it was uh, realized uh, al already in the early times of uh, uh, quantum uh, mechanics, relativistic quantum mechanics, before the development of quantum electric dynamics, that uh, electron and positron can be produced in uh, vacuum. Uh, 
uh, if strong electric field is present. So the intensity needed for this is huge. You can see here in laboratory, this intensity has never been reached despite strong, very intense attempts to do that uh, with, in particular with the help of ultra intense lasers. This process is uh, considered uh, to be important in astrophysical, um, in astrophysical conditions, and this is one of the reasons why, why we discussed this uh, in this conference. In particular, two, uh, two um, setups could be considered. One is, uh, was first proposed by Vladimir Rusov, and this is uh, related to so-called uh, quark stars, hypothetical quark stars, so if um, the fundamental state of matter is quarks, so it, it, could, it could be that uh, transition from a nu nuclear matter uh, to quark matter uh, will take place in under extreme pressure. And in this condition, uh, if you form this giant uh, quark object, uh, the surface on this object is quite sharp. And due to mass difference between quarks in statistical equilibrium, you will find that uh, of course, the charge should be compensated by the electrons, and these electrons cannot uh, be inside the, the, the quark star. There will be some atmosphere of electrons, and this atmosphere uh, creates an uh, extremely large electric field, which is in excess of this value by two decades, essentially. And uh, the same process was uh, discussed also in the group of Professor Ruffini, uh, where uh, in, in some condition also uh, nuclear matter can, can be in, this, in such condition that it creates extremely sharp surface. So the neutron star, in this case, will also develop uh, over critical electric fields on its surface. But this, uh, in equilibrium, such object cannot produce pairs due to uh, full degeneracy of uh, electron uh, in this situation. However, if some non-equilibrium process will be present, heating, for example, by some external process, gravitational collapse or others, pairs will be eventually abundantly produced. So I'm going to discuss uh, not uh, astrophysical concept, but uh, purely a microphysical process, a microphysical in particular kinetic aspect of this process, of the pair, uh, pair creation. And of course, when you deal with pair creation, it's uh, mandatory to, to take into account back reaction of pairs uh, because they are produced in uh, extreme numbers. Uh, the rate of pair production is exponential. And therefore, we expect that created pairs will induce electric currents, which in turn will back react on the original electric field. Therefore, they will be induced per oscillations, and uh, these oscillations are necessary to take into account. Uh, we will constrain ourselves to the simplest case of homogeneous but time-dependent electric fields. And within kinetic treatment, uh, we, dis we describe uh, such a situation in terms of the distribution function of particles, electrons and positrons, and uh, of course, external electric field. Uh, the number density of particles is given, is, and the energy density of particles is given by the usual integrals of the phase space. And the phase space in this, um, in this situation is, is most convenient to describe in terms of, of two quantities. Since we have preferential direction, direction of uh, electric field, uh, so the momentum can be decomposed in the orthogonal and parallel directions to this uh, electric field. And of course, distribution function should depend on time. Uh, just to remind you that uh, the first uh, quantum electrodynamic calculation uh, of this process was given by Schwinger, but Schwinger himself actually computed vacuum vacuum transition. And the probability of pair, uh, creation of a single pair or multiple pairs, was given for the first time by Nikishov and uh, Narozny in their seminal paper in uh, uh, taking into account uh, full, uh, actually all loops in the calculation. Therefore, uh, they found that the uh, probability of creating just one pair is given by just the first term in the Schwinger uh, rate. I don't show you the Schwinger rate here because it uh, uh, will be a different uh, quantity used in the calculation. So the two, com two uh, principal assumptions in this work are the following. One is that uh, classical kinetic equations are valid. And the second is that the pair creation rate uh, in uh, non-vacuum state, namely when electron and positron are already present in the initial state, uh, will not change with respect to vacuum. This is a strong assumption, but there are good reason to believe they are true. First of all, it was shown that vacuum, in, uh, sorry, in vacuum, uh, not only in vacuum, actually, uh, that um, quantum, uh, full quantum uh, kinetic equation uh, give exactly 
the same result practically indistinguishable from the classical uh, kinetic equations uh, when we consider per creation in vacuum. And uh, um, the interference term, uh, the quantum interference, become essential only in, in very particular situations. So first uh, assumption is quite justified. The second uh, is, let's say, from theoretical ground, nobody expects that this is true. But since we don't have any other, uh, any, any other uh, results from the fundamental physics, it's better to use what we have so far. So, uh, and of course, in all the calculations, in all the papers, in the literature, this, is, uh, this assumption is, is uh, considered to be true. So, uh, let me just tell you one thing. Since we are discussing uh, per creation not in vacuum, what is important is the statistical factors of the uh, probability or rates of particle creation or annihilation. So uh, direct Schrodinger process, namely pair creation from uh, external electric field, uh, there is very well known description. And uh, uh, in that case, uh, of course, uh, the traditional statistical factors uh, um, which correspond to essentially power blocking of, of the process if uh, the uh, final state is occupied uh, should be present. However, uh, counter electrodynamics tells you that there must be also the inverse process namely annihilation of electron and positron in uh, external electric field. And this process uh, will contain additional statistical factors simply proportional to the, uh, to the distribution functions of uh, particle and antiparticle. Therefore, the balance will be reached when this condition is satisfied, namely the resulting statistical factor will be not just the product of the two um, brackets here, but will be this. And uh, of course, when antiparticles are absent, in particular case I mentioned before, when we have just electron atmosphere around a uh, compact object, there will be just one minus F present and uh, opposite situation for antiparticles. However, when both particles and antiparticles are present in the same amount, the statistical factor will be uh, having this form, one minus two F, where F is distribution function of either particles or antiparticles. This is very different from the uh, usual uh, statistical factor which were found by Uling, Uling Beck or introduced in, in the, in the um, uh, kinetic equations. Uh, and these are uh, factors appearing in uh, usual binary interactions. Therefore, uh, let's see what are the uh, system of equations. This is the uh, loss of uh, Boltzmann equation uh, for particle distributions, okay? And the, uh, um, the only Maxwell equation surviving will contain uh, two currents. One is uh, conduction current and one is polarization current. I'm not going in details here. And S is the source term which describes pair production. So you have this essentially Schrodinger exponent here. Uh, we assume that initial uh, state is not vacuum, may not be uh, on vacuum uh, with electric field, but also filled with particles distributed according to the Boltzmann uh, uh, relativistic, uh, sorry, Fermi Dirac distribution. Fermi uh, distribution. This is the simplest case when we start with vacuum uh, and strong electric field uh, in terms of critical field. This is 10 uh, electric field. So if we don't take into account um, statistical factors, we will have uh, quite rapid uh, um, uh, growth of the number of particles. If we take into account quantum statistics, the uh, rate of uh, particle creation is decreased, and this is expected result. I'm going to show you the movie, but I'm not sure it will work this way. I will show you it from here. This contains, uh, movie contains some additional information. So you have uh, creation of particles, you can see this is the zeroth uh, orthogonal momentum of the uh, orthogonal component of the momentum, the distribution function. And this is full distribution function as, as soon as oscillation proceeds and the number density increase. You see that uh, the uh, distribution function raises, but it does not raise up to unity, it raises uh, to one half. One half is simply given by that factor one minus two f. So when one minus two f equals uh, uh, when f equals one half, uh, the rate is completely suppressed by the uh, by the Pauli uh, blocking factor. You see. So, uh, nevertheless, uh, particle creation continues, and all the energy in that case will be distributed in the uh, tails here in the distribution function for higher momentum. So, oscillations, of course, are induced by uh, the back reaction effect. 
And let me continue with the presentation. I have only a few slides to show you. This is uh, uh, the case where, where we assume, uh, where we take two initial conditions. One initial condition is described by uh, distribution function at low, let's say temperature and one uh, with a higher temperature. And uh, the energy density in both calculations is the same. So what it represents, it represents simply the, the heating of the plasma. So you have uh, temperature, uh, low temperature of the plasma, then you heat plasma, uh, you keep the same uh, energy density, uh, sorry, you keep the same number density, but the energy density of plasma increases. The electric field is kept the same, therefore the effect would be to induce, to, uh, excuse me, to increase the energy density of plasma. In general, this should, one expect that this should actually decrease the rate of pair creation because when you increase energy density of plasma with respect to the electric field energy density, the oscillation become more rapid and the phase space opens less. Therefore, the, there is less uh, probability to create pairs. Instead, what happens is the opposite. You have higher rate of pair production and this is simply because you can see uh, it, at, uh, uh, at the distribution function here at low momenta is actually smaller, therefore you actually do increase the phase space in this case. And, and this allows you uh, pair creation. And this is example of the opposite process, namely inverse uh, Schwinger process, where you have, this is, uh, let's say, the old result increase uh, of the number of pairs, so pair creation, and this is uh, pair annihilation because pairs, number of pairs decrease with time. And this is simply because the distribution function uh, exceeds one half initially. In principle, you, you can start with arbitrary distribution function even with completely degenerate case. And if you start with completely degenerate case, this is my final slide, I guess, uh, what happens is this. This is after several oscillation, electric field is four critical in the beginning, and we have a uh, particle distributed up to the Fermi momentum uh, 16 mc squared. So what you see, uh, this is a parallel momentum, this is an orthogonal momentum, and this is a distribution function. Uh, initially, distribution function was occupying all this uh, phase space, and uh, its uh, value was one everywhere. After several oscillation, uh, here in this region, uh, with relatively small uh, orthogonal momentum, par particle uh, annihilated. Annihilated up to uh, the uh, distribution function one half, which correspond to uh, equilibrium in the uh, direct and inverse uh, Schwinger process. Can we, in principle, maximize this process, though? The question would be, can we uh, um, use the inverse Schwinger process to amplify the electric field? Uh, unfortunately not, because uh, since the, um, uh, since the uh, Schwinger rate is proportional to uh, the orthogonal momentum, uh, we have only a few, only small part of the uh, phase space which is subject to uh, to uh, this process, to the inverse uh, Schwinger process. Instead, if we increase, we would like to increase, for example, electric field. If we increase the electric field, uh, in that case, there will be more phase space available for the inverse Schwinger process. However, what happens in that case that the oscillation will be so strong that the phase space will be opened again and we will have more uh, particle creation. So the particle creation will dominate. The direct Schwinger process will dominate in that case. Therefore, this is maybe best what we can have. So in principle, when you uh, run this process for a long time, you will see that eventually the situation reverse and uh, the inverse Schwinger process will be substituted by the direct Schwinger process. So these are my conclusion. In principle, uh, um, the uh, quantum statistics actually uh, limits uh, pair production. And uh, there are two possibilities. The energy density in the electric field dominates. In that case, we have prolific pair creation. If the uh, plasma, density, pl plasma energy density dominates, there are very rapid oscillations. However, uh, the phase space remains completely blocked and pair creation is suppressed. The inverse uh, Schwinger process may take place under certain conditions, but the energy density of electric field cannot be amplified in that case. Or is it 
No, this one half comes from, uh, it, it, it's only true in pair plasma, electron positron. Yes. Yes, yes, of course. Then why it doesn't be, Because this is exactly a charge balance. So particle, number of particle is equal to the number of antiparticle. And then you have this term. You see which term. Is no, no, no. It's, it's plasma created by electric field. OK. Good question, thank you. Uh, the time, I, I will be brief. The time scale for oscillation and the time scale of pair creation are much shorter than the time scale for uh, creation of pho photons, real photons, at least uh, in, in this condition, yes. Therefore, photon creation takes place. We actually considered this two years ago, uh, the full kinetic equation taking into account interaction with photons. And uh, photon, uh, photon interaction, I mean, photon become uh, dynamically important after, let's say, 1,000 Compton times. But we're talking about a few hundred Compton times here. So this is, let's say, fewer case without photons. Thank you. Let me give you this stuff. Okay. It's fine. It's better if I put it there. Um, how can we put it in, in beam? No. <laughs> I don't remember. Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah, super. Thank you. Uh, so hi, hello. Uh, so my name is Audrey Trova. I'm a postdoc at the Center of Applied Space Technology and Microgravity, ZARM, um, in the University of Bremen in Germany. So I would like to thank the organizer to give me the opportunity to discuss in front of you today. So I'm going to discuss about uh, some recent work that we did with uh, Shokufe Faraji, which is also working at ZARM. And I'm going to present some quasi-periodic oscillations of a particle in the background of a deformed compact object. So, uh, so fast time variability phenomenon is the most prominent uh, characteristic of accretion system, and the quasi-periodic oscillation are a constant in many of them, from cataclysmic variable to AGN uh, passing through X-ray um, black hole or neutron star X-ray binaries. So as you may know, X-ray bi uh, binaries are a di double system, uh, which uh, is formed by a stellar remnant. Uh, which has collapsed into a compact object, so black hole or neutron star, and which is uh, still gravitationally bound to uh, its companion. So the compact object attracts the matter from the, the companion star and forcing, forcing it to leave its uh, surface. So the accretion flow, uh, which is in between the, the compact object and the companion star, is originates the so-called accretion disk. Uh, in this accretion disk, the angular momentum is transported outwards, and the gravitational energy is transformed into kinetic and uh, kinetic energy and radiation. So the accretion disk emits all along the electromagnetic spectrum, and uh, and particularly in the X-ray, it emits a lot in the X-ray, uh, where the radiation are coming from the inner part of the accretion uh, flow, and we can observe this uh, radiation. So what about the, the QPOs? So the QPOs, the so quasi-periodic oscillation, are now peaks in the power density spectra uh, of the accreting systems. 
uh, they are thought to uh, occur in the vicinity of the compact object, really close to the inner part of the disk, or at the base of the jet. Uh, we are focusing first uh, our, this, our work on black hole uh, system, I mean black hole uh, extra binaries, and for this uh, particular system, QPOs are can be divided in different value classes, and in particular in two large groups, the low frequency QPOs around 50 Hertz, and the high frequency QPOs above 100 Hertz up to 500. So we are going to focus us on the, this high frequency QPO. So they have been detected uh, in the 90s, 90s with the XP emission, and they are in black, uh, for black hole system quite rare and not easy to detect, especially uh, with a double peak. So what about the characteristic of this uh, high frequency QPO? They, are, uh, they appear in observation at high flux or high uh, accretion rate. We can observe them with single or double peak. And uh, we could uh, see that in, uh, mainly in black hole sources, uh, the double peak, when they are observed in double peak, the two frequencies are appearing in a 3-2 ratio. So we have a 3-2 be ratio between the upper frequency and the lower frequency. This lead to uh, some uh, different model to explain this phenomena, some resonant model between uh, the different, uh, between the frequencies. So the main idea is that uh, uh, high frequency QPO are related to the motion of the inner part of the disk and mainly to the circular uh, orbit. So there is different uh, model which are going to link the um, QPOs, the frequency of the QPOs to the fundamental frequencies of, uh, the, of, the, of the motion of the fluid. So the orbital uh, frequencies, the radial and the vertical one. So what about our work? We decide to uh, have a look to the, uh, so some quasi-periodic oscillation in a specific background metric, uh, which is known as the Q metric. It's a static and uh, axially symmetric metric that is non spherically symmetric, and is uh, described by this metric here. And it's parameterized by uh, alpha, which is known as the quadruple moment. So this metric describes the exterior, exterior gravitational field of a static deformed compact object, and the deformation is uh, parameterized by, by alpha. So we said that alpha positive corresponding to a noblate object and a negative for a polate one. Okay, so as we say that the, the QP, the, um, QPO are related to, uh, I mean, the model are related QPO to uh, the fundamental frequencies uh, and to the circular uh, orbit. Our first interest was to, um, to how to see uh, if, the, if we have some circular orbit in this background. So it's what we did uh, with this plot here. In all the blue regions, so dark and, and light, we have a possibility to get some uh, circular orbit. And next, to get some frequency, we need to perturb them. So we perturb the, the, the particle, and we are going to discuss about some orbits that slightly deviate from this, the circular geodesics. So we perturb them, and we, we want to, them to be stable. And this uh, appear in the dark blue region. So this graph can tell us that for different value of alpha, we can note that first, there is some region when we don't have any uh, uh, circular orbit. Plus, we can see that the region of stability is also uh, give, allow us to, um, how to say, to, to constrain uh, our alpha parameter. For instance, for some negative value here, we don't have any stable solution. So we calculate, so stable solution means that the radial frequency and the vertical frequency are both positive. So they are expressed with this equation. So if you put alpha equal to zero, you come back to the Churchill case here expressed in the x and y coordinate. We went further by uh, discussing non-geodesic uh, effect by including some magnetic field, so uniform magnetic field in the equation, and we obtain again some analytic formula for the rad uh, radial and vertical epicyclic frequency. So if you put X, WB equal to zero, you come back to the expression just the slide before. We had a look to how they behave in function of uh, different alpha parameter and different uh, strength of the magnetic field. 
So this is given here, you have Wx and here you have Wy. So we can see that basically the trend is basically the same depending on, on Q for both of them. The only thing that we can uh, also say is that for some value of Q here, we don't have any uh, uh, radial APCQ fre frequencies. They are not defined for some value of Q. So it allows us also to constrain uh, the strength of the magnetic field. So we did the same study. We studied some condition of existence of circular, uh, circular orbit and their stability. So this is basically the kind of the same plot as before, but when we, in, we put the magnetic field and uh, we have some small value of, of uh, B field here and we increase the value of B. So what we can see is that when you increase the value of B, your region of stability is going to reduce a lot. So clearly it seems that for high value magnetic field is not a good uh, solution. So now we want to relate that to some to the QPOs. So to do that, we need to search some uh, frequency. So this is three to frequency ratio between the IP cyclic uh, frequencies. So there is, as I said at the beginning, you have different model which relate different combination of the frequencies. So some the orbital frequency, the radial frequency, so different one. And we search for the different model here. We search if we could find this 3 to ratio and how they behave with alpha. So this is what is plot here. So we can uh, see that for some model, again, some negative value of alpha doesn't give us any ratio. So we cannot find any, uh, we will not be able to fit with the data with very negative uh, value of the alpha parameter. Um, okay, so now we also did that uh, by turning on the magnetic field. So here we have the different models, so different combination of the frequencies, and we search where we have this 3 to ratio for different, alpha, for different alpha and different value of the, of the magnetic field. So we can see that it's really changing with the strength of the, of the B field. Here, for instance, you again don't have any uh, radius, uh, 3-2 uh, uh, radius um, for negative value of alpha. And when you increase your value of the, your B field, you can succeed to have uh, this value for all the range that alpha we, that we uh, discussed. Now, the data fitting. So the QP, the, we know that the QPO can be related to, uh, can give us some information about the mass of the central object, the spin of the central object, and can also give us some insight about the radius where they are produced. And they are well, they are kind of following uh, a one over M relationship. Um, so what we did, we, ch we uh, choose this three uh, galactic microcrasal we have from the data the range of uh, frequency and their range of mass. And we, uh, ex we, for a specific model, we search where the upper frequency and the lower frequency are the switch ratio, uh, ratio at which radius. We extract this radius and we include it in the, uh, in the observed frequency. And then we plot this in function of the mass of the central object. And this gives us uh, this nice picture. And so the idea is how to fit the better the, the, three, uh, the three data. So here the different colors are showing different models and uh, the different line style give you the different uh, alpha parameter. Uh, so here we can see that, uh, of course, some models are better than, than others, but it seems that uh, alpha, uh, that, yeah, for basically, for one model, all the alpha seems to, to, to give us a good approximation. We also did uh, the same uh, study, but by including the magnetic field. So first, here on the left, we have again different line style for the parameter alpha and different color for uh, different value of the strength of the magnetic field. So red, we have a big value of magnetic field, and when we go to dark, it's a lower uh, magnetic field. So again, we, as expected from the stable uh, analysis, we see that it's better to get uh, some lower magnetic field. It helps us to fit 
uh, the data. So this is for just a specific model, and now we also we wanted to see uh, how it is with the different uh, model, which, uh, which uh, we have in the literature. And uh, by this time, choosing some specific couple of parameter and show which one is, is the best fit. So it's what we, we showed in here. And what we can see is not mainly the, what is called the RP model, the relative precision model, seems uh, to fit uh, the best uh, the data. Is this, re this uh, result is, is also uh, the same for with the study in care. The RPUM model is the best. Um, okay, so uh, let me conclude. So we show that the quadrupole pole moment at the magnetic field alter a lot the motion of the, of the fluid and also the epistatic frequencies. They uh, cause strong deviation from the corresponding uh, quantities in, with the Churchill case. And one of the important uh, point is that uh, in this background, we succeed to reproduce uh, what we have from the data. We succeed to fit pretty well the data. So we can say that some black hole mimicker can also reproduce uh, the QPOs. So what about some future work and questions that we have? We want, of course, to try to extend this work from a single particle to a complex system, so to accretion disk and maybe also to see if we can include this, the effect of the spin. Thank you. Thank you Uh, some prolate one, so something which is more yes. extended vertically. It seems that at seems for some model it cannot fit really well the data. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. I guess I'm supposed to find my talk. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for give me, giving me the opportunity to give this uh, short presentation. I decided at the last minute to come to this very interesting uh, meeting that gave me also the opportunity to visit uh, Armenia for the first time. Uh, let me just uh, remind that uh, ICRANET and our center in uh, Seoul, the, the Center for Quantum Space Time, next week are organizing the 18th uh, Italy Korea Symposium, and some of the people in this room will also participate to the meeting next week. Okay, so uh, my talk is the, the last talk before the banquet, and also is about a topic that is quite different from the other one. So I will try to be short and to focus only on the phenomenological important issues. Let me point out that tomorrow morning uh, after uh, the, uh, the coffee time, there will be a, a talk on the same uh, uh, topic on the models of modified gravity with a different and complementary approach by uh, Kunz, Juna Kunz. And so uh, I will skip most of the details uh, that will be addressed tomorrow. So, uh, the topic is about modifying a general relativity. We have many reasons to believe that maybe general relativity is not the end of the story. And uh, one way to do that is using effective models, effective theory. Uh, there are many, many ways in which you can do that. Today, I'm going to focus on a specific way to extend the general relativity, which is to add to the general relativity a term uh, which is uh, this RGB term, 
which is proportional to the square of the, uh, of the uh, oh my God, I didn't, I didn't give the definition. This term RGB is just, de depends on the square, is a combination of squares of uh, the curvature and has the property that is a surface term. So uh, if uh, this function here is a real constant, it has no effect on the, uh, uh, on, on the physics. However, if you, we add an additional degree of, degree of freedom, a scalar field, uh, and this function depends on the scalar field, its derivative with respect to the scalar field is non-zero, so the coupling is non-minimal, this effect can modify gravity, and in particular, you can calculate the Friedman equations and you can modify cosmology, okay? You modify cosmology. In particular, the form of this function uh, is uh, uh, suggested to be of this uh, type with an exponential dependence of the phi, on phi from uh, models, uh, for instance, uh, of, from string theory in general. Uh, this is a dilaton. So the idea is to parameterize this f in terms of these two parameters, alpha and gamma, and as long as the derivative of f with respect to phi is different from zero, to write the, uh, the, the Friedman equation and to study the evolution of the universe. And now where, well, at which scale? Uh, we know that uh, at Big Bang nucleosynthesis, uh, the, uh, we have standard cosmology because big bang nucleosynthesis is the earliest uh, process that is perfectly working with standard cosmology. So uh, this effect has to be vanishing or negligible at BBN. But as we go higher in temperature, this effect can modify the evolution of the universe, in particular the evolution of the Hubble constant. Uh, in particular, we want to focus on a specific scale of temperature which is the scale of the decoupling of, uh, the thermal decoupling of a weakly interactive massive particle that is the most, one of the most popular uh, models to explain dark matter. So uh, uh, let me just uh, summarize very quickly what is this uh, scenario. A WIMP uh, is uh, a particle with a mass between a few GV and a few TV scale, which has weak type interactions with the particles of the standard model that keep this particle in thermal equilibrium at high temperature. Now, if uh, uh, the thermal, e the, the equilibrium density, if the, uh, the density of this WIMP had to follow uh, its equilibrium value to, until today, the, uh, the density of the WIMPs will be completely zero because when the temperature drops below the WIMP mass, the equilibrium density is exponentially suppressed. However, this is not possible because uh, we have to compare two scales uh, one is the annihilation rate, and in particular, its inverse is the mean free path, and the other is the horizon scale, which is h minus one. And equilibrium is not possible. This is, of course, a rule of thumb. You have to solve the equations uh, numerically to have an accurate prediction. But uh, the equilibrium cannot be possible when uh, the mean free path is larger uh, than uh, the horizon scale, which means that the particles are not causally connected. And uh, indeed, gamma, so this means that gamma has to be larger than larger than h in order to have equilibrium. Now, gamma in that standard cosmology, gamma and h evolve in a different way. So even if at high temperature, gamma is larger than h, and so you have thermal equilibrium, at some point, at the freeze-out temperature, which is always of the order of the mass of the WIMP divided by 20, so that the WIMP is non-relativistic, is cold dark matter, can form structure, and blah, 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 so it's a perfect prediction. Below that, uh, equilibrium is not possible anymore, and the number of WIMPs inside a co-moving volume remains approximately constant. Uh, I will come to that later. I, I will come back to that later because when the uh, expansion is not standard, you can have also annihilations after decoupling, but anyway, uh, the density is no longer suppressed exponentially, and so you can have a final density. In particular, uh, this, uh, the final density of WIMPs, uh, the relic density, the, the density of WIMPs divided by the critical density, turns out to be inversely proportional to the annihilation cross-section of the WIMPs with standard model particles, simply because the larger sigma v is, the longer the equilibrium density is followed, and so the smaller is the final result because you have more exponential suppression. So this value is inversely proportional to sigma v. But now, why is WIMP so special? The, the miracle happens when you plug in numbers. Because uh, the final result depends on uh, four scales, which are, in principle, completely uh, non-related. One scale is uh, uh, 
today's entropy. The other scale is uh, the critical density. The other scale is the squeeze out temperature. Sorry, here is. Depends on the, the temperature of the, uh, 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 of the CMB today, the Hubble constant today, and the coupling constant, the gravitational coupling constant or the Planck constant. If you express these constant in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, natural units, they span 50 orders of magnitude. Now, you plug in the numbers, and you obtain that in order to get the correct relic density, the relic density that you observe today, the value of sigma v needs to be of the order of 0 0.1 picobar, which, is, which implies that the new physics that you need, because of course uh, the WIMP has to be beyond the standard model, there is no standard model particle that can be a WIMP, uh, the new physics has to be at the TV scale or maybe a little bit more of that. This was one of the most uh, important, of the main motivations to build the LHC also. Also, remember that in the standard model, the TV scale is believed to be a cutoff because the, the, the radiative corrections to the Higgs boson become unstable at that scale. And so you expect to have some new physics at the TV scale in order to stabilize the Higgs boson mass against radiative corrections. This is called the naturalness problem. And so the bottom line is that uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, effect is called uh, the wind miracle because you plug in these numbers and they conjure up in such a way that the new physics is supposed to be not, not at 100 TV, but few TV. Okay, so now the, the, the idea is that in many cases, in most models, for instance, supersymmetry, in extra dimensions and so on, uh, the annihilation cross-section, the sigma v, does not depend on v. So it's the same at the decoupling temperature, about one, the, the mass of the WIMP divided by, by 20. So for a, for a WIMP of a mass 100, we are talking about a temperature of 5 GV. And in the galaxy today. And this process can uh, be uh, observable. There are indirect searches of WIMPs that are looking for the annihilation products of this WIMP. So uh, there are, in particular, upper bounds, experimental upper bounds on this quantity from indirect detection. And in the case when the, this annihilation cross-section is not suppressed, for instance, by this, uh, the, the angular momentum of the particle, so is in S-wave, uh, this annihilation cross-section is the same at decoupling and also in the galaxy to date. And so uh, uh, now, what happens if we modify the expansion of the universe? If we modify the expansion of the universe, and in particular, if uh, the um, uh, Hubble constant is larger than in the standard case, we introduce here an enhancement parameter. This enhancement parameter is larger than one. What happens is that the decoupling happens later. And so in order to have the same relic density, you need a higher annihilation cross-section. So this means that if we modify cosmology and we get a large enhancement factor, the annihilation cross-section will be driven to higher and higher values and eventually could be driven beyond the experimental limits from indirect detection. In this way, we can try to constrain this model so we can try to calculate the sigma v which is needed uh, to uh, have the correct relic density as a function of the two parameter alpha and gamma and compare it to the bounds, okay? So we, we put some bounds on these two parameters. It's very simple. The procedure is very simple. I, I basically finished my talk. So you just write the Friedman equations, uh, you introduce, uh, you do the usual trick that the modification on the left-hand side of the Friedman equation, you put it on the right-hand side, you interpret it as a, an additional contribution to the energy density. This energy density will be rho GB, so the density connected to the gauss bonnet term. However, this gauss bonnet term can also be negative. However, it doesn't matter because the total density will remain positive. But the fact that this rho GB can become negative uh, will be very important in the, uh, uh, in the fact that these equations will have some asymptotic solutions, some tracking solutions, uh, because uh, in, in some, it, basically any time that this quantity becomes negative, it has, to track exactly, it, it has to track exactly the other component that dominates, and this will give a prediction for the equation of state. Okay, so we have all the Friedman uh, equations from low temperature, so we fix the boundary condition at DBN where we know that uh, we, we need to have a standard cosmology. We put an upper bound 
uh, on the, uh, 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 of the kination of, of, of the energy in the kinetic energy of the, of the scalar field. We put the potential of the scalar field equal to zero. So here we simplify everything. Everything is only as a function of alpha and gamma. There is no potential. So uh, at BBN, we have a contribution from the kinetic, kinetic energy of BBN. However, there is an upper bound on it uh, from the number of effective degrees of freedom uh, neutrino uh, species uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from BBN. And, uh, uh, and then we have to fix uh, uh, the value of phi. The, the, the value of the field the phi is just uh, equivalent to the choice of a gauge because we, when we redefine phi, a redefinition of phi is equivalent to a redefinition of alpha. And so uh, in other words, we can either express everything in terms of this uh, 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 gauge invariant quantity alpha tilde, so we change alpha and phi BBN and alpha tilde doesn't change, or we fix the, field, the, the, the gauge with phi equal to zero. But this is just a technicality. These are the evolutions of the densities for different values of alpha and uh, uh, here for phi BBN equal to zero, and here for phi BBN different from uh, larger than zero. Phi BBN less than zero is equivalent to changing the sign of gamma, so without a choice, uh, loss of generality, we can take phi BBN positive. Now, any time this red line uh, is larger than this uh, uh, green line, which is the prediction for the standard prediction, we have an enhancement factor larger than one, and so we, can, we could have an effect that uh, uh, we could constrain uh, the model. Um, okay, so uh, an interesting feature that we found is that when we evolve the equations to very high energies, uh, the equational state of the universe tends to fall into four uh, uh, asymptotic values. Uh, so you see that you have uh, four phases. Either you have W equal to one, that corresponds to kination, so simply the gauss bonnet term is zero, the universe's energy density is dominated by the kinetic energy of the scalar field. Uh, but uh, when uh, instead phi dot, the, the kination, uh, the kinetic energy uh, drops to zero, it becomes very small, uh, we have uh, an asymptotic value of the equation of state equal to minus one-third. Minus one-third corresponds to uh, a vanishing deceleration parameter. So the universe is not accelerated. Finally, uh, when uh, uh, the gamma parameter is small enough, uh, we have a, a, another, a, a, another phase where the equation of state is seven-thirds. So we find it is very particular uh, situations. In particular, in this situation, uh, the gauss bonnet term tracks very closely the density in gammas, in photons, in, in radiation, let's say, while uh, the, uh, uh, the density, uh, the, 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 the kination energy, the energy into the uh, kinetic energy of the field is negligible, while here, in these asymptotic solutions, uh, the gauss bonnet term tracks closely the, uh, the kinetic energy of the scalar field and the energy in uh, radiation is negligible. So we have these three uh, phases, which is quite an interesting scenario. Now, uh, in order to understand the effect of the gauss bonnet term on the WIMP uh, relic density uh, and on the, on, on, the, uh, on the WIMP model, we can uh, uh, put alpha and gamma equal to zero, so the gauss bonnet term is zero, there is only the kinetic energy of the scalar field, and we can explore uh, the parameter space and what we see is that this, in this plot, all the white region is excluded, only the dashed the region is allowed. And in particular, at all wind masses, at all wind masses, these two values of uh, the density in the, in the kinetic energy of the scalar field at BBN, this is the upper bound and this is an intermediate values, are completely excluded, okay? So without the gauss bonnet term, these two values are completely excluded. If now we use these same two values, but we switch on the gauss bonnet term, what we find is that instead, we don't find plots which are completely white, okay? We find some regions which are allowed. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that the gauss bonnet term has, in some cases, a mitigating effect on uh, the, kin the evolution of the uh, kination of the energy in the kinetic field, in, in the, the kinetic energy of the scalar field, and so we recover some solutions that would be excluded without the gauss bonnet term. Okay, so uh, one comment, one last comment, that the enhancement factors can be very large, can be uh, also of the order of 10 to 4 or 10 to 6. However, for the same values, we find in some cases some allowed regions. 
So what does it mean? That uh, even if we have a very large en en enhancement factor, the sigma v is not driven beyond the limit. Why this is so? Because uh, uh, when uh, the evolution of the universe is much faster than in the standard case, it is no longer true that the number of WIMPs in a co-moving volume remain the same. So they continue to annihilate also after decoupling. This is an effect that had been studied in some papers. In particular, it was pointed out that when this ratio of gamma over H uh, is, uh, depends on the temperature at three minus alpha with alpha larger than three, this effect is sizable. And in particular, in our case, we find that uh, this effect is true when W is 7 thirds and alpha is 5, which is larger than 3. OK, so these are, I, I have finished. So my conclusions is that we can use uh, um, the indirect detection of WIMPs to put the constraints on these models of modified gravity. Uh, and so it, is, it would be interesting to or use this also to uh, combine these models of modified gravity with other the physical processes before b band nucleosynthesis, for instance, leptogenesis or other effects that we believe to have happened before the b band nucleosynthesis. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, but this value, okay, it's interesting to note that when you solve uh, numerically the Boltzmann equations, this value depends logarithmically on the sigma v. So basically, if it's not 20, it can be 19 or it can be 21, but it's always very close to 20. Of course, uh, when alpha is equal to zero, we just have the situation that uh, I showed uh, here. So uh, uh, we have uh, that if we have some, we, if we just add the, 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 the scalar field, and so we had a contribution from the kinetic energy of the scalar field, uh, then we, uh, we can exclude uh, this model simply because the, the, uh, the evolution, the, uh, the Hubble constant, instead of depending from t squared, depends on t to the sixth. And so basically the universe, the, the enhancement factor is huge and uh, basically uh, indirect detection can exclude everything. So that's why I said that the Gauss-Bonnet term mitigates this effect due to the kination, the kinetic energy of the scalar field. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the scour, yes. Yes, by a power law is just connected, can be connected to a redefinition of the field. You just make a transformation, and the exponential can be made equivalent to a power law. Now, there is a very interesting point here. Any model, not only this model, but any model that predicts an expansion of the universe faster than the standard one will imply that uh, the scales that decouple at uh, inflation and that enter in the, in the, in, in, in the uh, uh, horizon today are different. So it means that if you modify the expansion of the universe between reheating and today, uh, you may need a different number of, uh, for instance, of uh, uh, e-folding in order to have correct inflation. So this means that you can change the predictions of existing inflationary models. Uh, actually, one thing that I was surprised is that there is no general analysis on this, because this is not only related to this. Any model that modifies the, the expansion of the universe implies that uh, uh, the usual predictions of inflation change, because uh, the, 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 the scales that re-enter uh, the horizon today are different compared to the scale uh, of the uh, of the perturbations from inflation, so you change the predictions of inflation. Thank you very much uh, to everybody. Yes. Okay, thank you.